Chapter 1, Part 1 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book the Third of Private Wrongs. Chapter One of the Redress of Private Wrongs by the Mere Act of the Parties. Part One. At the opening of these commentaries, municipal law was in general defined to be a rule of civil conduct prescribed by the supreme power in a state commanding what is right and prohibiting what is wrong. From hence, therefore, it followed that the primary objects of the law are the establishment of rights and the prohibition of wrongs. And this occasioned the distribution of these collections into two general heads, under the former of which we have already considered the rights that were defined and established, and under the latter are now to consider the wrongs that are forbidden and redressed by the laws of England. In the prosecution of the first of these inquiries, we distinguished rights into two sorts. First, such as concern or are annexed to the persons of men, and are then called jura personarum, or the rights of persons, which together, with the means of acquiring and losing them, compose the first book of these commentaries. And secondly, such as man may acquire over external objects, or things unconnected with his person, which are called jurorerum, or the rights of things, and these, with the means of transferring them from man to man, were the subject of the second book. I am now, therefore, to proceed to the consideration of wrongs, which for the most part convey to us an idea merely negative, as being nothing else but a privation of right, for which reason it was necessary that before we entered at all into the discussion of wrongs, we should entertain a clear and distinct notion of rights, the contemplation of what is jus being necessarily prior to what may be termed injuria, and the definition of fas precedent to that of nefas. Wrongs are divisible into two sorts or species, private wrongs and public wrongs. The former are an infringement or privation of the private or civil rights belonging to individuals considered as individuals, and are thereupon frequently termed civil injuries. The latter are a breach and violation of public rights and duties which affect the whole community, considered as a community, and are distinguished by the farther appellation of crimes and misdemeanors. To investigate the first of these species of wrongs with their legal remedies will be our employment in the present book, and the other species will be reserved till the next or concluding volume. The more effectually to accomplish the redress of private injuries, courts of justice are instituted in every civilized society in order to protect the weak from the insults of the stronger by expounding and enforcing those laws by which rights are defined and wrongs prohibited. The remedy, therefore, is principally to be fought by application to these courts of justice, that is, by civil suit or action. For which reason, our chief employment in this volume will be to consider the redress of private wrongs by suit or action in courts. But as some injuries are of such a nature that they furnish or require a more speedy remedy than can be had in the ordinary forms of justice, there is allowed in those cases an extrajudicial or eccentrical kind of remedy, of which I shall first of all treat before I consider the several remedies by suit, and to that end shall distribute the redress of private longs into three several species. First, that which is obtained by the mere act of the parties themselves, secondly, that which is affected by the mere act and operation of law, and thirdly, that which arises from suit or action in courts 
which consists in a conjunction of the other two, the act of the parties cooperating with the act of law. And first, of that redress of private injuries which is obtained by the mere act of the parties. This is of two sorts. First, that which arises from the act of the injured party only, and secondly, that which arises from the joint act of all the parties together, both of which I shall consider in their order. Of the first sort, or that which arises from the sole act of the injured party is, one, the defense of oneself, or the mutual and reciprocal defense of such as stand in the relations of husband and wife, parent and child, master and servant. In these cases, if the party himself, or any of these his relations, be forcibly attacked in his person or property, it is lawful for him to repel force by force, and the breach of the peace which happens is chargeable upon him only who began the affray. For the law in this case respects the passions of the human mind, and when external violence is offered to a man himself or those to whom he bears a near connection, makes it lawful in him to do himself that immediate justice to which he is prompted by nature, and which no prudential motives are strong enough to restrain. It considers that the future process of law is by no means an adequate remedy for injuries accompanied with force, since it is impossible to say to what wanton lengths of rapine or cruelty outrages of this sort might be carried, unless it were permitted a man immediately to oppose one violence with another. Self-defense, therefore, as it is justly called the primary law of nature, so it is not, neither can it be, in fact, taken away by the law of society. In the English law particularly, it is held an excuse for breaches of the peace, nay, even for homicide itself, but care must be taken that the resistance does not exceed the bounds of mere defense and prevention, for then the defender would himself become an aggressor. 2. Recaption or reprisal is another species of remedy by the mere act of the party injured. This happens when any one hath deprived another of his property and goods or chattels personal, or wrongfully detains one's wife, child, or servant, in which case the owner of the goods, and the husband, parent, or master, may lawfully claim and retake them, wherever he happens to find them, so it be not in a riotous manner, or attended with a breach of the peace. The reason for this is obvious, since it may frequently happen that the owner may have this only opportunity of doing himself justice. His goods may be afterwards conveyed away or destroyed, and his wife, children, or servants concealed or carried out of his reach if he had no speedier remedy than the ordinary process of law. If, therefore, he can so contrive it as to gain possession of his property again without force or terror, the law favors and will justify his proceeding. But, as the public peace is a superior consideration to any one man's private property, and as, if individuals were once allowed to use private force as a remedy for private injuries, all social justice must cease, the strong would give law to the weak, and every man would revert to a state of nature. For these reasons, it is provided that this natural right of recaption shall never be exerted where such exertion must occasion strife and bodily contention or endanger the peace of society. If, for instance, my horse is taken away and I find him in a common, a fair, or a public inn, I may lawfully seize him to my own use, but I cannot justify breaking open a private stable or entering on the grounds of a third person to take him, except he be feloniously stolen, but must have recourse to an action at law. 3. As recaption is a remedy given to the party himself for an injury to his personal property, so, thirdly, a remedy of the same kind for injuries to real property is by entry on lands and tenements when another person without any right has taken possession thereof. This depends in some measure on like reasons with the former, and, like that too, must be peaceable and without force. 
There is some nicety required to define and distinguish the cases in which such entry is lawful or otherwise. It will therefore be more fully considered in a subsequent chapter, being only mentioned in this place for the sake of regularity and order. 4. A fourth species of remedy by the mere act of the party injured is the abatement or removal of nuisances. What nuisances are, and their several species, we shall find a more proper place to inquire under some of the subsequent divisions. At present, I shall only observe that whatever unlawfully annoys or doth damage to another is a nuisance, and such nuisance may be abated, that is, taken away or removed, by the party aggrieved thereby, so as he commits no riot in the doing of it. If a house or wall is erected so near to mine that it stops my ancient lights, which is a private nuisance, I may enter my neighbor's land and peaceably pull it down. Or if a new gate be erected across the public highway, which is a common nuisance, any of the king's subjects passing that way may cut it down and destroy it. And the reason why the law allows this private and summary method of doing one's self-justice is because injuries of this kind, which obstruct or annoy such things as are of daily convenience and use, require an immediate remedy, and cannot wait for the slow progress of the ordinary forms of justice. 5. A fifth case in which the law allows a man to be his own avenger, or to minister redress to himself, is that of distraining cattle or goods for non-payment of rent or other duties, or distraining another's cattle damage feasant, that is, doing damage or trespassing upon his land. The former, intended for the benefit of landlords, to prevent tenants from secreting or withdrawing their effects to his prejudice, the latter arising from the necessity of the thing itself, as it might otherwise be impossible at a future time to ascertain whose cattle they were that committed the trespass or damage. As the law of distresses is a point of great use and consequence, I shall consider it with some minuteness by inquiring, first, for what injuries a distress may be taken, secondly, what things may be distrained, and, thirdly, the manner of taking, disposing of, and avoiding distresses. 1. And first it is necessary to premise that a distress, districtio, is the taking of a personal chattel out of the possession of the wrongdoer into the custody of the party injured to procure a satisfaction for the wrong committed. 1. The most usual injury for which a distress may be taken is that of non-payment of rent. It was observed in a form of volume that distresses were incident by the common law to every rent service and by particular reservation to rent charges also, but not to rent sec, till the statute for George II, C. 28, extended the same remedy to all rents alike, and thereby, in effect, abolished all material distinction between them. So that now we may lay it down as an universal principle that a distress may be taken for any kind of rent in arrear, the detaining whereof beyond the day of payment is an injury to him that is entitled to receive it. 2. For neglecting to do suit to the Lord's court or other certain personal service, the Lord may distrain of common right. 3. For immersements in a court leet, a distress may be had of common right, but not for immersements in a court barren, without a special prescription to warrant it. 4. Another injury for which distresses may be taken is where a man finds beasts of a stranger wandering in his grounds damage feasant, that is, doing him harm or damage by treading down his grass or the like, in which case the owner of the soil may distrain them till satisfaction be made him for the injury he has thereby sustained. 5. Lastly, for several duties and penalties inflicted by special acts of Parliament, as for assessments made by commissioners of sewers, or for the relief of the poor, remedy by distress and sale is given, for the particulars of which we must have recourse to the statutes themselves, remarking only that such distresses are partly analogous to the ancient distress at common law, 
as being replevable and the like, but more resembling the common law process of execution by seizing and selling the goods of the debtor under a writ of fieri facius, of which hereafter. 2. Secondly, as to the things which may be distrained or taken in distress, we may lay it down as a general rule that all chattels personal are liable to be distrained unless particularly protected or exempted. Instead, therefore, of mentioning what things are distrainable, it will be easier to recount those which are not so with the reason of their particular exemptions. And 1. As everything which is distrained is presumed to be the property of the wrongdoer, it will follow that such things wherein no man can have an absolute and valuable property as dogs, cats, rabbits, and all animals ferai naturai cannot be distrained. Yet if deer, which are ferai naturai, are kept in a private enclosure for the purpose of sale or profit, this so far changes their nature by reducing them to a kind of stock or merchandise that they may be distrained for rent. 2. Whatever is in the personal use or occupation of any man is for the time privileged and protected from any distress, as an axe with which a man is cutting wood, or a horse while a man is riding him. But horses drawing a cart may, cart and all, be distrained for rent or rear, and also if a horse, though a man be riding him, be taken for damage feasant or trespassing in another's grounds, the horse, notwithstanding his rider, may be distrained and led away to the pound. 3. Valuable things in the way of trade shall not be liable to distress. As a horse standing in a smith's shop to be shooed, or in a common inn, or cloth at a tailor's house, or corn sent to a mill or a market, for all these are protected and privileged for the benefit of trade, and are supposed in common presumption not to belong to the owner of the house, but to his customers. But generally speaking, whatever goods and chattels the landlord finds upon the premises, whether they in fact belong to the tenant or a stranger, are distrainable by him for rent, for otherwise a door would be open to infinite frauds upon the landlord and the stranger has his remedy over by action on a case against the tenant, if by the tenant's default the chattels are distrained so that he cannot render them when called upon. With regard to a stranger's beasts which are found on the tenant's land, the following distinctions are, however, taken. If they are put in by consent of the owner of the beasts, they are distrainable immediately afterwards for rent arrear by the landlord. So also, if a stranger's cattle break the fences and commit a trespass by coming on the land, they are distrainable immediately by the lessor for his tenant's rent, as a punishment to the owner of the beasts for the wrong committed through his negligence. But if the lands were not sufficiently fenced so as to keep out cattle, the landlord cannot distrain them till they have been levant and couchant, Levant et cubantes on the land, that is, have been long enough there to have laid down and rose up to feed, which in general is held to be one night at least, and then the law presumes that the owner may have noticed whither his cattle have strayed, and it is his own negligence not to have taken them away. Yet, if the lessor or his tenant were bound to repair the fences and did not, and thereby the cattle escaped into their grounds without the negligence or default of the owner. In this case, though the cattle may have been levant and conchant, yet they are not distrainable for rent, till actual notice is given to the owner that they are there, and he neglects to remove them. For the law will not suffer the landlord to take advantage of his own or his tenant's wrong. 4. There are also other things privileged by the ancient common law as a man's tools and utensils of his trade, the acts of a carpenter, the books of a scholar, and the like, which are said to be privileged for the sake of the public, because taking them away would disable the owner from serving the commonwealth in his station. So, beasts of the plough, 
Haberia Karukai, and sheep are privileged from distresses at common law, while goods or other sort of beasts, which Bracton calls Catala Atsiosa, may be distrained. But, as beasts of the plough may be taken in execution for debt, so they may be for distresses by statute which partake of the nature of executions. And perhaps the true reason why these tools of a man's trade were privileged at the common law was because the distress was then merely intended to compel the payment of the rent, and not as a satisfaction for its non-payment, and therefore to deprive the party of the instruments and means of paying it would counteract the very end of the distress. 5. Nothing shall be distrained for rent which may not be rendered again in as good plight as when it was distrained, for which reason milk, fruit, and the like cannot be distrained. A distress at common law being only in the nature of a pledge or security to be restored in the same plight when the debt is paid. So anciently, sheaves or shocks of corn could not be distrained because some damage must needs accrue in their removal, but a cart loaded with corn might, as that could be safely restored. But now, by statute 2, William and Mary, C5, corn in sheaves or cocks, or loose in the straw, or hay in barns or ricks, or otherwise, may be distrained as well as other chattels. 6. Lastly, things fixed to a freehold may not be distrained, as cauldrons, windows, doors, and chimney pieces, for they favor of the realty. For this reason also, corn growing could not be distrained, till the statute 11, George II, C. 19, empowered landlords to distrain corn, grass, or other products of the earth, and to cut and gather them when ripe. End of chapter 1, part 1. Chapter 1, part 2 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes Of the Redress of Private Wrongs by the Mere Act of the Parties Part 2 Let us next consider, thirdly, how distresses may be taken, disposed of, or avoided. And first I must premise that the law of distresses is greatly altered within a few years last past. Formerly, they were looked upon in no other light than as a mere pledge or security for payment of rent or other duties or satisfaction for damage done. And so the law still continues with regard to distresses of beasts taken damage feasant and for other causes not altered by Act of Parliament, over which the distrainer has no other power than to retain them till satisfaction is made. But the stresses for rent arrear being found by the legislature to be the shortest and most effectual method of compelling the payment of such rent, many beneficial laws for this purpose have been made in the present century, which have much altered the common law as laid down in our ancient writers. In pointing out, therefore, the methods of distraining, I shall in general suppose the distress to be made for rent and remark where necessary the differences between such distress and one taken for other causes. In the first place, then, all distresses must be made by day, unless in the case of damage feasant, an exception being there allowed, lest the beasts should escape before they are taken. And when a person intends to make a distress, he must, by himself or his bailiff, enter on the demised premises, formerly, during the continuance of the lease, but now he may distrain within six months after the determination of such lease whereon rent is due. If the lessor does not find sufficient distress on the premises, formerly he could resort nowhere else, and therefore tenants who were knavish made a practice to convey away their goods and stock fraudulently from the house or land's demise in order to cheat their landlords. 
But now the landlord made the strain any goods of his tenant carried off the premises clandestinely wherever he finds them within thirty days after, unless they have been bona fide sold for a valuable consideration. And all persons privy to or assisting in such fraudulent conveyance forfeit double the value to the landlord. The landlord may also distrain the beasts of his tenant feeding upon any commons or wastes appendant or appurtenant to the demised premises. The landlord might not formally break open a house to make a distress, for that is a breach of the peace. But when he was in the house, it was held that he might break open an inner door, and now he may, by the assistance of the peace officer of the parish, break open in the daytime any place locked up to prevent the distress, oath being first made, in case it be a dwelling house, of a reasonable ground to suspect that goods are concealed therein. Where a man is entitled to distrain for an entire duty, he ought to distrain for the whole at once, and not for part at one time and part at another. But if he distrains for the whole, and there is not sufficient on the premises, or he happens to mistake in the value of the thing distrained, and so takes an insufficient distress, he may take a second distress to complete his remedy. Distresses must be proportioned to the thing distrained for. By the statute of Marlbridge, 52, Henry III, C4, if any man takes a great or unreasonable distress for rent or rear, he shall be heavily immersed for the same. As if the landlord distrains two oxen for twelve pence rent, the taking of both is an unreasonable distress. But, if there were no other distress nearer to the value to be found, he might reasonably have distrained one of them. But for homage, fealty, or suit, as also for parliamentary wages, it is said that no distress can be excessive. For as these distresses cannot be sold, the owner, upon making satisfaction, may have his chattels again. The remedy for excessive distresses is by a special action of the Statute of Marlbridge, for an action of trespass is not maintainable upon this account, it being no injury at the common law. When the distress is thus taken, the next consideration is the disposal of it, for which purpose the things distrained must in the first place be carried to some pound and there impounded by the taker. But in their way thither, they may be rescued by the owner in case the distress was taken without cause or contrary to law, as if no rent be due, if they were taken upon the highway or the like. In these cases, the tenant may lawfully make rescue. But if they be once impounded, even though taken without any cause, the owner may not break the pound and take them out, for they are then in the custody of the law. A pound, parcus, which signifies any enclosure, is either pound overt, that is, open, overhead, or pound covert, that is, close. By the statute 1 and 2, Philip and Mary, C12, no distress of cattle can be driven out of the hundred where it is taken, unless to a pound overt within the same shire, and within three miles of the place where it was taken. This was for the benefit of the tenants, that they may know where to find and replevy the distress. And by statute 11, George II, C19, which was made for the benefit of the landlords, any person distraining for rent may turn any part of the premises upon which a distress is taken into a pound pro hoc vice for securing of such distress. If a live distress of animals be impounded in a common pound overt, the owner must take notice of it at his peril. But if any special pound overt so constituted for this particular purpose the distrainer must give notice to the owner, and in both these cases the owner and not the distrainer is bound to provide the beasts with food and necessaries. But if they be put in a pound covert, as in a stable or the like, the landlord or distrainer must feed and sustain them. A distress of household goods or other dead chattels, which are liable to be stolen or damaged by weather, ought to be impounded in a pound covert else the distrainer must answer for the consequences.
When impounded, the goods were formerly, as was before observed, only in the nature of a pledge or security to compel the performance of satisfaction, and upon this account it hath been held that the distrainer is not at liberty to work or use a distrained beast. And thus the law still continues with regard to beasts taken damage feasant and distresses for suit or services, which must remain impounded till the owner makes satisfaction or contests the right of distraining by replevying the chattels. To replevy, replegiari, that is, to take back the pledge, is, when a person distrained upon applies to the sheriff or his officers and has the distress returned to his own possession upon giving good security to try the right of taking it in a suit at law, and, if that be determined against him, to return the cattle or goods once more into the hands of the distrainer. This is called a replevin, of which more will be said hereafter. At present, I shall only observe that, as a distress is at common law only in nature of a security for the rent or damages done, a replevin answers the same end to the distrainer as the distress itself, since the party replevying gives security to return the distress if the right be determined against him. This kind of distress, though it puts the owner to inconvenience and is therefore a punishment to him, yet, if he continues obstinate and will make no satisfaction or payment, it is no remedy at all to the distrainer. But for a debt due to the crown, unless paid within forty days, the distress was always saleable at the common law. And for an immersement imposed at a court leet, the lord may also sell the distress, partly because, being the king's court of record, its process partakes of the royal prerogative but principally because it is in the nature of an execution to levy a legal debt. And so, in the several statute distresses before mentioned, which are also in the nature of executions, the power of sale is likewise usually given to effectuate and complete the remedy. And, in like manner, by several acts of Parliament, in all cases of distress for rent, if the tenant or owner do not, within five days after the distress is taken, and notice of the cause thereof given him, replevy the same with sufficient security, the distrainer, with the sheriff or constable, shall cause the same to be appraised by two sworn appraisers, and sell the same towards satisfaction of the rent and charges, rendering the overplus, if any, to the owner himself. And by this means, a full and entire satisfaction may now be had for rent in arrear by the mere act of the party himself, viz. by distress, the remedy given at the common law, and sale consequent thereon, which is added by act of Parliament. Before I quit this article, I must observe that the many particulars which attend the taking of a distress used formally to make it a hazardous kind of proceeding. For if any one irregularity was committed, it vitiated the whole, and made the distrainers trespassers ab initio. But now, by the statute 11, George II, C. 19, it is provided that for any unlawful act done, the whole shall not be unlawful, or the parties trespassers ab initio, but that the party grieved shall only have an action for the real damage sustained, and not even that if tender of amends is made before any action is brought. 6. The seizing of Harriots when due on the death of a tenant is also another species of self-remedy not much unlike that of taking cattle or goods in distress. As for that division of Harriots, which is called Harriot service and is only a species of rent, the Lord may distrain for this as well as seize. But for Harriot custom, which Sir Edward Coke says lies only in prender and not in render, the lords may seize the identical thing itself, but cannot distrain any other chattel for it. The like speedy and effectual remedy of seizing is given with regard to many things that are said to lie in franchise, as waifs, wrecks, estrays, deodans, and the like, all which the person entitled thereto may seize, 
without the formal process of a suit or action. Not that they are debarred of this remedy by action, but have also the other and more speedy one for the better asserting their property. The thing to be claimed being frequently of such a nature as might be out of reach of the law before any action could be brought. These are the several species of remedies which may be had by the mere act of the party injured. I shall next briefly mention such as arise from the joint act of all the parties together, and these are only two, accord and arbitration. 1. Accord is a satisfaction agreed upon between the party injuring and the party injured, which, when performed, is a bar of all actions upon this account as if a man contract to build a house or deliver a horse, and fail in it. This is an injury for which the sufferer may have his remedy by action. But if the party injured accepts a sum of money or other thing as a satisfaction, this is a redress of that injury and entirely takes away the action. By several late statutes, particularly 11 George II, C-19, in case of irregularity in the method of distraining, and 24 George II, C24, in case of mistakes committed by justices of the peace, even tender of sufficient amends to the party injured is a bar of all actions, whether he thinks proper to accept such amends or no. 2. Arbitration is where the parties injuring and injured submit all matters in dispute concerning any personal chattels or personal wrong to the judgment of two or more arbitrators, who are to decide the controversy, and if they do not agree, it is usual to add that another person be called in as an umpire, imperator, to whose sole judgment it is then referred, or frequently there is only one arbitrator originally appointed. This decision in any of these cases is called an award, and thereby the question is fully determined and the right transferred or settled, as it could have been by the agreement of the parties or the judgment of a court of justice. But the right of real property cannot thus pass by a mere award, which subtlety, in a point of form, for now it is reduced to nothing else, had its rise from feudal principles. For if this had been permitted, the land might have been alien collusively without the consent of the superior. Yet doubtless an arbitrator may now award a conveyance or a release of lands, and it will be a breach of the arbitration bond to refuse compliance. For though originally the submission to arbitration used to be by word or by deed, yet both of these being revocable in their nature, it has now become the practice to enter into mutual bonds with conditions to stand to the award or arbitration of the arbitrators or umpire therein named. And experience having shown the great use of these peaceable and domestic tribunals, especially in settling matters of account and other mercantile transactions which are difficult and almost impossible to be adjusted on a trial at law, the legislature has now established the use of them as well as in controversies where causes are depending, as in those where no action is brought, and which still depend upon the rules of the common law. Enacting, by the statute 9 and 10, William III, C. 15, that all merchants and others who desire to end any controversy for which there is no other remedy but by personal action or suit in equity, may agree that their submission of the suit to arbitration or umpirage shall be made a rule of any of the king's courts of record. And after such rule made, the parties disobeying the award shall be liable to be punished as for a contempt of the court, unless such award be set aside for corruption or other misbehavior in the arbitrators or umpire proved on oath to the court within one term after the award is made. And in consequence of this statute, it has now become a considerable part of the business of the superior courts to set aside such awards when partially or illegally made, or to enforce their execution when legal, by the same process of contempt as is awarded for disobedience to such rules and orders as are issued by the courts themselves.
End of chapter 1, part 2. Chapter 2 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Redress by the Mere Operation of Law. The remedies for private wrongs which are affected by the mere operation of law will fall within a very narrow compass, there being only two instances of this sort that at present occur to my recollection. The one, that of retainer, where a creditor is made executor or administrator to his debtor. The other, in the case of what the law calls a remitter. 1. If a person indebted to another makes his creditor or debtee his executor, or if such creditor obtains letters of administration to his debtor, in these cases the law gives him a remedy for his debt by allowing him to retain so much as will pay himself before any other creditors whose debts are of equal degree. This is a remedy by the mere act of law, and grounded upon this reason, that the executor cannot without an apparent absurdity, commence a suit against himself as representative of the deceased to recover that which is due him in his own private capacity, but, having the whole personal estate in his hands, so much as is sufficient to answer his own demand is, by operation of law, applied to that particular purpose. Else, by being made executor, he would be put in a worse condition than all the rest of the world besides. For though a rateable payment of all the debts of the deceased in equal degree is clearly the most equitable method, yet, as every scheme for a proportionable distribution of the assets among all the creditors hath been hitherto found to be impracticable and productive of more mischiefs than it would remedy, so that the creditor who first commences his suit is entitled to a preference in payment, it follows that as the executor can commence no suit, he must be paid the last of any, and of course must lose his debt in case the estate of his testator should prove insolvent unless he be allowed to retain it. The doctrine of retainer is therefore the necessary consequence of that other doctrine of law, the priority of such creditor who first commences his action. But the executor shall not retain his own debt in prejudice to those of a higher degree, for the law only puts him in the same situation as if he had sued himself as executor and recovered his debt, which he never could be supposed to have done while debts of a higher nature subsisted. Neither shall one executor be allowed to retain his own debt in prejudice to that of his co-executor in equal degree, but both shall be discharged in proportion, nor shall an executor of his own wrong be in any case permitted to retain. 2. Remitter is where he who hath the true property or jus proprietatis in lands but is out of possession thereof, and hath no right to enter without recovering possession in an action, hath afterwards the freehold cast upon him by some subsequent, and of course defective title. In this case, he is remitted, or sent back by operation of law, to his ancient and more certain title. The right of entry, which he hath gained by a bad title, shall be ipso facto annexed to his own inherent good one and his defeasible estate shall be utterly defeated and annulled by the instantaneous act of law without his participation or consent. As if A deceases B, that is, turns him out of possession, and dies leaving a son C. Hereby, the estate descends to C, the son of A, and B is barred from entering thereon till he proves his right in an action. Now if afterwards C, the heir of the deceaser makes a lease for life to D, with remainder to B the deceasee for life, and D dies, hereby the remainder accrues to B, the deceasee, who thus gaining a new freehold by virtue of the remainder, which is a bad title, is by act of law remitted, 
or in of his former and surer estate. For he hath thereby gained a new right of possession, to which the law immediately annexes his ancient right of propriety. If the subsequent estate or right of possession be gained by a man's own act or consent, as by immediate purchase being of full age, he shall not be remitted. For the taking of such subsequent estate was his own folly, and shall be looked upon as a waiver of his prior right. Therefore, it is to be observed that to every remitter there are regularly these incidents, an ancient right and a new defeasible estate of freehold, uniting in one and the same person, which defeasible estate must be cast upon the tenant not gained by his own act or folly. The reason given by Littleton why this remedy, which operates silently and by the mere act of law was allowed, is somewhat similar to that given in the preceding article, because otherwise he who hath right would be deprived of all remedy. For as he himself is the person in possession of the freehold, there is no other person against whom he can bring in action to establish his prior right. And for this cause the law doth adjudge him in by remitter, that is, in such a plight as if he had lawfully recovered the same land by suit. For as Lord Bacon observes, the benignity of the law is such as when to preserve the principles and grounds of law, it depriveth a man of his remedy without his own fault, it will rather put him in a better degree and condition than in a worse. Nam quod remedio destituitor, ipsa revalit se culpa absit. But there shall be no remitter to a right for which the party has no remedy by action, as if the issue in tail be barred by the fine or warranty of his ancestor, and the freehold is afterwards cast upon him, he shall not be remitted to his estate tail for the operation of the remitter is exactly the same after the union of the two rights as that of a real action would have been before it. As, therefore, the issue in tail could not by any action have recovered his ancient estate, he shall not recover it by remitter. And thus much for these extrajudicial remedies, as well as for real as personal injuries, which are furnished by the law, where the parties are so peculiarly circumstanced as to not be able to apply for redress in the usual and ordinary methods to the courts of public justice. End of chapter 2all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Courts in General The next and principal object of our inquiries is the redress of injuries by suit in courts, wherein the act of the parties and the act of the law cooperate the act of the parties being necessary to set the law in motion, and the process of the law being in general the only instrument by which the parties are enabled to procure a certain and adequate redress. And here it will not be improper to observe that although in the several cases of redress by the act of the parties mentioned in a former chapter the law allows an extrajudicial remedy, yet that does not exclude the ordinary course of justice but it is only an additional weapon put into the hands of certain persons in particular instances where natural equity or the peculiar circumstances of their situation required a more expeditious remedy than the formal process of any court of judicature can furnish. Therefore, though I may defend myself or relations from external violence, I yet am afterwards entitled to an action of assault and battery though i may retake my goods if i have a fair and peaceable opportunity this power of recaption does not debar me from my action of trover or detinue i may either enter on the lands on which i have a right of entry or may demand possession by a real action 
I may either abate a nuisance by my own authority or call upon the law to do it for me. I may distrain for rent or have an action of debt at my own option. If I do not distrain my neighbor's cattle damage feasant, I may compel him by action of trespass to make me a fair satisfaction. If a heriot or a diadan be withheld from me by fraud or force, I may recover it, though I never seized it. And with regard to accords and arbitrations, these in their nature being merely an agreement or compromise, most indisputably suppose a previous right of obtaining redress some other way which is given up by such agreement. But as to remedies by the mere operation of law, those are indeed given because no remedy can be ministered by suit or action without running into the palpable absurdity of a man's bringing an action against himself. The two cases wherein they happen being such, wherein the only possible legal remedy would be directed against the very person himself who seeks relief. In all other cases, it is a general and indisputable rule that where there is a legal right, there is also a legal remedy by suit or action at law whenever that right is invaded. And in treating of these remedies by suit in courts, I shall pursue the following method. First, I shall consider the nature and several species of courts of justice, and secondly, I shall point out in which these courts and in what manner the proper remedy may be had for any private injury, or, in other words, what injuries are cognizable and how redressed in each respective species of courts. First, then, of courts of justice, and herein we will consider first their nature and incidence in general, and then the several species of them erected and acknowledged by the laws of England. A court is defined to be a place wherein justice is judicially administered. And as by our excellent constitution, the sole executive power of the laws is vested in the person of the king, it will follow that all courts of justice, which are the medium by which he administers the laws, are derived from the power of the crown. For whether created by an act of parliament, letters patent, or prescription, the only methods of erecting a new court of judicature, the king's consent in the two former is expressly, and in the latter impliedly, given. In all these courts, the king is supposed in contemplation of law to be always present, but as that is in fact impossible, he is there represented by his judges, whose power is only an emanation of the royal prerogative. For the more speedy, universal, and impartial administration of justice between subject and subject, the law hath appointed a prodigious variety of courts, some with a more limited, others with a more extensive jurisdiction, some constituted to inquire only, others to hear and determine, some to determine in the first instance, others upon appeal and by way of review. All these in their turns will be taken notice of in their respective places, and I shall therefore here only mention one distinction that runs throughout them all, viz. that some of them are courts of record, others not of record. A court of record is that where the acts and judicial proceedings are enrolled in parchment for a perpetual memorial and testimony, which rolls are called the records of the court, and are of such high and supereminent authority that their truth is not to be called in question. For it is a settled rule and maxim that nothing shall be averred against the record, nor shall any plea or even proof be admitted to the contrary. And if the existence of a record be denied, it shall be tried by nothing but itself, that is, upon bare inspection whether there be any such record or no else there would be no end of disputes. But if there appear any mistake of the clerk in making up such record, the court will direct him to amend it. All courts of record are the king's courts, in right of his crown and royal dignity, and therefore no other court hath authority to fine or imprison, so that the very erection of a new jurisdiction with the power of fine or imprisonment makes it instantly a court of record. A court not of record is the court of a private man, 
whom the law will not entrust with the discretionary power over the fortune or liberty of his fellow subjects. Such are the courts barren incident to every manner and other inferior jurisdictions, where the proceedings are not enrolled or recorded, but, as well as their existence, as the truth of the matters therein contained, shall, if disputed, be tried and determined by a jury. These courts can hold no plea of matters cognizable by the common law unless under the value of forty shillings, nor of any forcible injury whatsoever, not having any process to arrest the person of the defendant. In every court there must be at least three constituent parts, the actor, reus, and judex, the actor or plaintiff who complains of an injury done, the reus or defendant, who is called upon to make satisfaction for it, and the eudex or judicial power which is to examine the truth of the fact, to determine the law arising upon that fact, and, if any injury appears to have been done, to ascertain and by its officers apply the remedy. It is also usual in the superior courts to have attorneys and advocates or counsel as assistants. An attorney at law answers to the procurator or proctor of the civilians and canonists, and he is one who is put in the place, stead, or turn of another to manage his matters of law. Formerly, every suitor was obliged to appear in person to prosecute or defend his suit according to the old Gothic constitution, unless by special license under the king's letters patent. This is still the law in criminal cases, and an idiot cannot to this day appear by attorney but in person, for he hath not discretion to enable him to appoint a proper substitute, and upon his being brought before the court in so defenseless a condition, the judges are bound to take care of his interests, and they shall admit the best plea in his behalf that any one present can suggest. But, as in the Roman law, Cum olim in usu fuiset, alterias nomine agi non posse, sed da, quia hoc non minimam in commoditatem abebat, ciperent aminas per procuratares litigare. So with us, upon the same principle of convenience, it is now permitted in general, by diverse ancient statutes, whereof the first is statute Westminster 2, C. 10, that attorneys may be made to prosecute or defend any action in the absence of the parties to the suit. These attorneys are now formed into a regular corps. They are admitted to the execution of their office by the superior courts of Westminster Hall, and are in all points officers of the respective courts in which they are admitted, and, as they have many privileges on account of their attendance there, so they are peculiarly subject to the censure and animate version of the judges. No man can practice as an attorney in any of those courts, but such as is admitted and sworn an attorney of that particular court. An attorney of the court of king's bench cannot practice in the court of common pleas, nor vice versa. To practice in the court of chancery, it is also necessary to be admitted a solicitor therein and by the statute 22 George the second c46 no person shall act as an attorney at the court of quarter sessions but such as has been regularly admitted in some superior court of record so early as the statute 4 henry the fourth c18 it was enacted that attorneys should be examined by the judges and none admitted but such as were virtuous learned and sworn to do their duty and many subsequent statutes have laid them under farther regulations. Of advocates, or as we generally call them, counsel, there are two species or degrees, barristers and sergeants. The former are admitted after a considerable period of study, or at least standing in the inns of court, and are in our old books styled apprentices, apprentici ad legem being looked upon merely as learners, and not qualified to execute the full office of an advocate till they were sixteen years standing, at which time, according to Fortescue, 
they might be called to the state and degree of sergeants, or servientes ad legem. How ancient and honorable this state and degree is, the form, splendor, and profits attending it have been so fully displayed by many learned writers that they need not be here enlarged on. I shall only observe that sergeants at law are bound by a solemn oath to do their duty to their clients, and that by custom the judges of the courts of Westminster are always admitted into this venerable order before they are advanced to the bench, the original of which was probably to qualify those puisne barons of the exchequer to become justices of assize according to their exigence of the statutes of 14 Edward III, C16. From both these degrees, some are usually selected to be His Majesty's counsel learned in the law, the two principal of whom are called his attorney and solicitor general. The first king's counsel, under the degree of sergeant, was Sir Francis Bacon, who was made so honores causa, without either patent or fee, so that the first of the modern order, who are now the sworn servants of a crown with a standing salary, seems to have been Sir Francis North, afterwards Lord Keeper of the Great Seal to King Charles the Second. These king's counsel answer in some measure to the advocates of the revenue, advocati fisci, among the Romans for they must not be employed in any cause against the crown without special license, in which restriction they agree with the advocates of the fisc, but in the imperial law the prohibition was carried still farther and perhaps was more for the dignity of the sovereign, for in accepting some peculiar causes the fiscal advocates were not permitted to be at all concerned in private suits between subject and subject. A custom has of late years prevailed of granting letters patent of precedence to such barristers as the crown thinks proper to honor with that mark of distinction, whereby they are entitled to such rank and pre-audience as are assigned in their respective patents, sometimes next after the king's attorney general, but usually next after his majesty's counsel then being. These, as well as the queen's attorney and solicitor general, rank promiscuously with the king's council, and together with them fit within the bar of their respective courts, but receive no salaries and are not sworn, and therefore are at liberty to be retained in causes against the crown. And all other sergeants and barristers indiscriminately, except in the court of common pleas where only sergeants are admitted, may take upon them the protection and defense of any suitors, whether plaintiff or defendant, who are therefore called their clients, like the dependence upon the ancient Roman orators. Those indeed practiced gratis, for honor merely, or at most for the sake of gaining influence, and so likewise it is established with us that a counsel can maintain no action for his fees, which are given not as locatio vel conductio, but as quidam honorarium not as a salary or hire, but as a mere gratuity, which a counselor cannot demand without doing wrong to his reputation, as is also laid down with regard to advocates in the civil law, whose honorarium was directed by a decree of the Senate not to exceed in any case 10,000 sesterces, or about 80 pounds of English money. And in order to encourage due freedom of speech in the lawful defense of their clients, and at the same time to give a check to unseemly licentiousness of prostitute and illiberal men, a few of whom may sometimes insinuate themselves even into the most honorable professions, it hath been holden that a counsel is not answerable for any manner by him spoken relative to the cause in hand, and suggested in his client's instructions, although it should reflect upon the reputation of another and even prove absolutely groundless. But if he mentions an untruth of his own invention, or even upon instructions if it be impertinent to the cause in hand, he is then liable to an action from the party injured. And counsel guilty of deceit or collusion are punishable by the statute Westminster 1 3 Edward I c 28 with imprisonment for a year and a day 
and perpetual silence in the courts, a punishment still sometimes inflicted for gross misdemeanors in practice. End of chapter 3《Chapter Four, Part One of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book Three, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes of the Public Courts of Common Law and Equity. We are next to consider the several species and distinctions of courts of justice which are acknowledged and used in this kingdom, and these are either such as are of public and general jurisdiction throughout the whole realm, or such as are only of a private and special jurisdiction in some particular parts of it. Of the former, there are four sorts, the universally established courts of common law and equity, the ecclesiastical courts, the courts military, and courts maritime, and first of such public courts as are courts of common law or equity. The policy of our ancient constitution, as regulated and established by the great Alfred, was to bring justice home to every man's door by constituting as many courts of judicature as there are manors and townships in the kingdom, wherein Injuries were redressed in an easy and expeditious manner by the suffrage of neighbors and friends. These little courts, however, communicated with others of a larger jurisdiction, and those with others of a still greater power, ascending gradually from the lowest to the supreme courts, which were respectively constituted to correct the errors of the inferior ones, and to determine such causes as by reason of their weight and difficulty demanded a more solemn discussion. The course of justice flowing in large streams from the king as the fountain to his superior courts of record, and being then subdivided into smaller channels, till the whole and every part of the kingdom were plentifully watered and refreshed an institution that seems highly agreeable to the dictates of natural reason as well as of more enlightened policy being equally similar to that which prevailed in mexico and peru before they were discovered by the spaniards and that which was established in the jewish republic by moses in mexico each town and province had its proper judges who heard and decided causes except when the point in litigation was too intricate for their determination, and then it was remitted to the Supreme Court of the Empire, established in the capital and consisting of twelve judges. Peru, according to Garcilaso de Vega, an historian descended from the ancient Incas of that country, was divided into small districts containing ten families each, all registered and under one magistrate, who had authority to decide little differences and punish petty crimes. Five of these composed the higher class, or fifty families, and two of these last composed another called a hundred. Ten hundreds constituted the largest division, consisting of a thousand families, and each division had its separate judge or magistrate with a proper degree of subordination. In like manner, we read of Moses, that finding the sole administration of justice too heavy for him, he chose able men out of all Israel, such as feared God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens, and they judged the people at all seasons. The hard causes they brought unto Moses, but every small matter they judged themselves. These inferior courts, at least the name and form of them, still continue in our legal constitution. But as the superior courts of record have in practice obtained a concurrent original jurisdiction with these, and as there is besides a power of removing plaints or actions thither from all the inferior jurisdictions, upon these accounts, among others, it has happened that these petty tribunals have fallen into decay and almost into oblivion. 
whether for the better or the worse, may be matter of some speculation when we consider, on the one hand, the increase of expense and delay, and on the other, the more upright and impartial decision that follow from this change of jurisdiction. The order I shall observe in discoursing on these several courts constituted for the redress of civil injuries, for with those of a jurisdiction merely criminal, I shall not at present concern myself, will be by beginning with the lowest, and those whose jurisdiction, though public and generally dispersed throughout the kingdom, is yet, with regard to each particular court, confined to very narrow limits, and so ascending gradually to those of the most extensive and transcendent power. 1. The lowest and at the same time the most expeditious court of justice known to the law of England is the court of Piepudre Curia Pudis Pulversati, so called from the dusty feet of the suitors, or, according to Sir Edward Coke, because justice is there done as speedily as dust can fall from the foot. Upon the same principle that justice among the Jews was administered in the gate of the city, that the proceedings might be the more speedy as well as public. But the etymology given us by a learned modern writer is much more ingenious and satisfactory, it being derived, according to him, from pied poudreau, a peddler in old French, and therefore signifying the court of such petty chapmen as resort to fairs or markets. It is a court of record, incident to every fair and market, of which the steward of him, who owns or has the toll of the market, is the judge. It was instituted to administer justice for all injuries done in that very fair or market, and not in any preceding one, so that the injury must be done, complained of, heard, and determined within the compass of one in the same day. The court hath cognizance of all matters that can possibly arise within the precinct of that fair or market, and the plaintiff must make oath that this cause of an action arose there. From this court a writ of error lies in the nature of an appeal to the courts at Westminster. The reason of its institution seems to have been to do justice expeditiously among the variety of persons that resort from distant places to a fair or market, since it is probable that no other inferior court might be able to serve its process or execute its judgments on both or perhaps either of the parties, and therefore, unless this court had been erected, the complaint must necessarily have resorted, even in the first instance, to some superior judicature. 2. The court baron is a court incident to every manor in the kingdom, and was holden by the steward within the said manor. This court baron is of two natures. The one is a customary court, of which we formerly spoke, appertaining entirely to the copyholders, in which their estates are transferred by surrender and admittance, and the other, matters transacted relative to their tenures only. The other, of which we now speak, is a court of common law, and it is the court of the barons, by which name the freeholders were sometimes anciently called for that it is held before the freeholders who owe suit and service to the manor, the steward being rather the registrar than the judge. These courts, though in their nature distinct, are frequently confounded together. The court we are now considering, viz. the freeholders' court, was composed of the lord tenants, who are the pares of each other, and were bound by their feudal tenure to assist their lord in the dispensation of domestic justice. This was formerly held every three weeks, and its most important business is to determine, by writ of right, all controversies relating to the right of lands within the manor. It may also hold plea of any personal actions, of debt, trespass on the case, or the like, where the debt or damages do not amount to forty shillings which is the same sum or three marks that bounded the jurisdiction of the ancient Gothic courts in their lowest instance, or fired in courts, so called because four were instituted within every superior district or hundred. 
but the proceedings on a writ of right may be removed into the county court by a precept from the sheriff called a tolt, quia toliadatque eximit causum e curia baronum and the proceedings in all other actions may be removed into the superior courts by the king's writs of pone or aceda sacorium according to the nature of the suit after judgment given a writ also of false judgment lies to the courts at westminster to rehear and review the cause and not a writ of error for this is not a court of record and therefore in all these writs of removal the first direction given is to cause the plaint to be recorded, recordari facies loquelum. 3. A hundred court is only a larger court baron, being held for all the inhabitants of a particular hundred instead of a manor. The free suitors are here also the judges and the steward, the registrar, as in the case of a court baron. It is likewise no court of record, resembling the former in all points except that in point of territory it is of a greater jurisdiction this is said by sir edward coke to have been derived out of the county court for the ease of the people that they might have justice done to them at their own doors without any charge or loss of time but its institution was probably co with that of hundreds themselves which were formerly observed to have been introduced though not invented by Alfred, being derived from the polity of the ancient Germans. The Centeni, we may remember, were the principal inhabitants of a district composed of different villages, originally in number and hundred, but afterwards only called by that name, and who probably gave the same denomination to the district out of which they were chosen. Caesar speaks positively of the judicial power exercised in their hundred courts and courts baron. Principis regionum, atque pagorum, which we may fairly construe, the lords of hundred and manners, inter suas jus dicunt, controversiasque menuunt. And Tacitus, who had examined their constitution still more attentively, informs us not only of the authority of the lords but of that of the centeni the hundreds or jury who were taken out of the common freeholders and had themselves a share in the determination iliguntur in concilis et principes qui jura per pagos vicosque redunt centene singulus ex plebe comites concilium simul et auctoritas adsunt this hundred court was denominated Areda in the Gothic constitution. But this court, as causes are equally liable to removal from hence as from the common court baron, and by the same writs, and may also be reviewed by writ of false judgment, is therefore fallen into equal disuse with regard to the trial of actions. 4. The county court is a court incident to the jurisdiction of the sheriff. It is not a court of record, but may hold pleas of debt or damages under the value of forty shillings, over some of which causes these inferior courts have, by the express words of the Statute of Gloucester, a jurisdiction totally exclusive of the King's superior courts. For in order to be entitled to sue an action of trespass for goods before the King's judicars, the plaintiff is directed to make an affidavit to that cause of action does really and bona fide amount to forty shillings, which affidavit is now unaccountably disused except in the court of exchequer. The statute also, 43 Elizabeth C. 6, which gives the judges in all potential actions where the jury assess less damages than forty shillings, a power to certify the same and abridge the plaintiff of his full costs was also meant to prevent vexation by litigious plaintiffs, who, for purposes of mere oppression, might be inclinable to institute suits in the superior courts for injuries of a trifling value. The county court may also hold plea of many real actions and of all personal actions to any amount by virtue of a special writ called justices, which is a writ empowering the sheriff for the sake of dispatch to do the same justice in his county court 
as might otherwise be had at Westminster. The freeholders of the county are the real judges in this court, and the sheriff is the ministerial officer. The great conflux of freeholders, which are supposed always to attend at the county court, which Spellman calls Forum Plebeae Justiate et Theatrum Comitive Potestatis, is the reason why all acts of Parliament at the end of every session were wont to be there published by the sheriff, why all outlawries of absconding offenders are there proclaimed, and why all popular elections which the freeholders are to make, as formerly of sheriffs and conservators of the peace, and still of coroners, verders, and knights of the shire, must ever be made in pleno comitatu, or in full county court. By the statute 2 Edward the Sixth, C. 25, no county court shall be adjourned longer than for one month consisting of 28 days. And this was also the ancient usage, as appears from the laws of King Edward the Elder. Praepositos, that is the sheriff, ad quartum circiter septemanam frequentem populae concionem celebrato, quique usid decito, litesque singulas derimito. In those times the county court was a court of great dignity and splendor, the bishop and the elderman, or earl, with the principal men of the shire sitting therein to administer justice both in lay and ecclesiastical causes. But its dignity was much impaired when the bishop was prohibited and the earl neglected to attend it, and in modern times, as proceedings are removable from hence into the king's superior courts by writ of pone or recordade, in the same manner as from hundred courts and courts barren, and as the same writ of false judgment may be had in a nature of a writ of error, this has occasioned the same disuse of bringing actions therein. End of chapter 4, part 1. Chapter 4, Part 2 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of the Public Courts of Common Law and Equity, Part 2. These are the several species of common law courts, which, though dispersed universally throughout the realm, are nevertheless of a partial jurisdiction and confined to particular districts, yet communicating with, and as it were members of, the superior courts of a more extended and general nature, which are calculated for the administration of redress not in any one lordship, hundred, or county only, but throughout the whole kingdom at large, of which sort is 5. The Court of Common Pleas, or, as it is frequently termed in law, the Court of Common Bench. By the ancient Saxon constitution, there was only one superior court of justice in the kingdom, and that had cognizance both of civil and spiritual causes, viz. the Wittenagemot, or General Council which assembled annually or oftener wherever the king kept his Easter, Christmas, or Whitsuntide, as well as to do private justice as to consult upon public business. At the conquest, the ecclesiastical jurisdiction was diverted into another channel, and the conqueror, fearing danger from these annual parliaments, contrived also to separate their ministerial power as judges from their deliberative as counsellors to the crown. He therefore established a constant court in his own hall, thence called by Bracton and other ancient authors Aula Regia, or Aula Regis. This court was composed of the king's great officers of state resident in his palace, and usually attendant on his person, such as the Lord High Constable and Lord Marshal, who chiefly presided in matters of honor and of arms, determining according to the law military and the law of nations. 
Besides these, there were the Lord High Steward and the Lord Great Chamberlain, the Steward of the Household, the Lord Chancellor, whose peculiar business it was to keep the king's seal and examine all such writs, grants, and letters as were to pass under that authority, and the Lord High Treasurer, who was the principal adviser in all matters relating to revenue. These high officers were assisted by certain persons learned in the laws, who were called the king's justiciars or justices, and the greater barons of parliament, all of whom had a seat in the aula regia, and formed a kind of court of appeal, or rather of advice, in matters of great moment and difficulty. All these, in their several departments, transacted all secular business, both criminal and civil, and likewise the matters of the revenue. And over all presided one special magistrate, called the chief justiciar, or capitalis justiciaris totius angle, who was also principal minister of state, the second man in the kingdom, and by virtue of his office, guardian of the realm in the king's absence. And this officer it was who principally determined all the vast variety of causes that arose in this extensive jurisdiction, and from the plenitude of his power grew at length both obnoxious to the people and dangerous to the government which employed him. This great universal court, being bound to follow the king's household in all his progress and expeditions, the trial of common causes therein, was found very burdensome to the subject. Wherefore, King John, who dreaded also the power of the justiciar, very readily consented to that article which now forms the eleventh chapter of Magna Carta, and enacts that, Communia placita non sequandor curiam regis, sed detenientor in aliquo loco certo. This certain place was established in Westminster Hall, the place where the Aula Regis originally sate, when the king resided in that city, and there it hath ever since continued. And the court, being thus rendered fixed and stationary, the judges became so too, and a chief with other justices of the common pleas was thereupon appointed, with jurisdiction to hear and determine all pleas of land and injuries merely civil between subject and subject. Which critical establishment of this principal court of common law, at that particular juncture and that particular place, gave rise to the inns of court in its neighborhood, and thereby collecting together the whole body of the common lawyers, enabled the law itself to withstand the attacks of the canonists and civilians who labored to extirpate and destroy it. This precedent was soon after copied by King Philip the Fair in France, who about the year 1302 fixed the Parliament of Paris to abide constantly in that metropolis, which before used to follow the person of the king wherever he went, and in which he himself used frequently to decide the causes that were there dependent. But all were then referred to the sole cognizance of the Parliament and its learned judges. And thus also, in 1495, the Emperor Maximilian I fixed the imperial chamber, which before always traveled with the court and household, to be constantly held at Worms, from whence it was afterwards translated to Spire. The Aula Regia, being thus stripped of so considerable a branch of its jurisdiction, and the power of the chief justiciar being also considerably curbed by many articles in the great charter, the authority of both began to decline apace under the long and troublesome reign of King Henry the Third. And in farther pursuance of this example, the other several offices of the chief justiciar were under Edward I, who new modeled the whole frame of our judicial polity subdivided and broken into distinct courts of judicature. A court of chivalry was erected over which the constable and marshal presided, as did the steward of the household over another constituted to regulate the king's domestic servants. The high steward, with the barons of parliament, formed an august tribunal for the trial of delinquent peers, 
and the barons reserved to themselves in Parliament the right of reviewing sentences of other courts in the last resort. The distribution of common justice between man and man was thrown into so provident an order that the great judicial officers were made to form a check upon each other, the court of chancery issuing all writs under the great seal to the other courts, the common pleas being allowed to determine all causes between private subjects, the exchequer managing the king's revenue, and the court of king's bench retaining all jurisdiction which was not cantoned out to the other courts, and particularly the superintendence of all the rest by way of appeal, and the sole cognizance of pleas of the crown or criminal causes. For pleas or suits are regularly divided into two sorts, pleas of the crown, which comprehend all crimes and misdemeanors wherein the king, on behalf of the public, is the plaintiff, and common pleas, which include all civil actions depending between subject and subject. The former of these were the proper object of the jurisdiction of the Court of King's Bench, the latter of the Court of Common Pleas, which is a court of record, and is styled by Sir Edward Coke the lock and key of the common law, for herein only can real actions, that is, actions which concern the right of freehold or the realty, be originally brought, and all other or personal pleas between man and man are likewise here determined, though in some of them the king's bench has also a concurrent authority. The judges of this court are at present four in number, one chief and three puissine justices, created by the king's letters patent who fit every day in the four terms to hear and determine all matters of law arising in civil causes whether real personal or mixed and compounded of both these it takes cognizance of as well as originally as upon removal from the inferior courts before mentioned but a writ of error in the nature of an appeal lies from this court into the court of king's bench 6. The Court of King's Bench, so called because the king used formally to sit there in person, the style of the court, still being coram ipso regi, is the supreme court of common law in the kingdom, consisting of a chief justice and three puissine justices, who are by their office the sovereign conservators of the peace and supreme coroners of the land. Yet, Though the king himself used to sit in this court, and still is supposed to do so, he did not, neither by law is he empowered to, determine any cause or motion, but by the mouth of his judges to whom he hath committed his whole judicial authority. This court, which, as we have said, is the remnant of the Aula Regia, is not, nor can be, from the very nature and constitution of it fixed to any certain place, but may follow the king's court wherever it goes, for which reason all process issuing out of this court in the king's name is returnable, ubacunque ferimos in Anglia. It hath indeed, for some centuries past, usually say at Westminster, being an ancient palace of the crown, but might remove with the king to York, or Exeter, if he thought proper to command it. And we find that, after Edward I had conquered Scotland, it actually sate at Roxburgh. And this movable quality, as well as its dignity and power, are fully expressed by Bracton, when he says that the justices of this court are capitales, generales, perpetui, et majores, alatre regis residentes, qui omnium aliorum corrigere tenentor injurias et errores. And it is, moreover, especially provided in the Articuli Super Cartas that the king's chancellor and the justices of his bench shall follow him, so that he may have at all times near unto him some that be learned in the laws. The jurisdiction of this court is very high and transcendent. It keeps all inferior jurisdictions within the bounds of their authority, and may either remove their proceedings to be determined here, or prohibit their progress below. 
It superintends all civil corporations in the kingdom. It commands magistrates and others to do what their duty requires in every case where there is no other specific remedy. It protects the liberty of the subject by speedy and summary interposition. It takes cognizance both of criminal and civil causes, the former in what is called crown side or crown office, the latter in the plea side of the court. The jurisdiction of the crown side is not our present business to consider. That will be more properly discussed in the ensuing volume. But on the plea side or civil branch, it hath an original jurisdiction and cognizance of all trespasses and all other injuries alleged to be committed vi et armis, which, being a breach of the peace, favor of a criminal nature, although the action is brought for a civil remedy, and for which the defendant ought in strictness to pay a fine to the king as well as damages to the injured party. This court might likewise, upon the division of the Aula Regia, have originally held plea of any other civil action whatsoever, except actions real, which are now very seldom in use, provided the defendant was an officer of the court, or in the custody of the marshal or prison keeper of this court for a breach of the peace or any other offense. In process of time, by a fiction, this court began to hold plea of all personal actions whatsoever, and has continued to do so for ages, it being surmised that the defendant is arrested for a supposed trespass, which he has never in reality committed, and being thus in the custody of the marshal of this court, the plaintiff is at liberty to proceed against him for any other personal injury, which surmise of being in the marshal's custody the defendant is not at liberty to dispute. And these fictions of law, though at first they may startle the student, he will find upon further consideration to be highly beneficial and useful, especially as this maxim is ever invariably observed, that no fiction shall extend to work an injury, its proper operation being to prevent a mischief or remedy an inconvenience that might result from the general rule of law. So true is it that in fictionis jure semper subsistit a equitas. In the present case, it gives the suitor his choice of more than one tribunal before which he may institute his action, and it prevents the circuity and delay of justice by allowing that suit to be originally and in the first instance commenced in this court, which after a determination in another, might ultimately be brought before it on a writ of error. For this court is likewise a court of appeal, into which may be removed by writ of error all determinations of the Court of Common Pleas and of all inferior courts of record in England, and to which a writ of error lies also from the Court of King's Bench in Ireland. Yet even this so high and honorable court is not the dernier resort of the subject, for if he be not satisfied with any determination here, he may remove it by writ of error into the House of Lords, or the Court of Exchequer Chamber, as the case may happen, according to the nature of the suit, and the manner in which it has been prosecuted. 7. The Court of Exchequer is inferior in rank, not only to the Court of King's Bench, but to the common pleas also. But I have chosen to consider it in this order on account of its double capacity as a court of law and a court of equity also. It is a very ancient court of record, set up by William the Conqueror as part of the Aula Regia, though regulated and reduced to its present order by King Edward I and intended principally to order the revenues of the crown and to recover the king's debts and duties. It is called the exchequer, scotcharium, from the checked cloth resembling a chessboard which covers the table there, and on which, when certain of the king's accounts are made up, the sums are marked and scored with counters. It consists of two divisions, the receipt of the exchequer, which manages the royal revenue, and with which these commentaries have no concern and the court or judicial part of it, 
which is again subdivided into a court of equity and a court of common law. The court of equity is held in the exchequer chamber before the Lord Treasurer, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, the Chief Baron, and three Puisne ones. These Mr. Selden conjectures to have anciently been made out of such as were barons of the kingdom or parliamentary barons, and thence to have derived their name, which conjecture receives great strength from Bracton's explanation of Magna Carta C14, which directs that the earls and barons be immersed by their peers, that is, says he, by the barons of the exchequer. The primary and original business of this court is to call the king's debtors to account by bill filed by the attorney general, and to recover any lands, tenements, or hereditaments, any goods, chattels, or other profits or benefits belonging to the crown, so that by their original constitution, the jurisdiction of the courts of common pleas, king's bench, and exchequer was entirely separate and distinct the common pleas being intended to decide all controversies between subject and subject, the king's bench to correct all crimes and misdemeanors that amount to a breach of the peace, the king being then the plaintiff, as such offenses are an open derogation of the jure regalia of his crown, and the exchequer to adjust and recover his revenue, wherein the king is also plaintiff, as the withholding and non-payment thereof is an injury to his jura fiscalia. But, as by a fiction, almost all sorts of civil actions are now allowed to be brought in the king's bench, in like manner, by another fiction, all kinds of personal suits may be prosecuted in the court of exchequer. For as all the officers and ministers of this court have, like those of other superior courts, the privilege of suing and being sued only in their own court, so also the king's debtors and farmers and all accomptants of the exchequer are privileged to sue and implead all manner of persons in the same court of equity that they themselves are called into. They have likewise privileged to sue and implead one another or any stranger in the same kind of common law actions where the personality only is concerned, as are prosecuted in the Court of Common Pleas. This gives original to the common law part of their jurisdiction, which was established merely for the benefit of the king's accomptants, and is exercised by the barons only of the exchequer, and not the treasurer or chancellor. The writ upon which all proceedings here are grounded is called a quo minus in which the plaintiff suggests that he is the king's farmer or debtor, and that the defendant hath done him the injury or damage complained of. Quomino sufficiens existit, by which he is the less able to pay the king his debt or rent. And these suits are expressly directed by what is called the Statute of Rutland to be confined to such matters only as specifically concern the king or his ministers of the exchequer. And by the Articuli Super Cartus, it is enacted that no common pleas be thenceforth holden in the exchequer contrary to the form of the Great Charter. But now, by the suggestion of privilege, any person may be admitted to sue in the exchequer as well as the king's accomptant. The surmise of being a debtor to the king is therefore become a matter of form and mere words, of course, and the court is open to all the nation equally. The same holds with regard to the equity side of the court, for there any person may file a bill against another upon a bare suggestion that he is the king's accomptant, but whether he is so or not is never controverted. In this court, on the equity side, the clergy have long used to exhibit their bills for the non-payment of tithes, in which case the surmise of being the king's debtor is no fiction, they being bound to pay him their first fruits and annual tenths. But the chancery has of late years obtained a large share in this business. An appeal from the equity side of this court lies immediately to the House of Peers, 
but from the common law side, in pursuance of the statute 31 Edward III, C12, a writ of error must first be brought into the court of exchequer chamber. And from their determination, there lies in the Dernia Resort a writ of error to the House of Lords. End of chapter 4, part 2. Chapter 4, Part 3 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of the Public Courts of Common Law and Equity. Part 3. 8. The High Court of Chancery is the only remaining, and in matters of civil property, by much the most important of any, of the King's superior and original courts of justice. It has its name of Chancery, Cancellaria, from the judge who presides there, the Lord Chancellor, or Cancellarius, who, Sir Edward Coke tells us, is so termed a Cancellando, from cancelling the king's letters patents when granted contrary to law, which is the highest point of his jurisdiction. But the office and name of chancellor, however derived, was certainly known to the courts of the Roman emperors, where originally it seemed to have signified a chief scribe or secretary, who was afterwards invested with several judicial powers and a general superintendency over the rest of the officers of the prince. From the Roman Empire it passed to the Roman Church, ever emulous of imperial state, and hence every bishop has to this day his chancellor, the principal judge of his consistory. And when the modern kingdoms of Europe were established upon the ruins of the empire, almost every state preserved its chancellor, with different jurisdictions and dignities according to their different constitutions. But in all of them, he seems to have had the supervision of all charters, letters, and such other public instruments of the crown as were authenticated in the most solemn manner, and therefore, when seals came into use, he had always the custody of the king's great seal, so that the office of chancellor or lord keeper whose authority by statute 5 Elizabeth C. 18 is declared to be exactly the same, is with us at this day created by the mere delivery of the king's great seal into his custody, whereby he becomes, without writ or patent, an officer of the greatest weight and power of any now subsisting in the kingdom, and superior in point of precedency to every temporal lord. He is a privy councillor by his office, and, according to Lord Chancellor Ellesmere, prolocutor of the House of Lords by prescription. To him belongs the appointment of all justices of the peace throughout the kingdom. Being formerly usually an ecclesiastic, for none else were then capable of an office so conversant in writings, and presiding over the royal chapel, he became keeper of the king's conscience visitor in the right of the king, of all hospitals and colleges of the king's foundation, and patron of all the king's livings under the value of twenty pounds per annum in the king's books. He is the general guardian of all infants, idiots, and lunatics, and has the general superintendence of all charitable uses in the kingdom. And all this, over and above the vast extensive jurisdiction which he exercises, in his judicial capacity in the court of chancery, wherein, as in the exchequer, there are two distinct tribunals, the one ordinary being a court of common law, the other extraordinary being a court of equity. The ordinary legal court is much more ancient than the court of equity. Its jurisdiction is the whole plea upon a sciere facius to repeal and cancel the king's letters patent when made against the law or upon untrue suggestions and to hold plea of petitions 
Monstrance de Droit, traverses of offices and the like, when the king hath been advised to do any act or is put in possession of any lands or goods in prejudice of a subject's right, on proof of which, as the king can never be supposed intentionally to do any wrong, the law questions not but he will immediately redress the injury, and refers that conscientious talk to the chancellor, the keeper of his conscience. It also appertains to this court to hold plea of all personal actions where any officer or minister of the court is a party. It might likewise hold plea by sciere facius of partitions of lands in coparsonary and of dower where any ward of the crown was concerned in interest so long as the military tenure subsisted, as it now may also do of the tithes of forest lands where granted by the king and claimed by a stranger against the grantee of the crown, and of executions on statutes or recognizances in nature thereof by the statute 23 Henry VIII C6. But if any cause comes to issue in this court, that is, if any fact be disputed between the parties, the Chancellor cannot try it, having no power to summon a jury, but must deliver the record, propria manu, into the court of the King's bench, where it shall be tried by the country, and judgment shall be there given thereon. And when judgment is given in Chancery, upon demurrer or the like, a writ of error in the nature of an appeal lies out of this ordinary court into the king's bench, though so little is usually done on the common law side of the court that I have met with no traces of any writ of error being actually brought since the fourteenth year of Queen Elizabeth, A.D. 1572. In this ordinary or legal court is also kept the officina justitiae, out of which all original writs that pass under the great seal, all commissions of charitable uses, sewers, bankruptcy, idiocy, lunacy, and the like do issue, and for which it is always open to the subject, who may there at any time demand and have, ex debito justiciae, any writ that his occasions may call for. These writs, relating to the business of the subject, and the returns to them were, according to the simplicity of ancient times, originally kept in a hamper, in anaperio, and the others, relating to such matters wherein the crown is immediately or immediately concerned, were preserved in a little sack or bag, in parva baga, and thence hath arisen the distinction of the Hanover office and petty bag office, which both belong to the common law court in chancery. But the extraordinary court, or court of equity, is now become the court of the greatest judicial consequence. This distinction between law and equity, as administered in different courts, is not at present known, nor seems to have ever been known, in any other country at any time. And yet, the difference of one from the other, when administered by the same tribunal, was perfectly similar to the Romans, the jus praetorium, or discretion of the praetor, being distinct from the legis, or standing laws. But the power of both centered in one and the same magistrate, who was equally entrusted to pronounce the rule of law and to apply it to particular cases by the principles of equity. With us, too, the aula regia, which was the supreme court of judicature, undoubtedly administered equal justice according to the rules of both or either as the case might chance to require. And when that was broken into pieces, the idea of a court of equity, as distinguished from a court of law, did not subsist in the original plan of partition. For though equity is mentioned by Bracton as a thing contrasted to strict law, yet neither in that writer nor in Glanville or Fleta, nor yet in Britain, composed under the auspices and in the name of Edward I, and treating particularly of courts and their several jurisdictions, is there a syllable to be found relating to the equitable jurisdiction of the Court of Chancery. 
It seems therefore probable that when the courts of law, proceeding merely upon the ground of the king's original writs and confining themselves strictly to that bottom, gave a harsh or imperfect judgment, the application for redress used to be to the king in person assisted by his privy council, from whence also arose the jurisdiction of the court of requests which was virtually abolished by the statute 16 Charles I C. 10, and they were wont to refer the matter either to the chancellor and a select committee, or by degrees to the chancellor only, who mitigated the severity or supplied the defects of the judgments pronounced in the court of law upon weighing the circumstances of the case. This was the custom not only among our Saxon ancestors before the institution of the Aula Regia, but also after its dissolution in the reign of King Edward I, if not that of Henry II. In these early times, the chief judicial appointment of the Chancellor must have been in devising new writs directed to the courts of common law to give remedy in cases where none was before administered and to quicken the diligence of the clerks in the chancery who were too much attached to ancient precedents it is provided by the statute westminster two thirteen edward i c twenty four that whensoever from thenceforth in one case a writ shall be found in the chancery and in a like case falling under the same right and requiring like remedy no precedent of a writ can be produced the clerks in the chancery shall agree in forming a new one, and if they cannot agree, it shall be adjourned to the next Parliament, where a writ shall be framed by consent of the learned in the law, lest it happen for the future that the court of our Lord the King be deficient in doing justice to the suitors. And this accounts for the very great variety of writs of trespass on the case to be met with in the register whereby the suitor had ready relief according to the exigency of his business and adapted to the specialty, reason, and equity of his very case. Which provision, with a little accuracy in the clerks of the chancery and a little liberality in the judges by extending rather than narrowing the remedial effects of the writ, might have effectually answered all the purposes of a court of equity except that of obtaining a discovery by the oath of the defendant. But when, about the end of the reign of King Edward III, uses of land were introduced, and though totally discountenanced by the courts of common law, were considered as fiduciary deposits and binding in conscience by the clergy, the separate jurisdiction of the chancery as a court of equity began to be established. And John Waltham, who was Bishop of Salisbury and Chancellor to King Richard II, by a strained interpretation of the above-mentioned Statute of Westminster II, devised the writ of subpoena, returnable in the Court of Chancery only, to make the fee-fee to uses accountable to his chestwe ke use, which process was afterwards extended to other matters wholly determinable at the common law upon false and fictitious suggestions, for which, therefore, the Chancellor himself is by statute 17 Richard II, C. 6, directed to give damages to the parties unjustly aggrieved. But as the clergy, so early as the reign of King Stephen, had attempted to turn their ecclesiastical courts into courts of equity, by entertaining suits pro laesione fide as a spiritual offense against conscience in case of non-payment of debts or any breach of civil contracts till checked by the constitutions of clarendon which declared that placita debitus quae fide interposita debintor velapsque interpositione fide sint injustitia regis therefore probably the ecclesiastical chancellors, who then held the seal, were remiss in abridging their own new acquired jurisdiction, especially as the spiritual courts continued to grasp at the same authority as before in suits pro lacione fide so late as the 15th century till finally prohibited by the unanimous concurrence of all the judges. However, 
It appears from the Parliament rolls that in the reigns of Henry the Fourth and Fifth, the Commons were repeatedly urgent to have a writ of subpoena entirely suppressed as being a novelty devised by the subtlety of Chancellor Waltham against the form of the common law, whereby no plea could be determined unless by examination and oath of the parties according to the form of the civil law and the law of the Holy Church in subversion of the common law. But though Henry the Fourth, being then hardly warm in his throne, gave a palliating answer to their petitions and actually passed the statute for Henry the Fourth, C. 23, whereby judgments at law are declared irrevocable unless by a taint or writ of error, yet his son put a negative at once upon their whole application, and in Edward the Fourth's time the process by bill and subpoena was become the daily practice of the court. But this did not extend very far. For in the ancient treaties, entitled Diversité des Cortes, supposed to be written very early in the 16th century, we have a catalogue of the matters of conscience then cognizable by subpoena in chancery, which fall within a very narrow compass. No regular judicial system at that time prevailed in the court. But the suitor, when he thought himself aggrieved, found a defaultery and uncertain remedy according to the private opinion of the Chancellor, who was generally an ecclesiastic or sometimes, though rarely, a statesman. No lawyer, having sate in the Court of Chancery from the times of the Chief Justices Thorpe and Kenvet, successively Chancellors to the King Edward III in 1372 and 1373, to the promotion of Sir Thomas More, by King Henry the Eighth in fifteen thirty, after which the great seal was indiscriminately committed to the custody of lawyers or courtiers or churchmen, according to the convenience of the times and the disposition of the prince required, till Sergeant Puckering was made Lord Keeper in fifteen ninety two, from which time to the present the court of chancery has always been filled by a lawyer, excepting the interval from 1621 to 1625, when the seal was entrusted to Dr. Williams, then Dean of Westminster, but afterwards Bishop of Lincoln, who had been chaplain to Lord Ellesmere when Chancellor. In the time of Lord Ellesmere, A.D. 1616, arose that notable dispute between the courts of law and equity, set on foot by Sir Edward Coke, then Chief Justice of the Court of King's Bench, whether a court of equity could give relief after or against a judgment at the common law. This contest was so warmly carried on that indictments were preferred against the suitors, the solicitors, the council, and even a master in chancery for having incurred a primonieri by questioning in a court of equity a judgment in the Court of King's Bench obtained by gross fraud and imposition. This matter, being brought before the king, was by him referred to his learned counsel for their advice and opinion, who reported so strongly in favor of the courts of equity that his majesty gave judgment on their behalf, but not contented with the irrefragable reasons and precedents produced by his counsel, for the chief justice was clearly in the wrong, he chose rather to decide the question by referring it to the plenitude of his royal prerogative. Sir Edward Coke submitted to the decision, and thereby made atonement for his error. But this struggle, together with the business of commendums, in which he acted a very noble part, and is controlling the commissioners of sewers, were the open and avowed causes first of his suspension, and soon after of his removal from his office. Lord Bacon, who succeeded Lord Ellesmere, reduced the practice of the court into a more regular system, but did not sit long enough to effect any considerable revolution in the science itself, and few of his decrees which have reached us are of any great consequence to posterity. His successors, in the reign of Charles I, did little to improve upon his plan and even after the restoration the seal was committed to the Earl of Clarendon, who had withdrawn from practice as a lawyer 
near 20 years, and afterwards to the Earl of Shaftesbury, who had never practiced at all. Sir Henage Finch, who succeeded in 1673 and became afterwards Earl of Nottingham, was a person of the greatest abilities and most uncorrupted integrity, a thorough master and zealous defender of the laws and constitution of his country, and endued with a pervading genius that enabled him to discover and to pursue the true spirit of justice, notwithstanding the embarrassments raised by the narrow and technical notions which then prevailed in the courts of law, and the imperfect ideas of redress which had possessed the courts of equity. The reason and necessities of mankind, arising from the great change in property by the extension of trade and the abolition of military tenures, cooperated in establishing his plan, and enabled him, in the course of nine years, to build a system of jurisprudence and jurisdiction upon wide and rational foundations, which have also been extended and improved by many great men who have since presided in chancery. And from that time to this, the power and business of the court have increased to an amazing degree. From this court of equity and chancery, as from other superior courts, an appeal lies to the House of Peers. But there are these differences between appeals from a court of equity and writs of error from a court of law. 1. That the former may be brought upon any interlocutory manner, and the latter upon nothing but a definitive judgment. 2. That on writs of error the House of Lords pronounces the judgment. On appeals, it gives direction to the court below to rectify its own decree. End of chapter 4, part 3Chapter 4, Part 4 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of the Public Courts of Common Law and Equity, Part 4. 9. The next court I shall mention is one that hath no original jurisdiction, but is only a court of appeal to correct the errors of other jurisdictions. This is the court of Exchequer Chamber, which was first erected by Statute 31 Edward III, C. 12, to determine causes upon writs of error from the common law side of the Court of Exchequer and to that end it consists of the Lord Treasurer, the Lord Chancellor, and the Justices of the King's Bench and Common Pleas, in imitation of which a second Court of Exchequer Chamber was erected by Statute 27 Elizabeth C. 8, consisting of the Justices of the Common Pleas and the Barons of the Exchequer, before whom writs of error may be brought to reverse judgments in certain suits originally begun in the court of king's bench into the court also of exchequer chamber which then consists of all the judges of the three superior courts and now and then the lord chancellor also are sometimes adjourned from the other courts such causes as the judges upon argument find to be of great weight and difficulty before any judgment is given upon them in the court below. From all the branches of this court of exchequer chamber, a writ of error lies to 10. The House of Peers, which is the Supreme Court of Judicature in the Kingdom, having at present no original jurisdiction over causes, but only upon appeals and writs of error, to rectify any injustice or mistake of the law committed by the courts below. To this authority they succeeded, of course, upon the dissolution of the Aula Regia, for, as the barons of Parliament were constituent members of that court, and the rest of its jurisdiction was dealt out to other tribunals, 
over which the great officers who accompanied those barons were respectively delegated to preside, it followed that the right of receiving appeals and superintending all other jurisdictions still remained in that noble assembly from which every other great court was derived. They are, therefore, in all causes the last resort, from whose judgment no farther appeal is permitted, but every subordinate tribunal must conform to their determinations, the law reposing an entire confidence in the honor and conscience of the noble persons who compose this important assembly, that they will make themselves masters of those questions upon which they undertake to decide, since upon their decision all property must finally depend. Hitherto may also be referred the tribunal established by statute 14 Edward III, C5, consisting, though now out of use, of one prelate, two earls, and two barons, who are to be chosen at every new parliament to hear complaints of grievance and delays of justice in the king's courts, and to give directions for remedying these inconveniences in the courts below. This committee seems to have been established lest there should be a defect of justice for want of a Supreme Court of Appeal during the intermission or recess of Parliament. For the statute father directs that if the difficulty be so great that it may not well be determined without assent of Parliament, it shall be brought by the said prelate, earls, and barons unto the next Parliament, who shall finally determine the same. 11. Before I conclude this chapter, I must also mention an eleventh species of courts of general jurisdiction and use, which are derived out of and act as collateral auxiliaries to the foregoing. I mean the courts of Assize and Nisi Prius. These are composed of two or more commissioners who are twice in every year sent by the king's special commission all round the kingdom except only London and Middlesex, where courts of Nisi Prius are holding in and after every term before the chief or other judge of the several superior courts to try by a jury of the respective counties the truth of such matters of fact as are then under dispute in the courts of Westminster Hall. These judges, of a size, came into use in the room of the ancient justices in Eyre, Justiciare in itinere, who were appointed by the Great Council of the Realm, A.D. 1176-22 Henry II, with a delegated power from the King's Great Court, or Aula Regia, being looked upon as members thereof. And they made their circuit round the kingdom once in seven years for the purpose of trying causes. They were afterwards directed by Magna Carta C-12, to be sent into every county once a year to take or try certain actions, then called recognitions or assizes, the most difficult of which they are directed to adjourn into the court of common pleas to be there determined. The present justices of Assize and Nisi Prius are derived from the statute Westminster 2, 13 Edward I, C30, explained by several other acts particularly the statute 14 Edward III, C16, and must be of two of the king's justices of the one bench or the other, or the chief baron of the exchequer, or the king's sergeant sworn. They usually make their circuits in the respective vacations after Hillary and Trinity terms, assizes being allowed to be taken in the holy time of Lent by consent of the bishops at the king's request as expressed in Statute Westminster 1, 3, Edward I, C51. And it was also usual during the times of popery for the prelates to grant annual licenses to the justices of assize to administer oaths in holy times. For oaths, being of a sacred nature, the logic of those deluded ages concluded that they must be of ecclesiastical cognizance. The prudent jealousy of our ancestors ordained that no man of law should be judge of assize in his own country, and a similar prohibition is found in the civil law, which has carried this principle so far 
that it is an equivalent to the crime of sacrilege for a man to be governor of the province in which he was born or has any civil connection. The judges upon their circuits sit by virtue of five several authorities. 1. The Commission of the Peace. 2. A Commission of Oyer or Terminer. 3. A Commission of General Gold Delivery the consideration of all of which belongs properly to the subsequent book in these commentaries. But the fourth commission is, 4. A commission of assize, directed to the judges and clerk of assize to take assizes, that is, to take the verdict of a particular species of jury, called an assize, and summoned for the trial of landed disputes, of which hereafter. The other authority is, 5 that of Nisi Prius, which is a consequence of the commission of assize, being annexed to the office of those justices by the statute of Westminster 2, 13 Edward I, C. 30, and it empowers them to try all questions of fact issuing out of the courts at Westminster that are then ripe for trial by jury. The original of the name is this. All causes commenced in the courts of Westminster Hall are by the course of the courts appointed there to be tried on a day fixed in some Easter or Michaelmas terms by a jury returned from the county wherein the cause of action arises. But with this proviso, nisi prius justiciari ad assises capiendas venerint, unless before the day prefixed, the judges of assize come into the county in question. This they are sure to do in the vacations preceding each Easter and Michaelmas terms, and there dispose of the cause, which saves much expense and trouble both to the parties, the jury, and the witnesses. These are the several courts of common law and equity, which are of public and general jurisdiction throughout the kingdom. And upon the whole, we cannot but admire the wise economy and admirable provision of our ancestors in settling the distribution of justice in a method so well calculated for cheapness, expedition, and ease. By the constitution which they established, all trivial debts and injuries of small consequence were to be recovered or redressed in every man's own county, hundred, or perhaps parish. Pleas of freehold and the more important disputes of property were adjourned to the King's Court of Common Pleas, which was fixed in one place for the benefit of the whole kingdom. Crimes and misdemeanors were to be examined in a court by themselves, and matters of the revenue in another distinct jurisdiction. Now indeed, for the ease of the subject and the greater dispatch of causes, methods have been found to open all the three superior courts for the redress of private wrongs, which have remedied many inconveniences and yet preserved the forms and boundaries handed down to us from high antiquity. If facts are disputed, they are sent down to be tried in the county by the neighbors, but the law, arising upon those facts, is determined by the judges above, and if they are mistaken in point of law, there remain in both cases two successive courts of appeal to rectify such their mistakes. If the rigor of general rules does in any case bear hard upon individuals, courts of equity are open to supply the defects, but not sap the fundamentals of the law. Lastly, there presides over all one great court of appeal, which is the last resort in matters both of law and equity and which will therefore take care to preserve an uniformity and equilibrium among all the inferior jurisdictions, a court composed of prelates selected for their piety and of nobles advanced to that honor for their personal merit or deriving both honor and merit from an illustrious train of ancestors who are formed by their education interested by their property and bound upon their conscience and honor to be skilled in the laws of their country. This is a faithful sketch of the English juridical constitution as designed by the masterly hands of our forefathers, of which the great original lines are still strong and visible, 
And if any of its minuter strokes are by length of time at all obscured or decayed, they may still be with ease restored to their pristine vigor, and that not so much by fanciful alterations and wild experiments so frequent in this fertile age as by closely adhering to the wisdom of the ancient plan concerted by Alfred and perfected by Edward I, and by attending to the spirit without neglecting the forms of their excellent and venerable institutions. End of chapter 4, part 4. Chapter 5 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Courts Ecclesiastical, Military, and Maritime. Besides the several courts which were treated in the preceding chapter, and in which all injuries are redressed that fall under the cognizance of the common law of England, or that spirit of equity which ought to be its constant attendant, there still remain some other courts of a jurisdiction equally public and general, which take cognizance of other species of injuries of an ecclesiastical, military, and maritime nature and therefore are properly distinguished by the title of ecclesiastical courts, courts military, and courts maritime. 1. Before I descend to consider particular ecclesiastical courts, I must first of all, in general, premise that in the time of our Saxon ancestors there was no sort of distinction between the lay and the ecclesiastical jurisdiction. The county court was as much a spiritual as a temporal tribunal. The rights of the church were ascertained and asserted at the same time and by the same judges as the rights of the laity. For this purpose, the bishop of the diocese and the alderman, or, in his absence, the sheriff of the county, used to sit together in the county court and had there the cognizance of all causes as well ecclesiastical as civil a superior deference being paid to the bishop's opinion in spiritual matters and to that of the lay judges in temporal. This union of power was very advantageous to them both. The presence of the bishop added weight and reverence to the sheriff's proceedings, and the authority of the sheriff was equally useful to the bishop by enforcing obedience to his decrees in such refractory offenders as would otherwise have despised the thunder of mere ecclesiastical censures. But so moderate and rational a plan was wholly inconsistent with those views of ambition that were then forming by the court of Rome. It soon became an established maxim in the papal system of policy that all ecclesiastical persons and all ecclesiastical causes should be solely and entirely subject to ecclesiastical jurisdiction only, which jurisdiction was supposed to be lodged in the first place and immediately in the Pope by divine indefeasible right and investiture from Christ himself and derived from the Pope to all inferior tribunals. Hence the canon law lays it down as a rule that such a dotes a regibus honorandes sunt, non judicandi, and places an emphatical reliance on a fabulous tale which it tells of the Emperor Constantine that when some petitions were brought to him, imploring the aid of his authority against certain of his bishops, accused of oppression and injustice, he caused, says the holy canon, the petitions to be burnt in their presence, dismissing them with this valediction, Ite, et inter vos causas vestras discutite, quia dignum non est ut, non judicemus Dios. It was not, however, till after the Norman conquest that this doctrine was received in England, when William I, whose title was warmly espoused by the monasteries which he liberally endowed, and by the foreign clergy, whom he brought over in shoals from France and Italy, and planted in the best preferments of the English church, 
was at length prevailed upon to establish this fatal encroachment and separate the ecclesiastical court from the civil, whether actuated by principles of bigotry or by those of a more refined policy in order to discountenance the laws of King Edward abounding with the spirit of Saxon liberty is not altogether certain. But the latter, if not the cause, was undoubted the consequence of this separation, for the Saxon laws were soon overborne by the Norman justiciaries when the county court fell into disregard by the bishops withdrawing his presence in obedience to the charter of the conqueror, which prohibited any spiritual cause from being tried in the secular courts and commanded the suitors to appear before the bishop only whose decisions were directed to conform to the canon law. King Henry I, at his accession, among other restorations of the laws of King Edward the Confessor, revived this of the union of the civil and ecclesiastical courts, which was, according to Sir Edward Coke, after the great heat of the conquest was passed, only a restoration of the ancient law of England. This, however, was ill relished by the popish clergy, who, under the guidance of that arrogant prelate Archbishop Anselm, very early disapproved of a measure that put them on a level with the profane laity and subjected spiritual men and causes to the inspection of the secular magistrates, and therefore, in their synod, at Westminster III, Henry I, they ordained that no bishop should attend the discussion of temporal causes which soon dissolved this newly affected union. And when, upon the death of King Henry I, the usurper Stephen was brought in and supported by the clergy, we find one article of the oath which they imposed upon him was that ecclesiastical persons and ecclesiastical causes should be subject only to the bishop's jurisdiction. And as it was about this time that the contest and emulation began between the laws of England and those of Rome, the temporal courts adhering to the former and the spiritual adopting the latter as their rule of proceeding, this widened the breach between them and made a coalition afterwards impracticable, which probably would else have been effected at the general reformation of the church. In briefly recounting the various species of ecclesiastical courts, or, as they are often styled, courts Christian, curae Christianatis, I shall begin with the lowest and so ascend gradually to the Supreme Court of Appeal. 1. The Archdeacon's Court is the most inferior court in the whole ecclesiastical polity. It is held in the Archdeacon's absence before a judge appointed by himself and called his official, and its jurisdiction is sometimes in concurrence with, sometimes in execution of, the bishop's court of the diocese. From hence, however, by statute 24 Henry VIII C12, there lies an appeal to that of the bishop. 2. The consistory court of every diocesan bishop is held in the several cathedrals for the trial of all ecclesiastical causes arising within their respective dioceses. The bishop's chancellor, or his commissary, is the judge, and from his sentence there lies an appeal, by virtue of the same statute, to the archbishop of each province respectively. 3. The court of arches is a court of appeal belonging to the archbishop of each province, whereof the judge is called the dean of the arches, because he anciently held his court in the church of St. Mary Le Beau, Sancta Maria de Archibus, though all his principal spiritual courts are now holden at Doctor's Commons. His proper jurisdiction is only over the thirteen peculiar parishes belonging to the Archbishop in London, but the office of the Dean of the Arches, having been for a long time united with that of the Archbishop's principal official, he now, in the right of the last-mentioned office, receives and determines appeals from the sentences of all inferior ecclesiastical courts within the province. And from him there lies an appeal to the king in chancery, that is, to a court of delegates appointed under the king's great seal, by statute 25 Henry VIII, C19, 
as supreme head of the English church in the place of the Bishop of Rome, who formerly exercised this jurisdiction, which circumstance alone will furnish the reason why the popish clergy were so anxious to separate the spiritual court from the temporal. 4. The court of peculiars is a branch of and annexed to the court of arches. It has a jurisdiction over all those parishes dispersed through the province of Canterbury in the midst of other dioceses which are exempt from the ordinary's jurisdiction and subject to the metropolitan only. All ecclesiastical causes arising within these peculiar or exempt jurisdictions are, originally, cognizable by this court, from which an appeal lay formally to the Pope but now by the statute 25 Henry VIII, C-19, to the king in chancery. 5. The prerogative court is established for the trial of all testamentary causes where the deceased hath left bona notabilia within two different dioceses, in which case the probate of wills belongs, as we have formerly seen, to the archbishop of the province by way of special prerogative and all causes relating to the wills, administrations, or legacies of such persons are, ordinarily, cognizable herein before a judge appointed by the archbishop called the judge of prerogative court, from whom an appeal lies by statute 25 Henry VIII, C-19, to the king in chancery instead of the pope as formally. I pass by such ecclesiastical courts as have only what is called voluntary and not a contentious jurisdiction, which are merely concerned in doing or selling what no one opposes, and which keep an open office for that purpose, as granting dispensations, licenses, faculties, and other remnants of the papal extortions, but do not concern themselves with administering redress to any injury, and shall proceed to... 6. The Court of Appeal in all ecclesiastical causes, viz. the Court of Delegates, Judicis Delegate, appointed by the King's Commission under his great seal and issuing out of chancery, to represent his royal person and hear all appeals to him made by virtue of the before-mentioned statute of Henry VIII. This commission is usually filled with lords spiritual and temporal, judges of the courts at Westminster, and doctors of the civil law. Appeals to Rome were always looked upon by the English nation, even in the times of popery, with an evil eye, as being contrary to the liberty of the subject, the honor of the crown, and the independence of the whole realm, and were first introduced in very turbulent times in the sixteenth year of King Stephen, A.D. 1151, at the same period, Sir Henry Spellman observes that the civil and canon laws were first imported into England. But in a few years after, to obviate this growing practice, the constitutions made at Clarendon to Henry II, on account of the disturbances raised by Archbishop Becket and other zealots of the Holy See, expressly declare that appeals in causes ecclesiastical ought to lie from the archdeacon to the diocesan, from the diocesan to the archbishop of the province, and from the archbishop to the king, and are not to proceed any farther without special license from the crown. But the unhappy advantage that was given in the reigns of King John and his son Henry III to the encroaching power of the Pope, who was ever vigilant to improve all opportunities of extending his jurisdiction hither, at length riveted the custom of appealing to Rome in causes ecclesiastical so strongly that it never could be thoroughly broken off till the grand rupture happened in the reign of Henry VIII, when all the jurisdiction usurped by the Pope in matters ecclesiastical was restored to the crown to which it originally belonged, so that the statute 25 Henry VIII was but declaratory of the ancient law of the realm. But in case the king himself be party in any of these suits, the appeal does not then lie to him in chancery, which would be absurd. But, by the statute 24 Henry VIII, C. 12, to all the bishops of the realm, 
assembled in the upper house of convocation. 7. A commission of review is a commission sometimes granted in extraordinary cases to revise the sentence of the Court of Delegates when it is apprehended they have been led into a material error. This commission the King may grant, although the statutes 24 and 25 Henry VIII before cited declare the sentence of the delegates definitive, because the Pope, as supreme head by the canon law, used to grant such commission of review, and such authority as the Pope heretofore exerted is now annexed to the crown by statutes 26 Henry VIII C1 and 1 Elizabeth C1. But it is not a matter of right, which the subject may demand ex debito justicie, but merely a matter of favor, and which, therefore, is often denied. These are now the principal courts of ecclesiastical jurisdiction, none of which are allowed to be courts of record, no more than was another much more formidable jurisdiction, but now deservedly annihilated, viz., the Court of the King's High Commission in Causes Ecclesiastical. This court was erected and united to the regal power by virtue of the statute 1 Elizabeth C. 1, instead of a larger jurisdiction which had before been exercised under the Pope's authority. It was intended to vindicate the dignity and peace of the Church by reforming, ordering, and correcting the ecclesiastical state and persons, and all manner of errors, heresies, schisms, abuses, offenses, contempts, and enormities, under the shelter of which very general words means were found in that and the two succeeding reigns to vest in the High Commissioner's extraordinary and almost despotic powers of fining and imprisoning, which they exerted much beyond the degree of the offense itself, and frequently over offenses by no means of spiritual cognizance. For these reasons, this court was justly abolished by statute 16 Charles I C2, and the weak and illegal attempt that was made to revive it during the reign of King James II served only to hasten that infatuated prince's ruin. 2. Next, as to the court's military. The only court of this kind known to and established by the permanent laws of the land is the court of chivalry formerly held before the High Lord Constable and Earl Marshal of England jointly, but since the attainder of Stafford Duke of Buckingham under Henry VIII and the consequent extinguishment of the office of Lord High Constable, it hath usually with respect to civil matters been held before the Earl Marshal only. This court, by statute 13 Richard II, C2, hath cognizance over contracts and other matters touching deeds of arms and war, as well out of the realm as within it, and from its sentences an appeal lies immediately to the king in person. This court was in great reputation in the times of pure chivalry, and afterwards, during our connections with the continent, by the territories which our princes held in France, but is now grown almost entirely out of use on account of the feebleness of its jurisdiction and want of power to enforce its judgments, as it can neither fine nor imprison, not being a court of record. 3. The maritime courts, or such as have power and jurisdiction to determine all maritime injuries arising upon the seas, or in parts out of the reach of the common law, are only the Court of Admiralty and its Courts of Appeal. The Court of Admiralty is held before the Lord High Admiral of England, or his deputy, who is called the Judge of the Court. According to Sir Henry Spellman and Lombard, it was, first of all, erected by King Edward III. Its proceedings are according to the method of the civil law, like those of the ecclesiastical courts, upon which account it is usually held at the same place with the superior ecclesiastical courts at Doctors' Commons in London. It is no court of record any more than the spiritual courts. From the sentences of the admiralty judge, an appeal always lay, 
in the ordinary course to the king in chancery as may be collected from statute twenty five henry the eighth c nineteen which directs the appeal from the archbishop's courts to be determined by persons named in the king's commission like as in case of appeal from the admiral court but this is also expressly declared by statute eight elizabeth c five which enacts that upon appeal made to the chancery the sentence definitive of the delegates appointed by commission shall be final appeals from the vice admiralty courts in america and our other plantations and settlements may be brought before the courts of admiralty in england as being a branch of the admiral's jurisdiction though they may also be brought before the king's council but in case of prize vessels taken in time of war in any part of the world and condemned in any courts of admiralty or vice-admiralty as lawful prize the appeal lies to certain commissioners of appeals consisting chiefly of the privy council and not to judges delegates and this by virtue of diverse treaties with foreign nations by which particular courts are established in all the maritime countries of europe for the decision of this question whether lawful prize or not for this being a question between subjects of different states it belongs entirely to the law of nations and not to the municipal laws of either country to determine it the original court to which this question is permitted in england is the court of admiralty and the court of appeal is in effect the king's privy council the members of which are in consequence of treaties commissioned under the great seal for this purpose in seventeen forty eight for the more speedy determination of appeals the judges of the courts of westminster hall though not privy councillors were added to the commission then in being but doubts being conceived concerning the validity of that commission on account of such addition the same was confirmed by statute twenty two george the second c three with a proviso that no sentence given under it should be valid unless a majority of the commissioners present were actually privy councillors but this did not i apprehend extend to any future commissions and such an addition became indeed wholly unnecessary in the course of the war which commenced in seventeen fifty six since during the whole of that war the commission of appeals was regularly attended and all its decisions conducted by a judge whose masterly acquaintance with the law of nations was known and revered by every state in europe end of chapter five chapter six part one of the commentaries on the laws of england book three by william blackstone this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by roy haynes of courts of a special jurisdiction part one in the two preceding chapters we have considered the several courts whose jurisdiction is public and general and which are so contrived that some or other of them may administer redress to every possible injury that can arise in the kingdom at large there yet remain certain others whose jurisdiction is private and special confined to particular spots or instituted only to redress particular injuries these are one the forest courts instituted for the government of the king's forests in different parts of the kingdom and for punishment of all injuries done to the king's deer or venison to the vert or greenward and to the covert in which such deer are lodged these are the courts of attachments of regard of swine moat and of justice seat one the court of attachments wood moat or forty days court is to be held before the verderers of the forest once in every forty days and is instituted to inquire into all offenders against the vert and venison who may be attached by their bodies if taken within the manor 
or Minwerv, Amanu, that is, in the very act of killing venison or stealing wood, or preparing so to do, by fresh and immediate pursuit after the act is done, else they may be attached by their goods. And in this forty days' court, the foresters, or keepers, are to bring in their attachments or presentments de veredi et venationi, and the verderers ought to receive the same, and to enroll them, and to certify them under their seals to the court of justice seat, or swinemote. For this court can only inquire of, but not convict, offenders. 2. The court of regard, or survey of dogs, is to be holden every third year for the lowering or expeditation of mastiffs, which is done by cutting off the claws of the forefeet to prevent them from running after deer. No other dogs but mastiffs are to be thus lowered or expeditated, for none other were permitted to be kept within the precincts of the forest, it being supposed that the keeping of these, and these only, was necessary for the defense of a man's house. 3. The court of Swinemote is to be holden before the verderers as judges by the steward of the Swinemote thrice in every year the swines or freeholders within the forest composing the jury. The principal jurisdiction of this court is, first, to inquire into the oppressions and grievances committed by the officers of the forest. De super oneratione forestariorum, et aliorum ministrorum foreste, et de eorum oppressionibus papilo regis illatis. And secondly, to receive and try presentments certified from the court of attachments against the fences in vert and venison. And this court may not only inquire, but convict also, which conviction shall be certified to the court of justice seat under the seals of the jury, for this court cannot proceed to judgment. But the principal court is, for the court of justice seat, which is held before the chief justice in ire, or chief itinerant judge, capitalis justiciaris in itinere, or his deputy, to hear and determine all trespasses within the forest, and all claims of franchises, liberties, and privileges, and all pleas and causes whatsoever therein arising. It may also proceed to try presentments in the inferior courts of the forests, and to give judgment upon convictions of the swine moat. And the Chief Justice may therefore, after presentment made or indictment found, but not before, issue his warrant to the officers of the forest to apprehend the offenders. It may be held every third year, and forty days' notice ought to be given of its sitting. This court may find and imprison for offenses within the forest, it being a court of record, and therefore a writ of error lies from hence to the court of king's bench to rectify and redress any maladministration of justice or the chief justice in ire may adjourn any matter of law into the court of king's bench these justices in ire were instituted by king henry the second a d eleven eighty four and their courts were formerly very regularly held but the last court of justice seat of any note was that holding in the reign of Charles I, before the Earl of Holland, the rigorous proceedings at which are reported by Sir William Jones. After the restoration, another was held, pro forma only, before the Earl of Oxford, but since the era of the Revolution in 1688, the forest laws have fallen into total disuse to the great advantage of the subject. 2. A second species of private courts is that of commissioners of sewers. This is a temporary tribunal, erected by virtue of a commission under the Great Seal, which formerly used to be granted pro re nada at the pleasure of the Crown, but now at the direction and nomination of the Lord Chancellor, Lord Treasurer, and Chief Justices, pursuant to the Statute 23 Henry VIII, C5. Their jurisdiction is to overlook the repairs of sea banks and sea walls, 
and the cleaning of rivers, public streams, ditches, and other conduits whereby any waters are carried off, and is confined to such county or particular district as the Commission shall expressly name. The Commissioners are a court of record, and may fine and imprison for contempts, and in the execution of their duty may proceed by jury or upon their own view, and may take order for the removal of any annoyances or the safeguard and conservation of the sewers within their commission, either according to the laws and customs of Roman Marsh or otherwise at their own discretion. They may also assess such rates or scots upon the owners of lands within their district as they shall judge necessary, and, if any person refuses to pay them, the commissioners may levy the same by distress of his goods and chattels, or they may, by statute 23 Henry VIII C5, sell his freehold lands, and by the 7 and C10, his copyhold also, in order to pay such scots or assessments. But their conduct is under the control of the Court of King's Bench, which will prevent or punish any illegal or tyrannical proceedings. And yet, in the reign of King James I, 8 November 1616, the Privy Council took upon them to order that no action or complaint should be prosecuted against the commissioners unless before that board, and committed several to prison who had brought such actions at common law till they should release the same. And one of the reasons for discharging Sir Edward Coke from his office of Lord Chief Justice was for countenancing those proceedings. The pretense for which arbitrary measures was no other than the tyrant's plea of the necessity of unlimited powers in works of evident utility to the public, the supreme reason above all reasons which is the salvation of the king's lands and people. But now it is clearly held that this, as well as all other inferior jurisdictions, is subject to the discretionary coercion of His Majesty's Court of King's Bench. 3. The Court of Policies of Assurance, when subsisting, is erected in pursuance of Statute 43 Elizabeth C. 12, which recites the immemorial usage of policies of assurance, by means whereof it cometh to pass, upon the loss or perishing of any ship, there followeth not the undoing of any man, but the loss lighteth rather easily upon many than heavily upon few and rather upon them that adventure not than upon those that do adventure, whereby all merchants, especially those of the younger sort, are assured to venture more willingly and more freely, and that heretofore such assurers had used to stand so justly and precisely upon their credits as few or no controversies had arisen thereupon, and if any had grown, the same from time to time had been ended and ordered by certain grave discreet merchants appointed by the Lord Mayor of the City of London, as men by reason of their experience fittest to understand and speedily decide those causes, but that of late years diverse persons had withdrawn themselves from that course of arbitration and had driven the assured to bring separate actions at law against each assurer it therefore enables the Lord Chancellor yearly to grant a standing commission to the Judge of the Admiralty, the Recorder of London, two doctors of the civil law, two common lawyers, and eight merchants, any three of which, one being a civilian or a barrister, are thereby, and by the statute, 13 and 14 Charles II, C. 23, empowered to determine in a summary way all causes concerning policies of assurance in London, with an appeal, by way of the bill, to the Court of Chancery. But the jurisdiction being somewhat defective, as extending only to London, and to no other assurances but those on merchandise, and to suits brought by the assured only, and not by the insurers, no such commission has of late years issued but insurance causes are now usually determined by the verdict of a jury of merchants and the opinion of the judges in case of any legal doubts, 
whereby the decision is more speedy, satisfactory, and final, though it is to be witnessed that some of the parliamentary powers invested in these commissioners, especially for the examination of witnesses, either beyond the seas or speedily going out of the kingdom, could at present be adopted by the courts of Westminster Hall without requiring consent of parties. 4. The Court of Marshalsea and the Palace Court at Westminster, though two distinct courts, are frequently confounded together. The former was originally holden before the steward and marshal of the king's house and was instituted to administer justice between the king's domestic servants that they might not be drawn into other courts and thereby the king lose their service. It was formally held in, though not a part of, the Aula Regis, and, when that was subdivided, remained a distinct jurisdiction, holding plea of all trespasses committed within the verge of the court where only one of the parties is in the king's domestic service, in which case the inquest shall be taken by a jury of the country, and of all debts, contracts, and covenants where both of the contracting parties belong to the royal household, and then the inquest shall be composed of men of the household only. By the statute of 13 Richard II, ST1, C3, in affirmance of the common law, the verge of the court in this respect extends for twelve miles round the king's palace of residence. And, as this tribunal was never subject to the jurisdiction of the chief judiciary, no writ of error lay from it, though a court of record, to the king's bench, but only to Parliament, till the statutes of 5 Edward III C2 and 10 Edward III ST2 C3, which allowed such writ of error before the king in his palace. But this court being ambulatory, and obliged to follow the king in all his progresses, so that by the removal of the household, actions were frequently discontinued, and doubts having arisen as to the extent of its jurisdiction, King Charles I, in the sixth year of his reign, by his letters patent, erected a new court of record, called the Curia Palati, or Palace Court, to be held before the steward of the household, and knight marshal, and the steward of the court, or his deputy, with jurisdiction to hold plea of all manner of personal actions whatsoever, which shall arise between any parties within twelve miles of his majesty's palace at Whitehall. The court is now held once a week, together with the ancient court of Marshalsea, in the borough of Southwark, and a writ of error lies from thence to the court of King's Bench. But if the cause is of any considerable consequence, it is usually removed on its first commencement, together with the custody of the defendant, either into the king's bench or common pleas by a writ of habeas corpus cum causa, and the inferior business of the court hath of late years been much reduced by the new courts of conscience erected in the environs of London, in consideration of which the four counsel belonging to these courts had salaries granted them for their lives by the statute 23 George II, C. 27. 5. A fifth species of private courts of a limited though extensive jurisdiction are those of the Principality of Wales, which upon its thorough reduction and settling of its polity in the reign of Henry VIII were erected all over the country, principally by the statute 34 and 35 Henry VIII C. 26, though much had before been done and the way prepared by the Statute of Wales 12, Edward I, and other statutes. By the Statute of Henry VIII before mentioned, courts baron, hundred, and county courts are there established as in England. A sessions is also to be held twice in every year in each county by judges appointed by the King to be called the Great Sessions of Wales in which all pleas of real and personal actions shall be held with the same form of process and in as ample a manner as in the court of common pleas at Westminster, 
and writs of error shall lie from judgments therein, it being a court of record, to the court of King's Bench at Westminster. But the ordinary original writs or process of the King's Courts at Westminster do not run into the Principality of Wales, though process of execution does, as do also all prerogative writs as writs of certiorari, mandamus, and the like, and even in causes between subject and subject, to prevent injustice through family factions and prejudices, it is held lawful, in causes of freehold at least, if not in all others, to bring in action in the English courts and try the same in the next English county adjoining to that part of Wales where the cause arises. 6. The Court of the Duchy Chamber of Lancaster is another special jurisdiction held before the Chancellor of the Duchy or his deputy concerning all matters of equity relating to lands holden of the King in right of the Duchy of Lancaster, which is a thing very distinct from the County Palatine and comprises much territory which lies at a vast distance from it, as particularly a very large district within the city of Westminster. The proceedings in this court are the same as on the equity side in the courts of exchequer and chancery, so that it seems not to be a court of record, and indeed it has been holden that those courts have a concurrent jurisdiction with the duchy court and may take cognizance of the same causes. End of chapter 6, part 1. Chapter 6, Part 2 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Courts of a Special Jurisdiction, Part 2. 7. Another species of private courts, which are of limited local jurisdiction, and have at the same time an exclusive cognizance of pleas in matters both of law and equity, are those which appertain to the counties palatine of Chester, Lancaster, and Durham, and the royal franchise of Eli. In all these, and in the Principality of Wales, the king's ordinary writs issuing under the great seal out of chancery, do not run. That is, they are of no force. For, as originally, all jura regalia were granted to the lords of these counties palatine, they had, of course, the sole administration of justice by their own judges appointed by themselves and not by the crown. It would therefore be incongruous for the king to send his writ to direct the judge of another's court in what manner to administer justice between the suitors. But when the privileges of these counties palatine and franchises were abridged by statute 27 Henry VIII C24, it was also enacted that all writs and process should be made in the king's name, but should be tessayed or witnessed in the name of the owner of the franchise. Wherefore, all writs whereon actions are founded, and which have current authority here, must be under the seal of the respective franchises, the two former of which are now annexed to the crown, and the two latter under the government of their several bishops. And the judges of assize who sit therein, sit by virtue of a special commission from the owners of the several franchises, and under the seal thereof and not by the usual commission under the great seal of England. Hither also may be referred the courts of the Cinque Ports, or five most important havens as they formerly were esteemed in the kingdom, viz. Dover, Sandwich, Romney, Hastings, and Hythe, to which Winchesley and Rye have since been added which have also similar franchises in many respects with the counties palatine and particularly an exclusive jurisdiction before the mayor and jurats of the ports 
in which exclusive jurisdiction the king's ordinary writ does not run. A writ of error lies from the mayor and jurats of each port to the Lord Warden of the Cinque Ports in his court of Shepway, and from the court of Shepway to the king's bench. And so, too, a writ of error lies from all the other jurisdictions to the same Supreme Court of Judicature as an ensign of superiority reserved to the crown at the original creation of the franchises. And all prerogative writs, as those of habeas corpus, prohibition, certiorari, and mandamus, may issue for the same reason to all these exempt jurisdictions, because the privilege that the king's writ runs not must be intended between party and party, for there can be no such privilege against the king. 8. The Stannery Courts in Devonshire and Cornwall, for the administration of justice among the tinners therein, are also courts of record, but of the same private and exclusive nature. They are held before the Lord Warden and his substitutes, in virtue of a privilege granted to the workers in the tin mines there, to sue and be sued only in their own courts that they may not be drawn from their business which is highly profitable to the public by attending their lawsuits in other courts. The privileges of the tinners are confirmed by a charter, 33 Edward I, and fully expounded by a private statute, 50 Edward III, which has since been explained by a public act, 16 Charles I, c. 15. What relates to our present purpose is only this, that all tinners and laborers in and about the stanneries shall, during the time of their working therein bona fide, be privileged from suits in other courts, and be only impleaded in the stannery courts in all matters, excepting pleas of land, life, and member. No writ of error lies from hence to any court in Westminster Hall, as was agreed by all the judges in 4 James I. But an appeal lies from the steward of the court to the underwarden, and from him to the lord warden, and thence to the privy council of the Prince of Wales as Duke of Cornwall, when he hath had livery or investiture of the same, and from thence the appeal lies to the king himself in the last resort. 9. The several courts within the city of London and other cities, boroughs, and corporations throughout the kingdom, held by prescription, charter, or act of parliament, are also of the same private and limited species. It would exceed the design and compass of our present inquiries if I were to enter into a particular detail of these and to examine the nature and extent of their several jurisdictions. It may in general be sufficient to say that they arose originally from the favor of the crown to those particular districts wherein we find them erected upon the same principle that hundred courts and the like were established for the convenience of the inhabitants that they might prosecute their suits and receive justice at home, that for the most part the courts at Westminster Hall have a concurrent jurisdiction with these or else a superintendency over them, and that the proceedings in these special courts ought to be according to the course of the common law unless otherwise ordered by Parliament, for though the king may erect new courts, yet he cannot alter the established course of law. But there is one species of courts constituted by Act of Parliament in the City of London and other trading and populous districts, which in its proceedings so varies from the course of the common law that it may derive a more particular consideration. I mean the courts of requests or courts of conscience for the recovery of small debts. The first of these was established in London so early as the reign of Henry the Eighth by an act of their common council, which, however, was certainly insufficient for that purpose and illegal, till confirmed by statute 3, James I, c. 15, which has since been explained and amended by statute 14, George II, c. 10. The Constitution is this. 
two aldermen and four commoners sit twice a week to hear all causes of debt not exceeding the value of forty shillings, which they examine in a summary way by the oath of the parties or other witnesses, and make such order therein as is consonant to equity and good conscience. The time and expense of obtaining this summary redress are very inconsiderable, which make it a great benefit to trade, and thereupon diverse trading towns and other districts have, within these few years last past, obtained acts of Parliament for establishing in them courts of conscience upon nearly the same plan, the first of which was that for Southwark by statute 22 George II C47, which has since been followed by very many others. The anxious desire that has been shown to obtain these several acts proves clearly that the nation in general is truly sensible of the great inconvenience arising from the disuse of the ancient county and hundred courts, wherein causes of the small value were always formally decided with very little trouble and expense to the parties. But it is to be feared that the general remedy, which of late hath been principally applied to this inconvenience, the erecting of these new jurisdictions, may itself be attended in time with very ill consequences, as the method of proceeding therein is entirely in derogation of the common law, as their large discretionary powers create a petty tyrant in a set of standing commissioners, and as the disuse of the trial by jury may tend to estrange the minds of the people from that valuable prerogative of Englishmen, which has already been more than sufficiently excluded in many instances. How much rather is it to be wished that the proceedings in the county and hundred courts could again be revived, without burthening the freeholders with too frequent and tedious attendances, but at the same time removing the delays that have insensibly crept into their proceedings and the power that either party have of transferring at pleasure their suits to the courts at Westminster. And we may with satisfaction observe that this experiment has been actually tried and has succeeded in the populous county of Middlesex which might serve as an example for others. For by statute 23 George II C33, it is enacted, 1. That a special county court shall be held at least once a month in every hundred of the county of Middlesex by the county clerk. 2. That twelve freeholders of that hundred qualified to serve on juries and struck by the sheriff shall be summoned to appear at such court by rotation, so as none shall be summoned oftener than once a year. 3. That in all causes not exceeding the value of forty shillings, the county clerk and twelve suitors shall proceed in a summary way, examining the parties and witnesses on oath, without the formal process anciently used and shall make such order therein as they shall judge agreeable to conscience. 4. That no plaints shall be removed out of this court by any process whatsoever, but the determination herein shall be final. 5. That if any action be brought in any of the superior courts against a person resident in Middlesex for a debt or contract upon the trial whereof the jury shall find less than forty shillings damages, the plaintiff shall recover no costs, but shall pay the defendant double costs, unless upon some special circumstances to be certified by the judge who tried it. 6. Lastly, a table of very moderate fees is prescribed and set down in the act, which are not to be exceeded upon any account whatsoever. This is a plan entirely agreeable to the constitution and genius of the nation, calculated to prevent a multitude of vexatious actions in the superior courts, and at the same time to give honest creditors an opportunity of recovering small sums, which now they are frequently deterred from by the expense of a suit at law, a plan which, in short, wants only to be generally known 
in order to its universal reception. 10. There is yet another species of private courts which I must not pass over in silence, viz. the Chancellor's Courts in the two universities of England, which two learned bodies enjoy the sole jurisdiction in exclusion of the King's Courts over all civil actions and suits whatsoever where a scholar or privileged person is one of the parties, excepting in such cases where the right of freehold is concerned and these by the university charter they are at liberty to try and determine either according to the common law of the land or according to their own local customs at their discretion which has generally led them to carry on their process in a course much conformed to the civil law for reasons sufficiently explained in a former volume these privileges were granted that the students might not be distracted from their studies by legal process from distant courts or other forensic avocations. And privileges of this kind are of very high antiquity, being generally enjoyed by all foreign universities as well as our own, in consequence, I apprehend, of a constitution of the Emperor Frederick, A.D. 1158. But as to England in particular, the oldest charter that I have seen, containing this grant to the University of Oxford, was 28 Henry III, A.D. 1244, and the same privileges were confirmed and enlarged by almost every succeeding prince, down to King Henry VIII, in the fourteenth year of whose reign the largest and most extensive charter of all was granted, one similar to which was afterwards granted to Cambridge in the third year of Queen Elizabeth. But yet, notwithstanding these charters, the privileges granted therein of proceeding in a course different from the law of the land were of so high a nature that they were held to be invalid. For though the king might erect new courts, yet he could not alter the course of law by his letters patent. Therefore, in the reign of Queen Elizabeth, an Act of Parliament was obtained, confirming all the charters of the two universities and those of 14 Henry VIII and 3 Elizabeth by name. Which blessed Act, as Sir Edward Coke entitles it, established this high privilege without any doubt or opposition, or, as Sir Matthew Hale very fully expresses the sense of the common law and the operation of the Act of Parliament, although King Henry the Eighth, fourteen A. R. Sui, granted to the university a liberal charter to proceed according to the use of the university, viz., by a course much conformed to the civil law, yet that charter had not been sufficient to have warranted such proceedings without the help of an Act of Parliament, and therefore in thirteen Elizabeth an act passed whereby that charter was in effect enacted, and it is thereby that at this day they have a kind of civil law procedure even in matters that are of themselves of common law cognizance where either of the parties is privileged. This privilege, so far as it relates to civil causes, is exercised at Oxford in the Chancellor's Court the judge of which is the vice-chancellor, his deputy, or assessor. From his sentence, an appeal lies to delegates appointed by the congregation, from thence to other delegates of the House of Convocation, and if they all three concur in the same sentence, it is final, at least by the statutes of the university, according to the rule of the civil law. But if there be any discordance or variation in any of the three sentences, an appeal lies in the last resort to judges' delegates appointed by the Crown under the Great Seal in Chancery. I have now gone through the several species of private or special courts of the greatest note in the kingdom, instituted for the local redress of private wrongs, and must, in the close of all, make one general observation from Sir Edward Coke, that these particular jurisdictions, derogating from the general jurisdiction of the courts of common law, are ever taken strictly, 
and cannot be extended farther than the express letter of their privileges will most explicitly warrant. End of Chapter 6, Part 2「Chapter Seven, Part One of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book Three, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes of the Cognizance of Private Wrongs, Part One. We are now to proceed to the cognizance of private wrongs, that is, to consider in which of the vast variety of courts mentioned in the three preceding chapters every possible injury that can be offered to a man's person or property is certain of meeting with redress. The authority of the several courts of private and special jurisdiction, or of what wrong such courts have cognizance, was necessarily remarked as those respective tribunals were enumerated, and therefore need not be here again repeated, which will confine our present inquiry to the cognizance of civil injuries in the several courts of public or general jurisdiction. And the order in which I shall pursue this inquiry will be by showing 1. What actions may be brought or what injuries remedied in the ecclesiastical courts. 2. What in the military? 3. What in the maritime? And 4. What in the courts of common law? And with regard to the three first of these particulars, I must beg leave not so much to consider what hath at any time been claimed or pretended to belong to their jurisdiction by the officers and judges of those respective courts, but what common law allows and permits to be so. For these eccentrical tribunals, which are principally guided by the rules of the imperial and canon laws, as they subsist and are admitted in England, not by any right of their own, but upon bare sufferance and tolerance from the municipal laws, must have recourse to the laws of that country wherein they are thus adopted, to be informed how far their jurisdiction extends, or what causes are permitted, and what forbidden, to be discussed or drawn in question before them. It matters not, therefore, what the Pandects of Justinian or the Decretals of Gregory have ordained. They are here of no more intrinsic authority than the laws of Solon and Lycurgus, curious perhaps for their antiquity, respectable for their equity, and frequently of admirable use in illustrating a point of history nor is it at all material in what light other nations may consider this matter of jurisdiction. Every nation must and will abide by its own municipal laws, which various accidents conspire to render different in almost every country in Europe. We permit some kinds of suits to be of ecclesiastical cognizance, which other nations have referred entirely to the temporal courts, as concerning wills and successions to intestate's chattels, and perhaps we may, in our turn, prohibit them from interfering in some controversies which on the continent may be looked upon as merely spiritual. In short, the common law of England is the one uniform rule to determine the jurisdiction of courts, and if any tribunals whatsoever attempt to exceed the limits so prescribed them, the king's courts of common law may and do prohibit them, and in some cases punish their judges. Having premised this general caution, I proceed now to consider 1. The wrongs or injuries cognizable by the ecclesiastical courts. I mean such as are offered to private persons or individuals, which are cognizable by the ecclesiastical court, not for the reformation of the offender himself or the party injuring, pro salute animae, as immoralities in general are, when unconnected with private injuries, but such as are there to be prosecuted for the sake of the party injured, to make him a satisfaction and redress for the damage which he has sustained, and these I shall reduce under three general heads, of causes pecuniary, causes matrimonial, 
and causes testamentary. 1. Pecuniary causes cognizable in the ecclesiastical courts are such as arise either from the withholding ecclesiastical dues or the doing or neglecting some act relating to the church whereby some damage accrues to the plaintiff towards obtaining a satisfaction for which he is permitted to institute a suit in the spiritual court. The principle of these is the subtraction or withholding of tithes from the parson or vicar, whether the former be a clergyman or a lay appropriator. But herein a distinction must be taken, for the ecclesiastical courts have no jurisdiction to try the right of tithes unless between spiritual persons, but in ordinary cases between spiritual men and laymen are only to compel the payment of them when the right is not disputed. By the statute, or rather writ, of circumspecte agatis, it is declared that the court Christian shall not be prohibited from holding plea si rector petar persos parochianos oblationes et decimos debetas et consuetas so that if any dispute arises whether such tithes be due and accustomed this cannot be determined in the ecclesiastical court but before the king's courts of the common law as such question affects the temporal inheritance and the determination must bind the real property but where the right does not come into question but only the fact of whether or no the tithes allowed to be due be really subtracted or withdrawn this is a transient personal injury for which the remedy may be properly had in the spiritual court, viz. the recovery of the tithes or their equivalent. By statute 2 and 3, Edward the Sixth, C. 13, it is enacted that if any person shall carry off his pradial tithes, viz. of corn, hay, or the like, before the tenth part is duly set forth, or agreement is made with the proprietor, or shall willingly withdraw his tithes of the same, or shall stop or hinder the proprietor of the tithes or his deputy from viewing or carrying them away, such offender shall pay double the value of the tithes with costs to be recovered before the ecclesiastical judge according to the king's ecclesiastical laws. By a former clause of the same statute, the treble value of the tithes, so subtracted or withheld, may be sued for in the temporal courts, which is equivalent to the double value to be sued for in the ecclesiastical. For one may sue for and recover in the ecclesiastical courts the tithes themselves, or a recompense for them by the ancient law, to which the suit for the double value is superadded by the statute. But as no suit lay in the temporal courts for the subtraction of tithes themselves, therefore the statute gave a treble forfeiture, if sued for there, in order to make the course of justice uniform, by giving the same reparation in one court as in the other. However, it now seldom happens that tithes are sued for at all in the spiritual court. For if the defendant pleads any custom, modus, composition, or other matter whereby the right of tithing is called into question, this takes it out of the jurisdiction of the ecclesiastical judges, for the law will not suffer the existence of such a right to be decided by the sentence of any single, much less an ecclesiastical judge, without the verdict of a jury. But a more summary method than either of recovering small tithes under the value of forty shillings is given by statute seven and eight william the third c six by complaint to two justices of the peace and by another statute of the same year the same remedy is extended to all tithes withheld by quakers under the value of ten pounds another pecuniary injury cognizable in the spiritual courts is the non-payment of other ecclesiastical dues to the clergy, as pensions, mortuaries, compositions, offerings, and whatsoever falls under the denomination of surplus fees for marriages or other ministerial offices of the church, all which injuries are redressed by a decree for their actual payment. Besides which, all offerings, oblations, and obventions 
not exceeding the value of 40 shillings may be recovered in a summary way before two justices of the peace. But care must be taken that these are real and not imaginary news, for if they be contrary to the common law, a prohibition will issue out of the temporal courts to stop all suits concerning them. As where a fee was demanded by the minister of a parish for the baptism of a child, which was administered in another place. This, however, authorized by the canon, is contrary to common right. For of common right, no fee is due the minister even for performing such branches of his duty, and it can only be supported by a special custom. But no custom can support the demand of a fee without performing them at all. For fees also, settled and acknowledged to be due to the officers of the ecclesiastical courts, a suit will lie therein. But not if the right of the fees is at all disputable, for then it must be decided at the common law. It is also said that if a curate be licensed and his salary appointed by the bishop, and he be not paid, the curate hath a remedy in the ecclesiastical court. But if he be not licensed, or hath no such salary appointing, or hath made a special agreement with the rector, he must sue for satisfaction at common law, either by proving such special agreement, or else by leaving it to a jury to give damages upon quantum meruit, that is, in consideration of what he reasonably deserved in proportion to the service performed. Under this head of pecuniary injuries may also be reduced the several matters of spoliation, dilapidations, and neglect of repairing the church and things thereunto belonging, for which a satisfaction may be sued for in the ecclesiastical court. Spoliation is an injury done by one clerk or incumbent to another in taking the fruits of his benefice without any right thereunto but under a pretended title. It is remedied by a decree to account for the profit so taken. This injury, when the jus patronatus, or right of advowson, doth not come in debate, is cognizable in the spiritual court, as if a patron first presents A to a benefice, who is instituted and inducted thereto, and then, upon pretense of a vacancy, the same patron presents B to the same living, and he also obtains institution and induction. Now if A disputes the fact of the vacancy, then that clerk who is kept out of the profits of the living, whichever it be, may sue the other in the spiritual court for spoliation or taking the profits of his benefice. And it shall there be tried whether the living were or were not vacant upon which the validity of the second clerk's pretensions must depend. But if the right of patronage comes at all into dispute, as if one patron presented A and another patron presented B, there the ecclesiastical court hath no cognizance, provided the tithe sued for amount to a fourth part of the value of the living, but may be prohibited at the instance of the patron by the king's writ of indicavit. So also, if a clerk without any color of title ejects another from his patronage, this injury must be redressed in the temporal courts, for it depends upon no question determinable by the spiritual law, as plurality of benefices or no plurality, vacancy or no vacancy, but is merely a civil injury. For dilapidations, which are a kind of ecclesiastical waste, either voluntary, by pulling down, or permissive, by suffering the chancel, patronage house, and other buildings thereunto belonging, to decay. An action also lies, either in the spiritual court, by the canon law, or in the courts of common law, and it may be brought by the successor against the predecessor, if living, or, if dead, then against his executors. By statute 13 Elizabeth, C10, if any spiritual person makes over or alienates his goods with intent to defeat his successors of their remedy for dilapidations, 
the successor shall have such remedy against the alienee in the ecclesiastical court as if he were the executor of his predecessor and by statute fourteen elizabeth c eleven all money recovered for the lapidations shall within two years be employed upon the buildings in respect whereof it was recovered on penalty of forfeiting double the value to the crown as to the neglect of reparations of the church churchyard and the like the spiritual court has undoubted cognizance thereof and a suit may be brought therein for non-payment of a rate made by the church wardens for that purpose and these are the principal pecuniary injuries which are cognizable or for which suits may be instituted in the ecclesiastical courts two matrimonial causes or injuries respecting the rights of marriage are another and much more undisturbed branch of the ecclesiastical jurisdiction though if we consider marriages in the light of mere civil contracts they do not seem to be properly of spiritual cognizance but the romanists having very early converted this contract into a holy sacramental ordinance the church of course took it under her protection upon the division of the two jurisdictions and in the hands of such able politicians it soon became an engine of great importance to the papal scheme of an universal monarchy over christendom the numberless canonical impediments that were invented and occasionally dispensed with by the holy see not only enriched the coffers of the church but gave it a vast ascendant over princes of all denominations whose marriages were sanctified or reprobated their issue legitimized or bastardized and the succession to their thrones established or rendered precarious according to the humor or interest of the reigning pontiff besides a thousand nice and difficult scruples with which the clergy of those ages puzzled the underlings and loaded the consciences of the inferior orders of the laity and which could only be unraveled by these spiritual guides yet abstracted from this universal influence which affords so good a reason for their conduct one might otherwise be led to wonder that the same authority which enjoined the strictest celibacy to the priesthood should think them proper judges in causes between man and wife these causes indeed partly from the nature of the injuries complained of and partly from the clerical method of treating them soon became too gross for the modesty of the lay tribunal and causes matrimonial are now so peculiarly ecclesiastical that the temporal courts will never interfere in controversies of this kind unless in some particular cases as if the spiritual court do proceed to call a marriage in question after the death of either of the parties this the courts of common law will prohibit because it tends to bastardize and disinherit the issue who cannot so well defend the marriage as the parties themselves when both of them were living might have done of matrimonial causes one of the first and principal is one causa jactitationis matrimoni when one of the parties boasts or gives out that he or she is married to the other whereby a common reputation of their matrimony may ensue on this ground the party injured may libel the other in the spiritual court and unless the defendant undertakes and makes out a proof of their actual marriage he or she is enjoined perpetual silence upon that head which is the only remedy the ecclesiastical courts can give for this injury two another species of matrimonial causes was when a party contracted to another brought a suit in the ecclesiastical court to compel a celebration of the marriage in pursuance of such contract but this branch of causes is now cut off entirely by the act for preventing clandestine marriages twenty six george the second c thirty three which enacts that for the future no suit shall be had in any ecclesiastical court to compel a celebration of marriage in facie ecclesiae for or because of any contract of matrimony whatsoever three 
The suit for restitution of conjugal rights is also another species of matrimonial causes which is brought whenever either the husband or wife is guilty of the injury of subtraction or lives separate from the other without any sufficient reason, in which case the ecclesiastical jurisdiction will compel them to come together again if either party be weak enough to desire it, contrary to the inclination of the other. 4. Divorces also, of which and their several distinctions we treated at large in a former volume, are causes thoroughly matrimonial and cognizable by the ecclesiastical judge. If it becomes improper, through some supervenient cause arising ex post facto, that the parties should live together any longer, as through intolerable cruelty, adultery, a perpetual disease, and the like, this unfitness or inability for the marriage state may be looked upon as an injury to the suffering party, and for this, the ecclesiastical law administers the remedy of separation or divorce, amensa et toro. But if the cause existed previous to the marriage, and was such a one as rendered the marriage unlawful ab initio, as consanguinity, corporal imbecility, or the like, in this case, the law looks upon the marriage to have been always null and void, being contracted in fraudum legis, and decrees not only a separation from bed and board, but a vinculo matrimoni itself. 5. The last species of matrimonial causes is a consequence drawn from one of the species of divorce, that a mensa et toro, which is a suit for alimony, a term which signifies maintenance, which suit the wife, in case of separation, may have against her husband if he neglects or refuses to make her an allowance suitable to their station in life. This is an injury to the wife, and the court Christian will redress it by assigning her a competent maintenance and compelling the husband by ecclesiastical censures to pay it. But no alimony will be assigned in case of a divorce for adultery on her part, for as that amounts to a forfeiture of her dower after his death, it is also a sufficient reason why she should not be a partaker of his estate when living. End of chapter 7, part 1Chapter 7, Part 2 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of the Cognizance of Private Wrongs, Part 2. 3. Testamentary causes are the only remaining species belonging to the ecclesiastical jurisdiction, which, as they are certainly of a mere temporal nature, may seem at first view a little oddly ranked among matters of a spiritual cognizance, and indeed, as was in some degree observed in a former volume, they were originally cognizable in the king's courts of common law, viz. the county courts and afterwards transferred to the jurisdiction of the church by the favor of the crown as a natural consequence of granting to the bishops the administration of intestate's effects this spiritual jurisdiction of testamentary causes is a peculiar constitution of this island for in almost all other even in popish countries all matters testamentary are of the jurisdiction of the civil magistrate, and that this privilege is enjoyed by the clergy in England, not as a matter of ecclesiastical right, but by the special favor and indulgence of the municipal law, and as it should seem by some public act of the great council, is freely acknowledged by Linwood, the ablest canonist of the 15th century. Testamentary causes, he observes, belong to the ecclesiastical courts de consuetudine angliae et super concesso regio et suarum procerum in talibus ab antiquo concesso 
The same was, about a century before, very openly professed in the canon of Archbishop Stratford, viz., that administration of intestate's goods was ab olim, granted to the ordinary, concessu regio et magnatum regni Angliae. The constitutions of Cardinal Arthabon also testify that this provision, olam a praelatis cum approbatione regis et baronum dicitor enemase, and Archbishop Parker in Queen Elizabeth's time affirms in express words that originally, in matters testamentary, non ulum abebant episcape autoritatem, priter eam quam a rege acceptem referebant, ius testamenta probandi non abebant, administrationes potestatem quique delegare non poterant. At what period of time the ecclesiastical jurisdiction of testaments and intestacies began in England is not ascertained by any ancient writer, and Linwood very fairly confesses, cujus regis temporibus ac ordinatum sit non reperio. We find it is indeed frequently asserted in our common law books that it is but of late years that the church hath had the probate of wills. But this must only be understood to mean that it had not always had this prerogative, for certainly it is of very high antiquity. Linwood, we have seen, declares that it was ab antiquo. Stratford, in the reign of King Edward III, mentions it as aboleum ordinatum, and Cardinal Arthabon, in the 52 Henry III, speaks of it as an ancient tradition. Bracton holds it for clear law in the same reign of Henry III that matters testamentary belong to the spiritual court, and yet earlier the disposition of intestate's goods per visium ecclesiae was one of the articles confirmed to the prelates by King John's Magna Carta. Matthew Paris also informs us that King Richard I ordained in Normandy quod distributio rerum quae in testamento relincuntur a taratate ecclesiae fiat. And even this ordinance of King Richard was only an introduction of the same law into his ducal dominions which before prevailed in this kingdom. For in the reign of his father Henry II, Glanville is expressed that sequisa liquid dixerit contra testamentum, placitum irid in curia Christianatatis adiri debet terminari. And the Scots book, called Regia Magistatum, agrees verbatim with Glanville in this point. It appears that the foreign clergy were pretty early ambitious of this branch of power, but their attempts to assume it on the continent were effectually curbed by the edict of the Emperor Justin, which restrained the insinuation or probate of testaments as formally to the office of the Magistor Census, for which the Emperor subjoins this reason. Absurdum etinem clericis est, imo etium opprobriusum, si parito se velent ostendere de sceptationum esse forensium. But afterwards, by the canon law, it was allowed that the bishop might compel by ecclesiastical censures the performance of a bequest to pious uses, and therefore, that being considered as a cause quae secundum canones et episcopales legis ad regim animarum pertinuit, it fell within the jurisdiction of the spiritual courts by the express words of the charter of King William I, which separated those courts from the temporal. And afterwards, when King Henry I, by his coronation charter, directed that the goods of an intestate should be divided for the good of his soul, this made all intestacies immediately spiritual causes as much as a legacy to pious uses had been before. This, therefore, we may probably conjecture, was the era referred to by Stratford and Arthabon, when the king, by the advice of the prelates, and with the consent of his barons, invested the church with this privilege. And accordingly, in King Stephen's charter it is provided, 
that the goods of an intestate ecclesiastic shall be distributed pro salute anima ejus ecclesiae concilio, which latter words are equivalent to per visum ecclesiae in the great charter of King John before mentioned, and the Danes and the Swedes, who received the rudiments of Christianity and ecclesiastical discipline from England about the beginning of the twelfth century, have thence also adopted the spiritual cognizance of intestacies, testaments, and legacies. This jurisdiction, we have seen, is principally exercised with us in the consistory courts of every diocese and bishop, and in the prerogative court of the Metropolitan originally, and in the Arches Court and Court of Delegates by way of appeal. It is divisible into three branches, the probate of wills, the granting of administrations, and the suing for legacies, the two former of which, when no opposition is made, are granted merely ex officio et debito justiciae, and are then the object of what is called the voluntary and not the contentious jurisdiction. But when a caveat is entered against proving the will or granting administration, a suit thereupon follows to determine either the validity of the testament or who hath a right to the administration. This claim and obstruction by the averse party are an injury to the party entitled, and as such are remedied by the sentence of the spiritual court, either by establishing the will or granting the administration. Subtraction, the withholding or detaining of legacies, is also still more apparently injurious by depriving the legatees of that right with which the laws of the land and the will of the deceased have invested them, and therefore, as a consequential part of testamentary jurisdiction, the spiritual court administers redress herein by compelling the executor to pay them. But in this last case, the courts of equity exercise a concurrent jurisdiction with the ecclesiastical courts, as incident to some other species of relief prayed by the complainant, as to compel the executor to account for the testator's effects or assent to the legacy or the like. For, as it is beneath the dignity of the king's courts to be merely ancillary to other inferior jurisdictions, the cause, when once brought there, receives there also its full determination. These are the principal injuries for which the party grieved must or may seek his remedy in the spiritual courts. But before I entirely dismiss this head, it may not be improper to add a short word concerning the method of proceeding in these tribunals with regard to the redress of injuries. It must, in the first place, be acknowledged to the honor of the spiritual courts that though they continue to this day to decide many questions which are properly of temporal cognizance, yet justice is in general so ably and impartially administered in those tribunals, especially of the superior kind, and the boundaries of their power are now so well known and established that no material inconvenience at present arises from this jurisdiction still continuing in the ancient channel. And should an alteration be attempted, great confusion would probably arise in overturning long-established forms and new modeling a course of proceedings that has now prevailed for seven centuries. The establishment of the civil law process in all the ecclesiastical courts was indeed a masterpiece of papal discernment as it made a coalition impracticable between them and the national tribunals without manifest inconvenience and hazard. And this consideration had undoubtedly its weight in causing this measure to be adopted, though many other causes concurred. The time when the Pandex of Justinian were discovered afresh and rescued from the dust of antiquity, the eagerness with which they were studied by the popish ecclesiastics, and the consequent dissensions between the clergy and the laity of England, have formerly been spoken to at large. I shall only now remark upon those collections that their being written in the Latin tongue 
and referring so much to the will of the prince and his delegated officers of justice, sufficiently recommend them to the court of Rome, exclusive of their intrinsic merit. To keep the laity in the darkest ignorance, and to monopolize the little science which then existed entirely among the monkish clergy, were deep-rooted principles of papal policy. And as the bishops of Rome affected in all points to mimic the imperial grandeur, as the spiritual prerogatives were molded on the pattern of the temporal, so the canon law process was formed on the model of the civil law. The prelates, embracing with the utmost ardor a method of judicial proceedings, which was carried on in a language unknown to the bulk of the people, which banished the intervention of a jury, that bulwark of Gothic liberty, and which placed an arbitrary power of decision in the breast of a single man. The proceedings in the ecclesiastical courts are therefore regulated according to the practice of the civil and canon laws, or rather, according to a mixture of both, corrected and new modeled by their own particular usages and for the interposition of the courts of common law. For if the proceedings in the spiritual court be never so regularly consonant to the rules of the Roman law, yet if they be manifestly repugnant to the fundamental maxims of the municipal laws to which, upon principles of sound policy, the ecclesiastical process ought in every state to conform, as if they require two witnesses to prove a fact where one will suffice at common law, in such cases, a prohibition will be awarded against them. But under these restrictions, their ordinary course of proceeding is, first, by citation, to call the party injuring before them, then, by libel, libellus, a little book, or by articles drawn out in a formal allegation, to set forth the complainant's ground of complaint. To this succeeds the defendant's answer upon oath when, if he denies or extenuates the charge, they proceed to proofs by witnesses examined and their depositions taken down in writing by an officer of the court. If the defendant has any circumstances to offer in his defense, he must also propound them in what is called his defensive allegation, to which he is entitled, in his turn, to the plaintiff's answer upon oath and may from thence proceed to proofs as well as his antagonist. The canonical doctrine of purgation, whereby the parties were obliged to answer upon oath to any matter, however criminal, that might be objected against them, though long ago overruled in the court of chancery, the genius of the English law having broken through the bondage imposed on it by its clerical chancellors, and asserted the doctrines of judicial as well as civil liberty, continued to the middle of the last century to be upheld by the spiritual courts, when the legislature was obliged to interpose to teach them a lesson of similar moderation. By the statute 13 Charles II C. 12, it is enacted that it shall not be lawful for any bishop or ecclesiastical judge to tender or administer to any person whatsoever the oath usually called the oath ex officio, or any other oath whereby he may be compelled to confess, accuse, or purge himself of any criminal matter or thing, whereby he may be liable to censure and punishment. When all the pleadings and proofs are concluded, they are referred to the consideration not of a jury, but of a single judge who takes information by hearing advocates on both sides and thereupon forms his interlocutory decree or definitive sentence at his own discretion, from which there generally lies an appeal in the several stages mentioned in the former chapter, though if the same be not appealed from in fifteen days, it is final by the statute 25 Henry VIII C. 19. But the point in which these jurisdictions are the most effective is that of enforcing their sentences when pronounced, for which they have no other process but that of excommunication, which is described to be twofold, the less and the greater excommunication. The less 
is an ecclesiastical censure excluding the party from the participation of the sacraments. The greater proceeds farther and excludes him not only from these, but also from the company of all Christians. But if the judge of any spiritual court excommunicates a man for a cause of which he hath not the legal cognizance, the party may have an action against him at common law, and he is also liable to be indicted at the suit of the king. Heavy as the penalty of excommunication is, considered in a serious light, there are notwithstanding many obstinate or profligate men who would despise the brutum fulmen of mere ecclesiastical censures, especially when pronounced by a petty surrogate in the country for railing or contumuous words, for non-payment of fees or costs, or for other trivial cause. The common law, therefore, compassionately steps in to their aid and kindly lends a supporting hand to an otherwise tottering authority. Imitating herein the policy of our British ancestors, among whom, according to Caesar, whoever were interdicted by the Druids from their sacrifices, in numero impiorum aci scelatorum abentor, abiis omnis decedunt, aditum eorum sermonemque defugiant, nequid ex contagion in commode accipiant, neque eis pententibus jus reditur, neque onos ulos communicator. And so with us, by the common law, an excommunicated person is disabled to do any act that is required to be done by one that is probus et legalis homo. He cannot serve upon juries, cannot be a witness in any court, and, which is the worst of all, cannot bring in action, either real or personal, to recover lands or money due to him. Nor is this the whole. For if, within forty days after the sentence has been published in the church, the offender does not submit and abide by the sentence of the spiritual court, the bishop may certify such contempt to the king in chancery, upon which there issues out a writ to the sheriff of the county, called from the bishop's certificate, significavit, or, from its effect, a writ de excommunicato capiendo, and the sheriff shall thereupon take the offender and imprison him in the county jail till he is reconciled to the church and such reconciliation certified by the bishop upon which another writ de excommunicato deliberando issues out of chancery to deliver and release him this process seems founded on the charter of separation so often referred to of william the conqueror Si aliquis per supabium elatus ad justitatium episcopalum venere nulluerit. Vocetur semel, secundo, et tertio, quod de sine sic ad demendationem venerit, excommunicetur, et si opus fuerit, ed hac vindicandum fortudo et de justitia regis, sive vici comites adibiator. And in case of subtraction of tithes, a more summary and expeditious assistance is given by the statutes 27 Henry VIII C20 and 32 Henry VIII C7, which enact that upon complaint of any contempt or misbehavior to the ecclesiastical judge by the defendant in any suit for tithes, any privy counselor, or any two justices of the peace, or in case of disobedience to a definitive sentence, any two justices of the peace may commit the party to prison without bail or main prize till he enters into a recognizance with sufficient sureties to give due obedience to the process and sentence of the court. These timely aids which the common and statute law have lent to the ecclesiastical jurisdiction may serve to refute that groundless notion which some are too apt to entertain, that the courts of Westminster Hall are at open variance with those at Doctors' Commons. It is true that they are sometimes obliged to use a parental authority in correcting the excesses of these inferior courts and keeping them within their legal bounds, but, on the other hand, 
They afford them a parental assistance in repressing the intolerance of the contemptuous delinquents and rescuing their jurisdiction from that contempt, which for want of sufficient compulsive powers would otherwise be sure to attend it. 2. I am next to consider the injuries cognizable in the court military or court of chivalry, the jurisdiction of which is declared by statute 13 Richard II C2 to be this, that it hath cognizance of contracts touching deeds of arms and of war out of the realm and also of things which touch war within the realm, which cannot be determined or discussed by the common law together with other usages and customs to the same matters appertaining. So that wherever the common law can give redress, this court hath no jurisdiction, which has thrown it entirely out of use as to the matter of contracts, all such being usually cognizable in the courts of Westminster Hall, if not directly, at least by fiction of law, as if a contract be made at Gibraltar, the plaintiff may suppose it made at Northampton, for the locality, or place of making it, is of no consequence with regard to the validity of the contract. The words, other usages and customs, support the claim of this court, one, to give relief to such of the nobility and gentry as think themselves aggrieved in matters of honor, and two, to keep up the distinction of degrees and quality. Whence it follows that the civil jurisdiction of this court of chivalry is principally in two points, the redressing injuries of honor and correcting encroachments in manners of coat armor, precedency, and other distinctions of families. As a court of honor, it is to give satisfaction to all such as are aggrieved in that point, a point of nature so nice and delicate that its wrongs and injuries escape the notice of common law, and yet are fit to be redressed somewhere, such, for instance, as calling a man a coward, or giving him the lie, for which, as they are productive of no immediate damage to his person or property, no action will lie in the courts at Westminster, and yet they are such injuries as will prompt every man of spirit to demand some honorable amends, which by the ancient law of the land was appointed to be given in the court of chivalry. But modern resolutions have determined that how much soever such a jurisdiction may be expedient, yet no action for words will at present lie therein. And it hath always been most clearly holden that as this court cannot meddle with anything determinable by the common law, it therefore can give no pecuniary satisfaction or damages, insomuch as the quantity and determination thereof is ever of common law cognizance. And therefore, this court of chivalry can at most order reparation in point of honor, as to compel the defendant mendacem sibi ipsum imponere, or to take the lie that he has given upon himself or to make such other submission as the laws of honor may require. Neither can this court, as to the point of reparation in honor, hold plea of any such word or thing wherein the party is relievable by the courts of the common law, as if a man gives another a blow, or calls him a thief or a murderer, for in both these cases the common law has pointed out his proper remedy by action. As to the other point of its civil jurisdiction, the redressing of encroachments and usurpations in matters of heraldry and coat armor, it is the business of this court, according to Sir Matthew Hale, to adjust the right of armorial ensigns, bearings, crests, supporters, pennons, etc., and also rights of place or precedence, where the King's Patent or Act of Parliament, which cannot be overruled by this court, have not already determined it. The proceedings in this court are by petition, in a summary way, and the trial not by a jury of twelve men, but by witnesses or combat. But as it cannot imprison, not being a court of record, and as by resolution of the superior courts it is now confined to so narrow and restrained a jurisdiction, it has fallen into contempt and disuse. The marshalling of coat armor which was formerly the pride and study of all the best families in the kingdom, 
is now greatly disregarded and has fallen into the hands of certain officers and attendants upon this court called heralds who consider it only as a matter of lucre and not of justice whereby such falsity and confusion have crept into their records which ought to be the standing evidence of families descents and coat armor that though formerly some credit has been paid to their testimony now even their common seal will not be received as evidence in any court of justice in the kingdom but their original visitation books compiled when progresses were solemnly and regularly made into every part of the kingdom to inquire into the state of families and to register such marriages and descents as were verified to them upon oath are allowed to be good evidence of pedigree and it is much to be wished that this practice of visitations at certain periods were revived for the failure of inquisitions post-mortem by the abolition of military tenures combined with the negligence of the heralds in omitting their usual progresses has rendered the proof of a modern descent for the recovery of an estate or succession to a title of honor more difficult than that of an ancient this will be indeed remedied for the future with respect to claims of peerage by a late standing order of the house of lords directing the heralds to take exact accounts and preserve regular entries of all peers and peeresses of england and their respective descendants and that an exact pedigree of each peer and his family shall on the day of his first admission be delivered to the house by garter the principal king at arms but the general inconvenience affecting more private successions still continues without a remedy End of chapter seven part two chapter seven part three of the commentaries on the laws of england book three by william blackstone this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by roy haynes of the cognizance of private wrongs part three three injuries cognizable by the courts maritime or admiralty courts are the next object of our inquiries these courts have jurisdiction and power to try and determine all maritime causes or such injuries which though they are in their nature of common law cognizance yet being committed on the high seas out of the reach of our ordinary courts of justice are therefore to be remedied in a peculiar court of their own all admiralty causes must be therefore causes arising wholly upon the sea and not within the precincts of any county for the statute thirteen richard the second c five directs that the admiral and his deputy shall not meddle with any thing but only things done upon the sea and the statute fifteen richard the second c three declares that the court of the admiral hath no manner of cognizance of any contract or of any other thing done within the body of any county either by land or by water nor of any wreck of the sea for that must be cast on land before it becomes a wreck but it is otherwise of things flotsam jetsam and ligand for over them the admiral hath jurisdiction as they are in and upon the sea if part of any contract or other cause of action doth arise upon the sea and part upon land the common law excludes the admiralty court from its jurisdiction for part belonging properly to one cognizance and part to another the common or general law takes place of the particular therefore though pure maritime acquisitions which are earned and become due on the high seas as seamen's wages are one proper object of the admiralty jurisdiction even though the contract for them be made upon land yet in general if there be a contract made in england and to be executed upon the seas as a charter party or covenant that a ship shall sail to jamaica or shall be in such a latitude by such a day 
or a contract made upon the sea to be performed in England as a bond made on shipboard to pay money in London or the like, these kind of mixed contracts belong not to the admiralty jurisdiction, but to the courts of common law. And indeed, it hath been farther holden that the admiralty court cannot hold plea of any contract under seal. And also, as the courts of common law have obtained concurrent jurisdiction with the court of chivalry with regard to foreign contracts by supposing them made in England, so it is no uncommon thing for a plaintiff to feign that a contract really made at sea was made at the Royal Exchange or other inland place in order to draw the cognizance of the suit from the courts of admiralty to those of Westminster Hall. This the civilians exclaim against loudly as inequitable and absurd, and Sir Thomas Ridley hath very gravely proved it to be impossible for the ship in which such cause of action arises to be really at the Royal Exchange in Cornhill. But our lawyers justify this fiction by alleging as before that the locality of such contracts is not at all essential to the merits of them, and that learned civilian himself seems to have forgotten how much such fictions are adopted and encouraged in the Roman law, that a son killed in battle is supposed to live forever for the benefit of his parents, and that, by the fiction of post liminium and the Lex Cornelia, captives, when freed from bondage, were held to have never been prisoners, and such as died in captivity were supposed to have died in their own country. Where the admiral's court hath not original jurisdiction of the cause, though there should arise in it a question that is proper for the cognizance of that court, yet that doth not alter nor take away the exclusive jurisdiction of the common law. And so, vice versa, if it hath jurisdiction of the original, it hath also jurisdiction of all consequential questions, though properly determinable at common law. Wherefore, among other reasons, a suit for beaconage of a beacon standing on a rock in the sea may be brought in the court of admiralty, the admiral having an original jurisdiction over beacons. In case of prizes also in time of war, between our own nation and another, or between two other nations which are taken at sea and brought into our ports, the court of admiralty have an undisturbed and exclusive jurisdiction to determine the same according to the law of nations. The proceedings of the courts of admiralty bear much resemblance to those of the civil law, but are not entirely founded thereon, and they likewise adopt and make use of other laws as occasion requires, such as the Rhodian law and the laws of Oleron. For the law of England, as has been frequently observed, doth not acknowledge or pay any deference to the civil law considered as such, but merely permits its use in such cases where it judged its determinations equitable, and therefore blends it, in the present instance, with other marine laws. The whole, being corrected, altered, and amended by Acts of Parliament and common usage, so that out of this composition a body of jurisprudence is extracted, which owes its authority only to its reception here by consent of the crown and people. The first process in these courts is frequently by arrest of the defendant's person, and they also take recognizances or stipulation of certain fide usur in the nature of bail, and in case of default, may imprison both them and their principal. They may also fine and imprison for a contempt in the face of the court, and all this is supported by immemorial usage grounded on the necessity of supporting a jurisdiction so extensive, though, opposite to the usual doctrines of the common law, these being no courts of record, because in general their process is much conformed to that of the civil law. 4. I am next to consider such injuries as are cognizable by the courts of the common law, and herein I shall for the present only remark that all possible injuries whatsoever, 
that did not fall within the cognizance of either the ecclesiastical, military, or maritime tribunals are for that very reason within the cognizance of the common law courts of justice. For it is a settled and invariable principle in the laws of England that every right, when withheld, must have a remedy, and every injury its proper redress. The definition and explication of these numerous injuries and their respective legal remedies will employ our attention for many subsequent chapters. But before we conclude the present, I shall just mention two species of injuries which will properly fall now within our immediate consideration, and which are, either when justice is delayed by an inferior court that has proper cognizance of the cause, or when such inferior court takes upon itself to examine a cause and decide the merits without any legal authority. The first of these injuries, refusal or neglect of justice, is remedied either by writ of procedendo or of mandamus. A writ of procedendo ad judicium issues out of the court of chancery, where judges of any court do delay the parties, for that they will not give judgment either on the one side or the other when they ought so to do. In this case, a writ of procedendo shall be awarded, commanding them in the king's name to proceed to judgment, but without specifying any particular judgment, for that, if erroneous, may be set aside in the course of appeal, or by writ of error or false judgment, and upon farther neglect or refusal, the judges of the inferior court may be punished for their contempt by writ of attachment returnable in the king's bench or common pleas. A writ of mandamus is, in general, a command issuing in the king's name from the court of king's bench and directed to any person, corporation, or inferior court of judicature within the king's dominions, requiring them to do some particular thing therein specified, which appertains to their office and duty, and which the court of king's bench has previously determined, or at least supposes, to be consonant to right and justice. It is a high prerogative writ of a most extensively remedial nature, and may be issued in some cases where the injured party has also another, more tedious method of redress, as in the case of admission or restitution to an office. But it issues in all cases where the party hath a right to have anything done, and hath no other specific means of compelling its performance. A mandamus, therefore, lies to compel the admission or restoration of the party applying to any office or franchise of a public nature, whether spiritual or temporal, to academical degrees, to the use of a meeting house, etc. It lies for the production, inspection, or delivery of public books and papers, for the surrender of the regalia of the corporation, to oblige bodies corporate to affix their common seal, to compel the holding of a court, and for an infinite number of other purposes which it is impossible to recite minutely. But at present we are more particularly to remark that it issues to the judges of any inferior court, commanding them to do justice according to the powers of their office whenever the same is delayed. For it is the peculiar business of the court of King's Bench to superintend all other inferior tribunals and therein to enforce the due exercise of those judicial or ministerial powers with which the crown or legislature have invested them, and this not only by restraining their excesses, but also by quickening their negligence and obviating their denial of justice. A mandamus may therefore be had to the courts of the City of London to enter up judgment, to the spiritual courts to grant an administration, to swear a church warden, and the like. The writ is grounded on a suggestion by the oath of the party injured, of his own right, and the denial of justice below. Whereupon, in order more fully to satisfy the court that there is a probable ground for such interposition, a rule is made, 
except in some general cases where the probable ground is manifest, directing the party complained of to show cause why a writ of mandamus should not issue. And if he shows no sufficient cause, the writ itself is issued, at first in the alternative, either to do thus or signify some reason to the contrary, to which return or answer must be made at a certain day. And if the inferior judge or other person to whom the writ is directed returns or signifies an insufficient reason, then there issues in the second place a peremptory mandamus to do the thing absolutely, to which no other return will be admitted but a certificate of perfect obedience and due execution of the writ. If the inferior judge or other person makes no return or fails in his respect and obedience, he is punishable for his contempt by attachment. But if he, at the first, returns a sufficient cause, although it should be false in fact, the Court of King's Bench will not try the truth of the fact upon affidavits, but will for the present believe him and proceed no farther on the mandamus. But then the party injured may have an action against him for his false return, and, if found to be false by the jury, shall recover damages equivalent to the injury sustained, together with a peremptory mandamus to the defendant to do his duty, thus much for the injury of neglect or refusal of justice. 2. The other injury, which is that of encroachment of jurisdiction, or calling one quorum non judice, to answer in a court that has no legal cognizance of the cause, is also a grievance for which the common law has provided a remedy by the writ of prohibition. A prohibition is a writ issuing properly only out of the court of king's bench, being the king's prerogative writ. But for the furtherance of justice, it may now also be had in some cases out of the court of chancery, common pleas, or exchequer directed to the judge and parties of a suit in any inferior court, commanding them to cease from the prosecution thereof, upon a suggestion that either the cause originally, or some collateral matter arising therein, does not belong to that jurisdiction, but to the cognizance of some other court. This writ may issue, either to inferior courts of common law, as to the courts of counties palatine or principality of wales if they hold a plea of land or other matters not lying within their respective franchises to the county courts or courts baron where they attempt to hold plea of any matter of the value of forty shillings or it may be directed to the courts christian the university courts the courts of chivalry or the court of admiralty where they concern themselves with any matter not within their jurisdiction, as if the first should attempt to try the validity of a custom pleaded, or the latter a contract made or to be executed within this kingdom. Or if, in handling of matters clearly within their cognizance, they transgress the bounds prescribed to them by the laws of England, as where they require two witnesses to prove the payment of a legacy, a release of tithes or the like. In such cases also, a prohibition will be awarded. For, as the fact of signing a release or of actual payment is not properly a spiritual question, but only allowed to be decided in those courts, because incident and accessory to some original question clearly within their jurisdiction, it ought, therefore, where the two laws differ, to be decided not according to the spiritual, but the temporal law, else the same question might be determined different ways according to the court in which the suit is depending, an impropriety which no wise government can or ought to endure, and which is, therefore, a ground of prohibition. And if either the judge or the party shall proceed after such prohibition, an attachment may be had against them to punish them for the contempt at the direction of the court that awarded it, and an action will lie against them to repair the party injured in damages. So long as the idea continued among the clergy that the ecclesiastical state was wholly independent of the civil, 
great struggles were constantly maintained between the temporal courts and the spiritual concerning the writ of prohibition and the proper objects of it. Even from the time of the Constitutions of Clarendon, made in opposition to the claims of Archbishop Becket in 10 Henry II to the exhibition of certain articles of complaint to the king by Archbishop Bancroft in 3 James I on behalf of the ecclesiastical courts, from which, and from the answers to them signed by all the judges of Westminster Hall, much may be collected concerning the reasons of granting and methods of proceeding upon prohibitions. A short summary of the latter is as follows. The party aggrieved in the court below applies to the superior court, setting forth in a suggestion upon record the nature and cause of his complaint in being drawn ad aliud examen by a jurisdiction or manner of process disallowed by the laws of the kingdom, upon which, if the matter alleged appears to the court to be sufficient, the writ of prohibition immediately issues, commanding the judge not to hold and the party not to prosecute the plea. But sometimes the point may be too nice and doubtful to be decided merely upon a motion, and then, for the more solemn determination of the question, the party applying for the prohibition is directed by the court to declare in prohibition, that is, to prosecute an action by filing a declaration against the other upon a supposition or fiction that he has proceeded in the suit below, notwithstanding the writ of prohibition. And if, upon demurrer and argument, the court shall finally be of opinion that the matter suggested is a good and sufficient ground of prohibition in point of law, then judgment with nominal damages shall be given for the party complaining, and the defendant, and also the inferior court, shall be prohibited from proceeding any farther. On the other hand, if the superior court shall think it no competent ground for restraining the inferior jurisdiction, then judgment shall be given against him who applied for the prohibition in the court above, and a writ of consultation shall be awarded, so called because, upon deliberation and consultation had, the judges find the prohibition to be ill-founded, and therefore, by this writ, they return the cause to its original jurisdiction to be there determined in the inferior court. And even in ordinary cases, the writ of prohibition is not absolutely final and conclusive. For though the ground be a proper one in point of law, for granting the prohibition, yet if the fact that gave rise to it be afterwards falsified, the cause shall be remanded to the prior jurisdiction. If, for instance, a custom be pleaded in the spiritual court, a prohibition ought to go because that court has no authority to try it. But if the fact of such a custom be brought to a competent trial and be there found false, a writ of consultation will be granted. For this purpose, the party prohibited may appear to the prohibition and take a declaration, which must always pursue the suggestion, and so plead to issue upon it denying the contempt and traversing the custom upon which the prohibition was grounded. And, if that issue be found for the defendant, he shall then have a writ of consultation. The writ of consultation may also be, and is frequently, granted by the court without any action brought, when, after a prohibition issued, upon more mature consideration, the court are of opinion that the matter suggested is not a good and sufficient ground to stop the proceedings below. Thus careful has the law been in compelling the inferior courts to do ample and speedy justice, in preventing them from transgressing their due bounds, and in allowing them the undisturbed cognizance of such causes as by right, founded on the usage of the kingdom or act of parliament, do properly belong to their jurisdiction. End of chapter 7, part 3. Chapter 8, 
Part 1 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Wrongs and Their Remedies Respecting the Rights of Persons. Part 1. The former chapters of this part of our commentaries have been employed in describing the several methods of redressing private wrongs either by the mere act of the parties or the mere operation of law, and in treating of the nature and several species of courts, together with the cognizance of wrongs or injuries by private or special tribunals and the public ecclesiastical, military, and maritime jurisdictions of this kingdom. I come now to consider at large, and in a more particular manner, the respective remedies in the public and general courts of common law for injuries or private wrongs of any denomination whatsoever not exclusively appropriated to any of the former tribunals. And herein I shall first define the several injuries cognizable by the courts of common law with the respective remedies applicable to each particular injury, and shall, secondly, describe the method of pursuing and obtaining these remedies in the several courts. First, then, as to the several injuries cognizable by the courts of common law, with the respective remedies applicable to each particular injury, and in treating of these, I shall at present confine myself to such wrongs as may be committed in the mutual intercourse between subject and subject, which the king, as the fountain of justice, is officially bound to redress in the ordinary forms of law, reserving such injuries or encroachments as may occur between the crown and the subject to be distinctly considered hereafter, as the remedy in such cases is generally of a peculiar and eccentrical nature. Now, as all wrong may be considered merely as a privation of right, the one natural remedy for every species of wrong is being put in possession of that right whereof the party injured is deprived. This may either be effected by a specific delivery or restoration of the subject matter in dispute to the legal owner as when lands or personal chattels are unjustly withheld or invaded, or, when that is not possible, or at least not an adequate remedy, by making the sufferer a pecuniary satisfaction in damages, as in the case of assault, breach of contract, etc., to which damages the party injured has acquired an incomplete or incohate right the instant he receives the injury. Though such right, be not fully ascertained till they are assessed by the intervention of the law. The instruments whereby this remedy is obtained, which are sometimes considered in the light of the remedy itself, are a diversity of suits and actions, which are defined by the mirror to be the lawful demand of one's right, or, as Bracton and Fleta express it in the words of Justinian, Jus prosequende in judicio coda liqui debitor. The Romans introduced pretty early set forms for actions and suits in their law after the example of the Greeks, and made it a rule that each injury should be redressed by its proper remedy only. Actiones, say the Pandex, compositae sunt, quibos inter se hominos deceparant. Quas actions ne populus prout velet instituerit, certa solemnesque esse volerunt. The forms of these actions were originally preserved in the books of the Pontifical College as choice and inestimable secrets, till one Nius Flavius, the secretary of Appius Claudius, stole a copy and published them to the people. The concealment was ridiculous but the establishment of some standard was undoubtedly necessary to fix the true state of a question of right, lest, in a long and arbitrary process, 
it might be shifted continually and be at length no longer discernible, or, as Cicero expresses it, sunt de iura, sunt formulae, de omnibus rebus constitutae, ne quis aut in genere injuriae, aut in rationi actiones, errari posit. Expressae enim sunt unius cosusque damno, dolore, incomodo, calamitate, injuria, publicae a praetor formulae, ad quas pravita lis accommodator. And in the same manner are Bracton, speaking of the original writs upon which all our actions are founded, declares them to be fixed and immutable unless by authority of Parliament. And all the modern legislators of Europe have found it expedient from the same reasons to fall into the same or a similar method. With us in England, the several suits or remedial instruments of justice are from the subject of them distinguished into three kinds, actions personal, real, and mixed. Personal actions are such whereby a man claims a debt or personal duty or damages in lieu thereof, and likewise whereby a man claims a satisfaction in damages for some injury done to his person or property. The former are said to be founded on contracts, the latter upon torts or wrongs, and they are the same which the civil law calls actions in personam quae adversus eum intendantur, qui ex contractud vel delicto obligatus est a liquid dare vel concedere. Of the former nature are all actions upon debt or promises. Of the latter, all actions for trespasses, nuisances, assaults, defamatory words, and the like. Real actions, or, as they are called in the mirror, feudal actions, which concern real property only, are such whereby the plaintiff, here called the demandant, claims title to have any lands or tenements, rents, commons, or other hereditaments in fee simple, fee tail, or for term of life. By these actions formerly, all disputes concerning real estates were decided, but they are now pretty generally laid aside in practice upon account of the great nicety required in their management and the inconvenient length of their process, a much more expeditious method of trying titles being since introduced by other actions personal and mixed. Mixed actions are suits partaking of the nature of the other two, wherein some real property is demanded and also personal damages for a wrong sustained as, for instance, an action of waste, which is brought by him who hath the inheritance, in remainder or reversion, against the tenant for life, who hath committed waste therein, to recover not only the land wasted, which would make it merely a real action, but also treble damages in pursuance of the statute of Gloucester, which is a personal recompense, and so both being joined together, denominate it a mixed action. Under these three heads may every species of remedy by suit or action in the courts of common law be comprised. But in order to effectually apply the remedy, it is first necessary to ascertain the complaint. I proceed therefore now to enumerate the several kinds and to inquire into the respective natures of all private wrongs or civil injuries which may be offered to the rights of either a man's person or his property, recounting at the same time the respective remedies which are furnished by the law for every infraction of right. But I must first beg leave to premise that all civil injuries are of two kinds, the one without force or violence, as slander or breach of contract, the other coupled with force and violence, as batteries or false imprisonment, which latter species favor something of the criminal kind, being always attended with some violation of the peace, for which, in strictness of law, a fine ought to be paid to the king, as well as private satisfaction to the party injured. 
and this distinction of private wrongs into injuries with and without force we shall find to run through all the variety of which we are now to treat in considering of which i shall follow the same method that was pursued with regard to the distribution of rights for as these are nothing else but an infringement or breach of those rights which we have before laid down and explained it will follow that this negative system of wrongs must correspond and tally with the former positive system of rights as therefore we divided all rights into those of persons and those of things so we must make the same general distribution of injuries to such as affect the rights of persons and such as affect the rights of property the rights of persons we may remember were distributed into absolute and relative absolute which were such as appertained and belonged to private men considered merely as individuals or single persons and relative which were incident to them as members of society and connected to each other by various ties and relations and the absolute rights of each individual were defined to be the right of personal security the right of personal liberty and the right of private property so that the wrongs or injuries affecting them must consequently be of a corresponding nature one as to injuries which affect the personal security of individuals they are either injuries against their lives their limbs their bodies their health or their reputations one with regard to the first subdivision or injuries affecting the life of a man they do not fall under our present contemplation being one of the most atrocious species of crimes the subject of the next book of our commentaries two three the next two species of injuries affecting the limbs or bodies of individuals i shall consider in one and the same view and these may be committed one by threats and menaces of bodily hurt through fear of which a man's business is interrupted a menace alone without a consequent inconvenience makes not the injury but to complete the wrong there must be both of them together the remedy for this is in pecuniary damages to be recovered by action of trespass be et omnis this being an incohate though not an absolute violence two by assault which is an attempt or offer to beat another without touching him as if one lifts up his cane or his fist in a threatening manner at another or strikes at him but misses him this is an assault insultus which finch describes to be an unlawful setting up on one's person this also is an incohate violence amounting considerably higher than bare threats and therefore no actual suffering is proved yet the party injured may have redress by action of trespass v et armis wherein he shall recover damages as a compensation for the injury three by battery which is the unlawful beating of another the least touching of another person willfully or in anger is battery for the law cannot draw the line between different degrees of violence and therefore totally prohibits the first and lowest stage of it every man's person being sacred and no other having a right to meddle with it in the lightest manner and therefore upon a similar principle the cornelian law de injurius prohibited pulsation as well as verbation distinguishing verbation which was accompanied with pain from pulsation which was attended with none but battery is in some cases justifiable or lawful as where one who hath authority a parent or master gives moderate correction to his child his scholar or his apprentice so also on the principle of self-defense for if one strikes me first or even assaults me i may strike in my own defense and if sued for it may plead son assault de mesne or that it was the plaintiff's own original assault that occasioned it so likewise in defense of my goods or possession 
If a man endeavors to deprive me of them, I may justify laying hands upon him to prevent him, and in case he persists with violence, I may proceed to beat him away. Thus, too, in the exercise of an office, as that of a church warden or beadle, a man may lay hands upon another to turn him out of the church and prevent his disturbing the congregation. And, if sued for this or the like battery, he may set forth the whole case in plead that he laid his hands upon him gently, molitur manus imposuit, for this purpose. On account of these causes of justification, battery is defined to be the unlawful beating of another, for which the remedy is, as for assault, by action of trespass vi et armis, wherein the jury will give adequate damages. Or, by mayhem or wounding, which is an injury still more atrocious and consists in violently depriving another of the use of a member proper for his defense in a fight. This is a battery attended with this aggravating circumstance, that thereby the party injured is forever disabled from making so good a defense against future external injuries as he might otherwise have done. Among these defensive members are reckoned not only arms and legs, but a finger, an eye, and a foretooth, and also some others. But the loss of one of the jaw teeth, the ear, or the nose, is no mayhem at common law, as they can be of no use in fighting. The same remedial action of trespass v et armis lies also to recover damages for this injury an injury which, when willful, no motive can justify but necessary self-preservation. If the ear be cut off, treble damages is given by statute 37 Henry VIII C6, though this is not mayhem at common law. And here I must observe that for these last three injuries, assault, battery, and mayhem, an indictment may be brought as well as an action and frequently both are accordingly prosecuted, the one at the suit of the crown for the crime against the public, the other at the suit of the party injured to make him a reparation in damages. 4. Injuries affecting a man's health are where by any unwholesome practices of another a man sustains any apparent damage in his vigor or constitution, as by selling him bad provisions or wine, by the exercise of a noisome trade which infects the air in his neighborhood, or by the neglect or unskillful management of his physician, surgeon, or apothecary. For it hath been solemnly resolved that mala praxis is a great misdemeanor and offense at common law, whether it be for curiosity and experiment or by neglect, because it breaks the trust which the party had placed in his physician and tends to the patient's destruction. Thus also, in the civil law, neglect or want of skill in physicians and surgeons. Culpae ad numerantor, veluti su medicus curationem derelequerit, male quempiem securit, auta peperamai medicamentum dederit. These are wrongs or injuries unaccompanied by force for which there is a remedy in damages by a special action of trespass upon the case. This action of trespass or transgression on the case is an universal remedy given for all personal wrongs and injuries without force, so called because the plaintiff's whole case or cause of complaint is set forth at length in the original writ. For though in general there are methods prescribed and forms of action previously settled for redressing those wrongs which most usually occur, and in which the very act itself is immediately prejudicial or injurious to the plaintiff's person or property, as battery, non-payment of debts, detaining one's goods or the like, yet, where any special consequential damage arises which could not be foreseen and provided for in the ordinary course of justice, the party injured is allowed by both common law and the statute Westminster 2, C24, 
to bring a special action on his own case by a writ formed according to the peculiar circumstances of his own particular grievance. For wherever the common law gives a right or prohibits an injury, it also gives a remedy by action. And therefore, wherever a new injury is done, a new method of remedy must be pursued. And it is a settled distinction that where an act is done, which is in itself an immediate injury to another's person or property, there the remedy is usually by the action of trespass, vi et armis, but where there is no act done, but only a culpable omission, or where the act is not immediately injurious, but only by consequence and collaterally, there no action of trespass, vi et armis, will lie, but an action on the special case for the damages consequent on such omission or act. 5. Lastly, injuries affecting a man's reputation or good name are, first, by malicious, scandalous, and slanderous words tending to his damage and derogation. As if a man maliciously and falsely utter any slander or false tale of another, which may either endanger him in law by impeaching him of some heinous crime, as to say that a man hath poisoned another, or is perjured, or which may exclude him from society, as to charge him with having an infectious disease, or which may impair or hurt his trade or livelihood, as to call a tradesman a bankrupt, a physician a quack, or a lawyer a knave. Words spoken in derogation of a peer, a judge, or other great officer of the realm, which are called scandalum magnatum, are held to be still more heinous, and though they be such as would not be actionable in the case of a common person, yet, when spoken in disgrace of such high and respectable characters, they amount to an atrocious injury, which is redressed by an action on the case founded on many ancient statutes, as well as on behalf of the crown, to inflict the punishment of imprisonment on the slanderer, as on behalf of the party, to recover damages for the injuries sustained. Words also tending to scandalize a magistrate or person in a public trust are reputed more highly injurious than when spoken of a private man. It is said that formerly no actions were brought for words unless the slander was such as, if true, would endanger the life of the object of it. A too great encouragement being given by this lenity to false and malicious slanderers, it is now held that for scandalous words of the several species before mentioned, that may endanger a man in law, may exclude him from society, may impair his trade, or may affect a peer of the realm, a magistrate, or one in public trust, an action on the case may be had without proving any particular damage to have happened, but merely upon the probability that it might happen. But with regard to words that do not thus apparently, and upon the face of them, import such defamation as will of course be injurious, it is necessary that the plaintiff should aver some particular damage to have happened, which is called laying his action with a per quad. As if I say that such a clergyman is a bastard, he cannot for this bring any action against me unless he can show some special loss by it, in which case he may bring his action against me for saying he was a bastard per quad he lost the presentation to such a living. In like manner, to slander another man's title by spreading such injurious reports as, if true, would deprive him of his estate as to call the issue in tale, or one who hath land by descent a bastard, is actionable provided any special damage accrues to the proprietor thereby, as if he loses an opportunity of selling the land. But mere scurrility or opprobrious words, which neither in themselves import or are in fact attended with any injurious effects, will not support an action. So scandals, which concern matters merely spiritual, as to call a man a heretic or an adulterer, are cognizable only in the ecclesiastical court, unless any temporal damage ensues, which may be a foundation for a per quad 
words of heat and passion, as to call a man a rogue or rascal, if productive of no ill consequence, and not of any of the dangerous species before mentioned, are not actionable. Neither are words spoken in a friendly manner, as by way of advice, admonition, or concern, without any tincture or circumstance of ill will. For in both these cases, they are not maliciously spoken, which is part of the definition of slander. Neither, as was formerly hinted, are any reflecting words made use of in legal proceedings and pertinent to the cause in hand a sufficient cause of action for slander. Also, if the defendant be able to justify and prove the words to be true, no action will lie, even though special damage had ensued, for then it is no slander or false tale. As if I can prove the tradesman a bankrupt, the physician a quack, the lawyer a knave, and the divine a heretic, this will destroy their respective actions. For though there may be damages sufficient accruing from it, if the fact be true, it is domnum obsque injuria, and where there is no injury, the law gives no remedy. And this is agreeable to the reasoning of the civil law. Eum qui nocentum infamat non este acum et bonum ob eum rem condemnare, delicta enem nocentem nota esse oportet et expedit. End of chapter 8, part 1. Chapter 8, part 2 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Wrongs and Their Remedies Respecting the Rights of Persons. Part 2. A second way of affecting a man's reputation is by printed or written libels, pictures, signs, and the like which set him in an odious or ridiculous light, and thereby diminish his reputation. With regard to libels in general, there are, as in many other cases, two remedies, one by indictment and another by action. The former, for the public offense, for every libel has a tendency to break the peace or provoke others to break it, which offense is the same whether the matter contained be true or false, and therefore the defendant, on an indictment for publishing a libel, is not allowed to allege the truth of it by way of justification. But in the remedy by action on the case, which is to repair the party in damages for the injury done him, the defendant may, as for words spoken, justify the truth of the facts and show that the plaintiff has received no injury at all. What was said with regard to words spoken will also hold in every particular with regard to libels by writing or printing, and the civil actions consequent thereon. But as to signs or pictures, it seems necessary always to show, by proper innuendos and averments of the defendant's meaning, the import and application of the scandal, that some special damage has followed. Otherwise, it cannot appear that such libel by picture was understood to be leveled at the plaintiff or that it was attended with any actionable consequences. A third way of destroying or injuring a man's reputation is by preferring malicious indictments or prosecutions against him, which, under the mask of justice and public spirit, are sometimes made the engines of private spite and enmity. For this, however, the law has given very adequate remedy in damages, either by an action of conspiracy, which cannot be brought but against two at the least, or, which is the more usual way, by a special action on the case for a false and malicious prosecution. In order to carry on the former, which gives a recompense for the danger to which the party has been exposed, it is necessary that the plaintiff should obtain a copy of the record of his indictment and acquittal. But, in prosecutions for felony, 
it is usual to deny a copy of the indictment where there is any the least probable cause to found such prosecution upon. For it would be a very great discouragement to the public justice of the kingdom if prosecutors who had a tolerable ground of suspicion were liable to be sued at law whenever their indictments miscarried. But an action for a malicious prosecution may be founded on such indictment whereon no acquittal can be, as if it be rejected by the grand jury, or be coram non judice, or be insufficiently drawn. For it is not the danger of the plaintiff, but the scandal, vexation, and expense upon which this action is founded. However, any probable cause for preferring it is sufficient to justify the defendant. 2. We are next to consider the violation of the right of personal liberty. This is effected by the injury of false imprisonment, for which the law has not only decreed a punishment as a heinous public crime, but has also given a private reparation to the party, as well by removing the actual confinement for the present as, after it is over, by subjecting the wrongdoer to a civil action, on account of the damage sustained by the loss of time and liberty. To constitute the injury of false imprisonment, there are two points requisite. One, the detention of the person, and two, the unlawfulness of such detention. Every confinement of the person is an imprisonment, whether it be in a common prison, or in a private house, or in the stocks, or even by forcibly detaining one in the public streets. Unlawful or false imprisonment consists in such confinement or detention without sufficient authority, which authority may arise either from some process from the courts of justice or from some warrant from a legal officer having power to commit, under his hand and seal, and expressing the cause of such commitment, or from some other special cause warranted for the necessity of the thing, either by common law or act of parliament, such as arresting a felon by a private person without warrant, the impressing of mariners for the public service, or the apprehending of wagoners for their misbehavior in the public highways. False imprisonment also may arise by executing a lawful warrant or process at an unlawful time, as on a Sunday, or in a place privileged from arrests, as in the verge of the king's court. This is the injury. Let us next see the remedy, which is of two sorts, the one removing the injury, the other making satisfaction for it. The means of removing the actual injury of false imprisonment are fourfold. 1. By writ of main prize. 2. By writ de odio et atia. 3. By writ de omine replegiando. 4. By writ of habeas corpus. 1. The writ of main prize, manu capcio, is a writ directed to the sheriff either generally when any man is imprisoned for a bailable offence and bail hath been refused, or specially when the offence or cause of commitment is not properly bailable below, commanding him to take sureties for the prisoner's appearance, usually called main perners, and to set him at large. Main perners differ from bail in that a man's bail may imprison or surrender him up before the stipulated day of appearance. Main perners can do neither, but are barely sureties for his appearance at the day. Bail are only sureties that the party be answerable for the special matter for which they stipulate. Main perners are bound to produce him to answer all charges whatsoever. 2. The writ de odio et atia was anciently used to be directed to the sheriff commanding him to inquire whether a prisoner charged with murder was committed upon just cause of suspicion or merely propter odium et atiam for hatred and ill will and if upon the inquisition due cause of suspicion did not appear then there issued another writ for the sheriff to admit him to bail this writ according to bracton ought not to be denied to any man it being expressly ordered to be made out gratis, 
without any denial by Magna Carta C-26 and Statute Westminster II, 13, Edward I, C-29. But the Statute of Gloucester, 6, Edward I, C-9, restrained it in the case of killing by misadventure or self-defense, and the Statute 28, Edward III, C-9, abolished it in all cases whatsoever. But as the Statute 42, Edward III, C-1, repealed all statutes then in being, contrary to the Great Charter, Sir Edward Coke is of the opinion that the writ de otio et atia was thereby revived. 3. The writ de omine replegiando lies to replevy a man out of prison, or out of the custody of any private person, in the same manner that chattels taken in distress may be replevied, of which, in the next chapter, upon giving security to the sheriff that the man shall be forthcoming to answer any charge against him. And if the person be conveyed out of the sheriff's jurisdiction, the sheriff may return that he is aloined, elongatus, upon which a process issues called capias in widernum, to imprison the defendant himself without bail or main prize till he produces the party. But this writ is guarded with so many exceptions that it is not an effectual remedy in numerous instances, especially where the crown is concerned. The incapacity, therefore, of these three remedies to give complete relief in every case hath almost entirely antiquated them, and hath caused a general recourse to be had in behalf of persons aggrieved by illegal imprisonment to or the writ of habeas corpus, the most celebrated writ in the English law. Of this there are various kinds made use of by the courts at Westminster for removing prisoners from one court into another for the more easy administration of justice. Such is the habeas corpus ad respondendum, when a man hath a cause of action against one who is confined by the process of some inferior court, in order to remove the prisoner and charge him with this new action in the courts above. Such is that ad satisfaciendum, when a prisoner hath had judgment against him in an action, and the plaintiff is desirous to bring him up to some superior court to charge him with process of execution. Such also are those ad prosequendum, testificandum, deliberandum, etc., which issue when it is necessary to remove a prisoner in order to prosecute or bear testimony in any court or to be tried in the proper jurisdiction wherein the fact was committed. Such is, lastly, the common writ ad faciendum et recipiendum, which issues out of any of the courts of Westminster Hall when a person is sued in some inferior jurisdiction and is desirous to remove the action into the superior court, commanding the inferior judges to produce the body of the defendant together with the day and cause of his caption and detainer, whence the writ is frequently denominated habeas corpus cum causa, to do and receive whatsoever the king's court shall consider in that behalf. This is a writ grantable of common right without any motion in court, and it instantly supersedes all proceedings in the court below. But in order to prevent the surreptitious discharge of prisoners, it is ordered by Statute 1 and 2, Peter and Mary, C-13, that no habeas corpus shall issue to remove any prisoner out of any jail unless signed by some judge of the court out of which it is awarded. And to avoid vexatious delays by removal of frivolous causes, it is enacted by Statute 21, James I, C. 23, that where the judge of an inferior court of record is a barrister of three years' standing, no cause shall be removed from thence by habeas corpus or other writ, after issue or demurrer deliberately joined that no cause, if once remanded to the inferior court by writ of procedendo or otherwise, shall ever afterwards be again removed, and that no cause shall be removed at all, 
if the debt or damages laid in the declaration do not amount to the sum of five pounds, but an expedient having been found out to elude the latter branch of the statute by procuring a nominal plaintiff to bring another action for five pounds or upwards, and then, by the course of the court, the habeas corpus removed both actions together, it is therefore enacted by Statute 12, George I, C. 29, that the inferior court may proceed in such actions as are under the value of five pounds, notwithstanding other actions may be brought against the same defendant to a greater amount. But the great and effectuous writ in all manner of illegal confinement is that of habeas corpus ad subjiciendum, directed to the person detaining another and commanding him to produce the body of the prisoner with the day and cause of his caption and detention ad faciendum subjiciendum et recipiendum to do, submit to, and receive whatsoever the judge or court awarding such writ shall consider in that behalf. This is a high prerogative writ, and therefore, by the common law issuing out of the court of King's Bench, not only in term time, but also during the vacation, by a fiat from the Chief Justice or any other of the judges, and running into all parts of the King's dominions. For the King is at all times entitled to have an account why the liberty of any of his subjects is restrained wherever that restraint may be inflicted. If it issues in vacation, it is usually returnable before the judge himself who awarded it, and he proceeds by himself thereon, unless the term should intervene, then it may be returned in court. Indeed, if the party were privileged in the courts of common pleas and exchequer, as being an officer or suitor of the court, an habeas corpus ad subjiciendum might also have been awarded from thence. And if the cause of imprisonment were palpably illegal, they might have discharged him. But if he were committed for any criminal matter, they could only have remanded him or taken bail for his appearance in the court of the king's bench which occasioned the common pleas to discountenance such applications. It hath also been said, and by very respectable authorities, that the like habeas corpus may issue out of the court of chancery in vacation. But upon the famous application to Lord Nottingham by Jenks, notwithstanding the most diligent searches, no precedent could be found where the chancellor had issued such a writ in vacation and therefore his lordship refused it. In the court of King's Bench it was, and is still, necessary to apply for it by motion to the court, as in the case of all other prerogative writs, certiori, prohibition, mandamus, etc., which do not issue as of mere course, without showing some probable cause why the extraordinary power of the crown is called in to the party's assistance. For, as was argued by Lord Chief Justice Vaughan, it is granted on motion because it cannot be had of course, and there is therefore no necessity to grant it, for the court ought to be satisfied that the party hath a probable cause to be delivered. And this seems the more reasonable, because, when once granted, the person to whom it is directed can return no satisfactory excuse for not bringing up the body of the prisoner. So that, if it issued of mere course, without showing to the court or judge some reasonable ground for awarding it, a traitor or felon under the sentence of death, a soldier or mariner in the king's service, a wife, a child, a relation, or a domestic, confined for insanity or other prudential reasons, might obtain a temporary enlargement by suing out an habeas corpus, though sure to be remanded as soon as brought up to the court. And therefore, Sir Edward Coke, when Chief Justice, did not scruple, in 13 James I, to deny a habeas corpus to one confined by the Court of Admiralty for piracy, there appearing, upon his own showing, sufficient grounds to confine him. On the other hand, if a probable ground be shown, 
that the party is imprisoned without just cause, and therefore hath a right to be delivered, the writ of habeas corpus is then a writ of right, which may not be denied, but ought to be granted to every man that is committed, or detained in prison, or otherwise restrained, though it be by the command of the king, the privy council, or any other. In a former part of these commentaries, we expatiated at large on the personal liberty of the subject. It was shown to be a natural inherent right, which could not be surrendered or forfeited unless by the commission of some great and atrocious crime, nor ought to be abridged in any case without the special permission of law. A doctrine co with the first rudiments of the English Constitution and handed down to us from our Saxon ancestors, notwithstanding all their struggles with the Danes and the violence of the Norman conquest, asserted afterwards and confirmed by the conqueror himself and his descendants, and though sometimes a little impaired by the ferocity of the times and the occasional despotism of jealous or usurping princes, yet established on the firmest basis by the provisions of Magna Carta, and a long succession of statutes enacted under Edward the Third, To assert an absolute exemption from imprisonment in all cases is inconsistent with every idea of law and political society, and in the end would destroy all civil liberty by rendering its protection impossible. But the glory of the English law consists in clearly defining the times, the causes, and the extent when, wherefore, and to what degree the imprisonment of the subject may be lawful. This induces an absolute necessity of expressing upon every commitment the reason for which it is made, that the court upon an habeas corpus may examine into its validity, and according to the circumstances of the case, may discharge, admit to bail, or remand the prisoner. And yet, Early in the reign of Charles I, the court of King's Bench, relying on some arbitrary precedents, and those perhaps misunderstood, determined that they could not, upon an habeas corpus, either bail or deliver a prisoner, though committed without any cause assigned, in case he was committed, by the special command of the king or by the lords of the privy council. This drew on a parliamentary inquiry and produced the petition of right, 3 Charles I, which recites this illegal judgment and enacts that no freeman hereafter shall be so imprisoned or detained. But when, in the following year, Mr. Selden and others were committed by the Lords of the Council in pursuance of His Majesty's special command under a general charge of notable contempts and stirring up sedition against the King and government, the judges delayed for two terms, including also the long vacation, to deliver an opinion how far such a charge was bailable. And when at length they agreed that it was, they, however, annexed a condition of finding sureties for the good behavior which still protracted their imprisonment, the Chief Justice, Sir Nicholas Hyde, at the same time declaring that, if they were again remanded for that cause, Perhaps the court would not afterwards grant a habeas corpus, being already made acquainted with the cause of the imprisonment. But this was heard with the indignation and astonishment by every lawyer present, according to Mr. Selden's own account of the matter, whose resentment was not cooled at the distance of four and twenty years. These pitiful evasions gave rise to the statute 16 Charles I, C. 10, Section 8, whereby it was enacted that if any person be committed by the king himself in person, or by his privy council, or by any of the members thereof, he shall have granted unto him, without any delay upon any pretense whatsoever, a writ of habeas corpus upon demand or motion made to the court of king's bench or common pleas who shall thereupon within three court days after the return is made examine and determine the legality of such commitment and do what to justice shall appertain in delivering bailing or remanding such prisoner 
Yet still, in the case of Jenks before alluded to, who in 1676 was committed by the king in council for a turbulent speech at Guildhall, new shifts and devices were made use of to prevent his enlargement by law. The Chief Justice, as well as the Chancellor, declining to award a writ of habeas corpus ad subjiciendum in vacation, though at last he thought proper to award the usual writs ad deliberandum, etc., whereby the prisoner was discharged at the Old Bailey. Other abuses had also crept into daily practice, which had in some measure defeated the benefit of this great constitutional remedy. The party imprisoning was at liberty to delay his obedience to the first writ, and might wait till a second and a third, called an alias and a pluris, were issued before he produced the party and many other vexatious shifts were practiced to detain state prisoners in custody. But whoever will attentively consider the English history may observe that the flagrant abuse of any power by the crown or its ministers has always been productive of a struggle, which either discovers the exercise of that power to be contrary to law, or, if legal, restrains it for the future. This was the case in the present instance. The oppression of an obscure individual gave birth to the famous Habeas Corpus Act, 31 Charles II, C. 2, which is frequently considered as another Magna Carta of the kingdom, and by consequence has also in subsequent times reduced the method of proceeding on these writs, though not within the reach of that statute, but issuing merely at the common law, to the true standard of law and liberty. The statute itself enacts, 1. That the writ shall be returned and the prisoner brought up within a limited time according to the distance, not exceeding in any case 20 days. 2. That such writs shall be endorsed as granted in pursuance of this act and signed by the person awarding them. 3. That on complaint and request in writing, by or on behalf of any person committed and charged with any crime, unless committed for treason or felony expressed in the warrant, or for suspicion of the same, or as accessory thereto before the fact, or convicted or charged in execution by legal process, the Lord Chancellor or any of the twelve judges in vacation, upon viewing a copy of the warrant or affidavit that a copy is denied, shall, unless the party has neglected for two terms to apply to any court for his enlargement, award a habeas corpus for such prisoner returnable immediately before himself or any other of the judges, and upon the return made, shall discharge the party, if bailable, upon giving security to appear and answer to the accusation in the proper court of judicature. 4 that officers and keepers neglecting to make due returns or not delivering to the prisoner or his agent within six hours after demand a copy of the warrant of commitment or shifting the custody of the prisoner from one to another without sufficient reason or authority specified in the act shall for the first offence forfeit a hundred pounds and for the second offence two hundred to the party grieved and be disabled to hold his office. 5. That no person, once delivered by habeas corpus, shall be recommitted for the same offense on penalty of five hundred pounds. 6. That every person committed for treason or felony shall, if he requires it, the first week of the next term or the first day of the next session of oyer and terminer be indicted in that term or session, or else be admitted to bail unless the king's witnesses cannot be produced at that time, and if acquitted, or if not indicted and tried in the second term or session, he shall be discharged from his imprisonment for such imputed offense, but that no person, after the assizes shall be opened for the county in which he is detained, shall be removed by habeas corpus till after the assizes are ended, but shall be left to the justice of the judges of assize. 7. That any such prisoner may move for and obtain his habeas corpus, as well out of the chancery or exchequer, as out of the king's bench or common pleas, 
and the Lord Chancellor or judges denying the same on sight of the warrant or oath that the same is refused forfeit severally to the party grieved the sum of five hundred pounds. 8. That this writ of habeas corpus shall run into the county's palatine, Cinque ports, and other privileged places, and the islands of Jersey and Guernsey. 9. That no inhabitant of England, except persons contracting or convicts praying to be transported, or having committed some capital offense in the place to which they are sent, shall be sent prisoner to Scotland, Ireland, Jersey, Guernsey, or any places beyond the seas, within or without the king's dominions, on pain that the party committing, his advisers, aiders, and assistants, shall forfeit to the party grieved a sum not less than five hundred pounds, to be recovered with treble costs, shall be disabled to bear any office of trust or profit, shall incur the penalties of praemunire, and shall be incapable of the king's pardon. This is the substance of that great and important statute, which extends, we may observe, only to the case of commitments for such criminal charge as can produce no inconvenience to the public justice by a temporary enlargement of the prisoner, all other cases of unjust imprisonment being left to the habeas corpus at common law. But even upon writs at the common law, it is now expected by the court, agreeable to ancient precedents and the spirit of the Act of Parliament, that the writ should be immediately obeyed without waiting for any alias or pluris, otherwise an attachment will ensue. By which admirable regulations, judicial as well as parliamentary, the remedy is now complete for removing the injury of unjust and illegal confinement a remedy the more necessary because the oppression does not always arise from the ill nature but sometimes from the mere inattention of government for it frequently happens in foreign countries and has happened in england during temporary suspensions of the statute that persons apprehended upon suspicion have suffered a long imprisonment merely because they were forgotten the satisfactory remedy for this injury of false imprisonment is by an action of trespass, vi et armis, usually called an action of false imprisonment, which is generally and almost unavoidably accompanied with a charge of assault and battery also, and therein the party shall recover damages for the injury he has received, and also the defendant is, as for all other injuries committed with force, or v et armis, liable to pay a fine to the king, for the violation of the public peace. End of chapter 8, part 2. Chapter 8, part 3 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Wrongs and Their Remedies Respecting the Rights of Persons. Part 3. 3. With regard to the third absolute right of individuals, or that of private property, though the enjoyment of it, when acquired, is strictly a personal right, yet as its nature and original, and the means of its acquisition or loss fell more directly under our second general division of the rights of things, and as, of course, the wrongs that affect these rights must be referred to the corresponding division in the present book of our commentaries, I conceive it will be more commodious and easy to consider together, rather than in a separate view, the injuries that may be offered to the enjoyment as well as to the rights of property. And therefore, I shall here conclude the head of injuries affecting the absolute rights of individuals. We are next to contemplate those which affect their relative rights, or such as are incident to persons considered as members of society and connected to each other by various ties and relations, and, 
in particular, such injuries as may be done to persons under the four following relations, husband and wife, parent and child, guardian and ward, master and servant. 1. Injuries that may be offered to a person considered as a husband are principally three, abduction or taking away a man's wife, adultery or criminal conversation with her, and beating or otherwise abusing her. 1. As to the first sort, abduction or taking her away, this may either be by fraud and persuasion or open violence. Though the law in both cases supposes force and constraint, the wife having no power to consent, and therefore gives a remedy by writ of ravishment, or action of trespass vi et armis, de uxore rapta et abducta. This action lay at the common law, and thereby the husband shall recover not the possession of his wife, but damages for taking her away, and by statute Westminster 1, 3 Edward I, C. 13, the offender shall also be imprisoned two years and be fined at the pleasure of the king. Both the king and the husband may therefore have this action, and the husband is also entitled to recover damages in an action on the case against such as persuade and entice the wife to live separate from him without a sufficient cause. The old law was so strict in this point that, if one's wife missed her way upon the road, it was not lawful for another man to take her into his house unless she was benighted and in danger of being lost or drowned, but a stranger might carry her behind him on horseback to market, to a justice of the peace for a warrant against her husband, or to the spiritual court to sue for a divorce. 2. Adultery or criminal conversation with a man's wife Though it is as a public crime left by our laws to the coercion of the spiritual courts, yet considered as a civil injury, and surely there can be no greater, the law gives a satisfaction to the husband for it by an action of trespass vi et armis against the adulterer, wherein the damages recovered are usually very large and exemplary. But these are properly increased or diminished by circumstances, as the rank and fortune of the plaintiff and defendant, the relation or connection between them, the seduction or otherwise of the wife founded on her previous behavior and character, and the husband's obligation by settlement or otherwise to provide for those children which he cannot but suspect to be spurious. 3. The third injury is that of beating a man's wife or otherwise ill-using her, for which, if it be a common assault, battery, or imprisonment, the law gives the usual remedy to recover damages by action of trespass vi et armis, which must be brought in the names of the husband and wife jointly. But if the beating or other maltreatment be very enormous, so that thereby the husband is deprived for any time of the company and assistance of his wife, the law then gives him a separate remedy by action upon the case for this ill usage, per quod consortium amicit, in which he shall recover a satisfaction in damages. 2. Injuries that may be offered to a person considered in the relation of a parent were likewise of two kinds. 1. Abduction, or taking his children away, and 2 marrying his son and heir without the father's consent, whereby, during the continuance of the military tenures, he lost the value of his marriage. But this last injury is now ceased, together with the right upon which it was grounded. For the father, being no longer entitled to the value of the marriage, the marrying his heir does him no sort of injury for which a civil action will lie. As to the other, of abduction or taking away the children from the father, that is also a matter of doubt whether it be a civil injury or no. For before the abolition of the tenure in chivalry, it was equally a doubt whether an action would lie for taking and carrying away any other child besides the heir, some holding that it would not, upon the supposition that the only ground or cause of action was losing the value of the heir's marriage 
and others holding that an action would lie for taking away any of the children for that the parent hath an interest in them all to provide for their education if therefore before the abolition of these tenures it was an injury to the father to take away the rest of his children as well as his heir as i am inclined to think it was it still remains an injury and is remediable by a writ of ravishment or action of trespass v et animus de filio vel filia rapto vel abducto in the same manner as the husband may have it on account of the abduction of his wife three of a similar nature to the last is the relation of guardian and ward and the like actions mutatis mutandis as are given to fathers the guardian also has for recovery of damages when his ward is stolen or ravished away from him and though guardianship in chivalry is now totally abolished which was the only beneficial kind of guardianship to the guardian yet the guardian in sockage was always and is still entitled to take an action of ravishment if his ward or pupil be taken from him but then he must account to his pupil for the damages which he so recovers and as guardian and sockage was also entitled at common law to a writ of right of ward de custodia tarai et haredis in order to recover the possession and custody of the infant so i apprehend that he is still entitled to sue out this antiquated writ but a more speedy and summary method of redressing all complaints relative to wards and guardians hath of late been obtained by an application to the court of chancery which is the supreme guardian and has the superintendent jurisdiction of all infants in the kingdom and it is expressly provided by the statute twelve charles the second c twenty four that testamentary guardians may maintain an action of ravishment or trespass for recovery of any of their wards and also for damages to be applied to the use and benefit of the infants four to the relation between master and servant and the rights accruing therefrom there are two species of injuries incident the one retaining a man's hired servant before his time is expired the other beating or confining him in such a manner that he is not able to perform his work as to the first the retaining another person's servant during the time he has agreed to serve his present master this as it is an ungentlemanlike so it is also an illegal act for every master has by his contract purchased for a valuable consideration the service of his domestics for a limited time the inveigling or hiring his servant which induces a breach of this contract is therefore an injury to the master and for that injury the law has given him a remedy by a special action on the case and he may also have an action against the servant for the non-performance of his agreement but if the new master were not apprised of the former contract no action lies against him unless he refuse to restore the servant upon demand the other point of injury is that of beating confining or disabling a man's servant which depends upon the same principle as the last viz the property which the master has by his contract acquired in the labor of the servant in this case besides the remedy of an action of battery or imprisonment which the servant himself as an individual may have against the aggressor the master also as a recompense for his immediate loss may maintain an action of trespass v et armis in which he must allege and prove the special damage he has sustained by the beating of his servant per quad servitium amicit and then the jury will make him a proportionable pecuniary satisfaction a similar practice to which we find also to have obtained among the athenians where masters were entitled to an action against such as beat or ill-treated their servants we may observe that in these relative injuries notice is only taken of the wrong done to the superior of the parties related by the breach and dissolution of either the relation itself 
or at least the advantages accruing therefrom, while the loss of the inferior by such injuries is totally unregarded. One reason for which may be this, that the inferior hath no kind of property in the company, care, or assistance of the superior, as the superior is held to have in those of the inferior, and therefore the inferior can suffer no loss or injury. The wife cannot recover damages for beating her husband, for she hath no separate interest in anything during her coverture. The child hath no property in his father or guardian, as they have in him, for the sake of giving him an education and nurture. Yet the wife or the child, if the husband or parent be slain, have a peculiar species of criminal prosecution allowed them in the nature of a civil satisfaction which is called an appeal and which will be considered in the next book. And so the servant whose master is disabled does not thereby lose his maintenance or wages. He had no property in his master, and if he receives his part of the stipulated contract, he suffers no injury, and is therefore entitled to no action for any battery or imprisonment which such master may happen to endure. End of chapter 8, part 3「in the preceding chapter, we considered the wrongs or injuries that affected the rights of persons, either considered as individuals or as related to each other, and are at present to enter upon the discussion of such injuries as affect the rights of property together with the remedies which the law has given to repair or redress them. And here again we must follow our former division of property into personal and real. Personal which consists in goods, money, and all other movable chattels, and things thereunto incident, a property which may attend a man's person wherever he goes, and from thence receives its denomination, and real property, which consists of such things as are permanent, fixed, and immovable, as lands, tenements, and hereditaments of all kinds, which are not annexed to the person, nor can be moved from the place in which they subsist. First, then, we are to consider the injuries that may be offered to the rights of personal property, and of these, first the rights of personal property in possession, and then those that are in action only. 1. The rights of personal property in possession are liable to two species of injuries, the emotion or deprivation of that possession and the abuse or damage of the chattels while the possession continues in the legal owner. The former, or deprivation of possession, is also divisible into two branches, the unjust and unlawful taking them away, and the unjust detaining them, though the original taking might be lawful. 1. And first, of an unlawful taking. The right of property in all external things being solely acquired by occupancy, as has been formally stated, and preserved and transferred by grants, deeds, and wills, which are a continuation of that occupancy, it follows, as a necessary consequence, that when I once have gained the rightful possession of any goods or chattels, either by a just occupancy or by a legal transfer, Whoever, either by fraud or force, dispossesses me of them, is guilty of a transgression against the law of society, which is a kind of secondary law of nature. For there must be an end of all social commerce between man and man, unless private possessions be secured from unjust invasions. And if an acquisition of goods, either by force or fraud, were allowed to be a sufficient title, all property would soon be confined to the most strong or the most cunning, and the weak and simple-minded part of mankind, which is by far the most numerous division, 
could never be secure in their possessions. The wrongful taking of goods being thus most clearly an injury, the next consideration is what remedy the law of England has given for it, and this is, in the first place, the restitution of the goods themselves so wrongfully taken, with damages for the loss sustained by such unjust invasion, which is effected by action of Replevin, an institution which the mirror ascribes to Glanville, chief justice to King Henry the Second. This obtains only in one instance of an unlawful taking, that of a wrongful distress, and this and the action of Detenu, of which I shall presently say more, are almost the only actions in which the actual specific possession of the identical personal chattel is restored to the proper owner. For things personal are looked upon by the law as of a nature so transitory and perishable that it is for the most part impossible either to ascertain their identity or to restore them in the same condition as when they came into the hands of the wrongful possessor. And since it is a maxim that lex nenim cogit avana, seo impossibila, it therefore contents itself in general with restoring, not the thing itself, but a pecuniary equivalent to the party injured by giving him a satisfaction in damages. But in the case of a distress, the goods are from the first taking in the custody of the law, and not merely in that of the distrainer and therefore they may not only be identified, but also restored to the first possessor without any material change in their condition. And being thus in the custody of the law, the taking them back by force is looked upon as an atrocious injury and denominated a riscus, for which a distrainer has a remedy in damages either by a writ of riscus in the case they were going to the pound, or by a writ de particle fracto, or pound breach, in case they were actually impounded. He may also, at his option, bring an action on the case for this injury, and shall therein, if the distress were taken for rent, recover treble damages. The term riscus is likewise applied to the forcible delivery of a defendant when arrested from the officer who was carrying him to prison in which circumstances the plaintiff has a similar remedy of action on the case or of riscus, or if the sheriff makes a return of such riscus to the court out of which the process issued, the rescuer will be punished by attachment. An action of replevin, the regular way of contesting the validity of the transaction, is founded, I said, upon a distress taken wrongfully and without sufficient cause being a re-delivery of the pledge or thing taken in distress to the owner upon his giving security to try the right of the distress and to restore it if the right be adjudged against him. And formally, when the party distrained upon intended to dispute the right of the distress, he had no other process by the old common law than by a writ of replevin, replegiari facius, which issued out of chancery, commanding the sheriff to deliver the distress to the owner and afterwards to do justice in respect of the matter in dispute in his own county court. But this being a tedious method of proceeding, the beasts or other goods were long detained from the owner to his great loss and damage. For which reason, the statute of Malbridge directs that, without issuing a writ out of chancery, the sheriff, immediately upon complaint to him made, shall proceed to replevy the goods, and, for the greater ease of the parties, it is further provided by statute 1 Peter and Mary C. 12, that the sheriff shall make at least four deputies in each county for the sole purpose of making replevins. Upon application, therefore, either to the sheriff or one of his said deputies, security is to be given in pursuance of the statute of Westminster 2, 13, Edward I, C. 2, 1, that the party replevying will pursue his action against the distrainer for which purpose he puts in plegios de prosquendo, or pledges to prosecute, and 2, that if the right be determined against him, 
he will return the distress again, for which purpose he is also bound to find plegios de retorno abendo. Besides these pledges, which are merely discretionary in the sheriff, the statute 11, George II, C-19, requires that the officer, granting a replevin on a distress for rent, shall take a bond with two sureties in a sum of double the value of the goods distrained, which bond shall be assigned to the avowant or person making cognizance on request made to the sheriff, and, if forfeited, may be sued in the name of the assignee. And certainly, as the end of all distresses is only to compel the party distrained upon to satisfy the debt or duty owing from him, this end is well answered by such sufficient sureties as by retaining the very distress, which might frequently occasion great inconvenience to the owner, and that the law never wantonly inflicts. The sheriff, on receiving such security, is immediately by his officers to cause the chattels taken in distress to be restored into the possession of the party distrained upon, unless the distrainer claims a property in the goods so taken. For if, by this method of distress, the distrainer happens to come again into possession of his own property and goods which before he had lost, the law allows him to keep them, without any reference to the manner by which he thus has regained possession, being a kind of personal remitter. If, therefore, the distrainer claims any such property, the party replevying must sue out a writ de propriete probanda, in which the sheriff is to try, by an inquest, in whom the property previous to the distress subsisted. And if it be found to be in the distrainer, the sheriff can proceed no farther, but must return the claim of property to the court of King's Bench or Common Pleas to be there farther prosecuted, if thought advisable, and there finally determined. But if no claim of property be put in, or if, upon trial, the sheriff's inquest determines it against the distrainer, then the sheriff is to replevy the goods making use of even force if the distrainer makes resistance in case the goods be found within his county but if the distress be carried out of the county or concealed then the sheriff may return that the goods or beasts are aloined elongata carried to a distance to places to him unknown and thereupon the party replevying shall have a writ of capias in widernum or in vetito namio a term which signifies a second or reciprocal distress in lieu of the first which was a loin. It is therefore a command to the sheriff to take other goods of the distrainer in lieu of the distress formally taken and a loin or withheld from the owner. So that here is now distress against distress, one being taken to answer the other by way of reprisal and as a punishment for the illegal behavior of the original distrainer, for which reason goods taken in withernum cannot be replevied till the original distress is forthcoming. But in common cases, the goods are delivered back to the party replevying, who is then bound to bring his action of replevin, which may be prosecuted in the county court, be the distress of what value it may but either party may remove it to the superior courts, the plaintiff at pleasure, the defendant upon reasonable cause, and also, if in the course of proceeding, any right of freehold comes into question, the sheriff can proceed no farther, so that it is usual to carry it up in the first instance to the courts of Westminster Hall. Upon this action brought, the distrainer, who is now the defendant, makes an avowry, that is, he avows taking the distress in his own right or the right of his wife, and sets forth the reason for it, as for rent arrear, damage done, or other cause, or else, if he justifies in another's right, as his bailiff or servant, he is said to make a cognizance, that is, he acknowledges the taking, but insists that such taking was legal, as he acted by the command of one who had a right to distrain and on the truth and legal merits of this avowry or cognizance, the cause is determined. 
if it be determined for the plaintiff, viz., that the distress was wrongfully taken, he has already got his goods back into his own possession, and shall keep them, and moreover recover damages. But if the defendant prevails, and obtains judgment that the distress was legal, then he shall have a writ de retorno abendo, whereby the goods or chattels, which were distrained and then replevied, are returned again into his custody, to be sold or otherwise disposed of, as if no replevin had been made. Or, in case of rent arrear, he may have a writ to inquire into the value of the distress by a jury, and shall recover the amount of it in damages, if less than the arrear of rent, or, if more, then so much as shall be equal to such arrear. And, if the distress be insufficient, he may take a farther distress or distresses, but otherwise, if pending a replevin for a former distress, a man distrains again for the same rent or service, then the party is not driven to his action of replevin, but shall have a writ of recaption and recover damages for the defendant's contempt of the process of the law. In like manner, other remedies for other unlawful takings of a man's goods consist only in recovering a satisfaction in damages. As if a man take the goods of another out of his actual or virtual possession, without having a lawful title to do so, it is an injury, which, though it doth not amount to a felony unless it be done animo ferandi, is nevertheless a transgression for which an action of trespass vi et armis will lie, wherein the plaintiff shall not recover the thing itself, but only damages for the loss of it. or if committed without force, the party may, at his choice, have another remedy in damages by action of trover and conversion, of which I shall presently say more. 2. Deprivation of possession may also be by an unjust detainer of another's goods, though the original taking was lawful. As if I distrain another's cattle damage feasant, and he tenders me sufficient amends, now, Though the original taking was lawful, my subsequent detainment of them after tender of amends is wrongful, and he shall have an action of replevin against me to recover them, in which he shall recover damages only for the detention and not for the caption, because the original taking was lawful. Or, if I lend a man a horse, and he afterwards refuses to restore it, this injury consists in the detaining and not in the original taking, and the regular method for me to recover possession is by action of detinue. In this action of detinue, it is necessary to ascertain the thing detained in such manner as that it may be specifically known and recovered. Therefore, it cannot be brought for money, corn, or the like, for that cannot be known from other money or corn, unless it be in a bag or sack, for then it may be distinguishably marked. In order, therefore, to ground an action of detinue, which was only for the detaining, these points are necessary. 1. That the defendant came lawfully by the goods as either by delivery to him or finding them. 2. That the plaintiff have a property. 3. That the goods themselves are of some value. And 4. That they be ascertained in point of identity. But there is one disadvantage which attends this action, viz., that the defendant is herein permitted to wage his law, that is, to exculpate himself by oath, and thereby defeat the plaintiff of his remedy, which privilege is grounded on the confidence originally reposed in the bailee by the bailor, in the borrower by the lender, and the like, from whence arose a strong presumptive evidence that in the plaintiff's own opinion the defendant was worthy of credit. But for this reason, the action itself is of late much disused, and has given place to the action of Trover. This action, of Trover and conversion, was in its original an action of trespass upon the case for recovery of damages against such person as had found another's goods and refused to deliver them on demand 
but converted them to his own use, from which finding and converting it is called an action of trover and conversion. The freedom of this action from wager of law, and the less degree of certainty requisite in describing the goods, gave it so considerable advantage over the action of detenu, that by a fiction of law actions of trover were at length permitted to be brought against any man who had in his possession by any means whatsoever the personal goods of another, and sold them or used them without the consent of the owner, or refused to deliver them when demanded. The injury lies in the conversion, for any man may take the goods of another into possession if he finds them, but no finder is allowed to acquire a property therein unless the owner be forever unknown, and therefore he must not convert them to his own use, which the law presumes him to do, if he refuses to restore them to the owner, for which reason such refusal alone is prima facie sufficient evidence of a conversion. The fact of the finding, or trover, is therefore now totally immaterial, for the plaintiff needs only to suggest, as words of form, that he lost such goods and that the defendant found them, and, if he proves that the goods are his property and that the defendant had them in his possession, it is sufficient. But a conversion must be fully proved, and then, in this action, the plaintiff shall recover damages equal to the value of the thing converted, but not the thing itself, which nothing will recover but an action of detenue or replevin. As to damage that may be offered to things personal while in the possession of the owner, as hunting a man's deer, shooting his dogs, poisoning his cattle, or in any wise taking from the value of any of his chattels, or making them in a worse condition than before, these injuries are too obvious to need explication. I have only therefore to mention the remedies given by the law to redress them, which are in two shapes, by action of trespass v et armis, where the act is in itself immediately injurious to another's property, and therefore necessarily accompanied with some degree of force, and by special action on the case where the act is in itself indifferent, and the injury only consequential, and therefore arising without any breach of the peace. In both of which suits, the plaintiff shall recover damages in proportion to the injury which he proves that his property has sustained and it is not material whether the damage be done by the defendant himself or his servants by his direction, for the action will lie against the master as well as the servant. And if a man keeps a dog or other brute animal used to do mischief, as by worrying sheep or the like, the owner must answer for the consequences if he knows of such evil habit. End of chapter 9, part 1Chapter 9, Part 2 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Injuries to Personal Property, Part 2. 2. Hitherto of injuries affecting the right of things personal in possession. We are next to consider those which regard the things in action only, or such rights as are founded on and arise from contracts, the nature and several divisions of which were explained in the preceding volume. The violation or non-performance of these contracts might be extended into as great a variety of wrongs as the rights which we then considered but I shall now endeavor to reduce them into a narrow compass, by here making only a twofold division of contracts, viz. contracts express and contracts implied, and considering the injuries that arise from the violation of each and their respective remedies. Express contracts include three distinct species, debts, covenants, and promises. 1. The legal acceptation of debt is a sum of money due by certain and express agreement, 
as by a bond for a determinate sum, or a bill or note, a special bargain, or a rent reserved on a lease, where the quantity is fixed and unalterable and does not depend upon any after calculation to settle it. The non-payment of these is an injury for which the proper remedy is by action of debt to compel the performance of the contract and recover the special sum due. This is the shortest and surest remedy, particularly where the debt arises upon a specialty, that is, upon a deed or instrument under seal. So also, if I verbally agree to pay a man a certain price for a certain parcel of goods and fail in the performance, an action of debt lies against me, for this is also a determinate contract. But if I agree for no settled price, I am not liable to an action of debt, but a special action on the case according to the nature of my contract. And indeed, actions of debt are now seldom brought upon special contracts under seal, wherein the sum due is clearly and precisely expressed. For in case of such an action upon a simple contract, the plaintiff labors under two difficulties. First, the defendant has here the same advantage as an action of detinue, that of waging his law or purging himself of the debt by oath if he thinks proper. Secondly, in an action of debt, the plaintiff must recover the whole debt he claims or nothing at all. For the debt is one single cause of action, fixed and determined, and which, therefore, if the proof varies from the claim, cannot be looked upon as the same contract whereof the performance is sued for. If, therefore, I bring an action of debt for thirty pounds, I am not at liberty to prove a debt of twenty pounds and recover a verdict thereon, any more than if I bring an action of debt in you for a horse, I can thereby recover an ox. For I fail in the proof of that contract which my action or complaint has alleged to be specific, express, and determinate. But in an action on the case, on what is called an indebitatus assumsit, which is not brought to compel a specific performance of the contract, but to recover damages for its non-performance, the implied assumpsit, and consequently the damages for the breach of it, are in their nature indeterminate and will therefore adapt and proportion themselves to the truth of the case which shall be proved, without being confined to the precise demand stated in the declaration. For if any debt be proved, however less than the sum demanded, the law will raise a promise pro tanto, and the damages will of course be proportioned to the actual debt. So that I may declare that the defendant, being indebted to me in thirty pounds, undertook or promised to pay it, but failed, and lay my damages arising from such failure at what sum I please, and the jury will, according to the nature of my proof, allow me either the whole in damages or any inferior sum. The form of the writ of debt is sometimes in the debet and detinet, and sometimes in the detinet only. That is, the writ states, either that the defendant owes and unjustly detains the debt or thing in question, or only that he unjustly detains it. It is brought in the debit as well as the debt in it, when sued by one of the original contracting parties who personally gave the credit, against the other who personally incurred the debt, as by the obligee against the obligor, and the landlord against the tenant, etc., but if it be brought by or against an executor for a duty due or from the testator, this, not being his own debt, shall be sued for in the debt only. So also, if the action be for goods, for corn, or an horse, the writ shall be in the debt only. For nothing but a sum of money, for which I have personally contracted, is properly considered as my debt. And indeed, a writ of debt in the detinate only is neither more nor less than a mere writ of detinue. It might therefore perhaps be more easy, instead of distinguishing between the debt and detinate, and the detinate only in an action of debt, to say at once that in the one case an action of debt may be had, in the other an action of detinue. 2. 
a covenant also contained in a deed to do a direct act or to omit one is another species of express contracts the violation or breach of which is a civil injury as if a man covenants to be at york by such a day or not to exercise a trade in a particular place and is not at york at the time appointed or carries on his trade in the place forbidden these are direct breaches of his covenant and may perhaps be greatly to the disadvantage and loss of the covenantee the remedy for this is by a writ of covenant which directs the sheriff to command the defendant generally to keep his covenant with the plaintiff without specifying the nature of the covenant or show good cause to the contrary and if he continues refractory or the covenant is already so broken that it cannot now be specifically performed then the subsequent proceedings set forth with precision the covenant the breach and the loss which has happened thereby whereupon the jury will give damages in proportion to the injury sustained by the plaintiff and occasioned by such breach of the defendant's contract there is one species of covenant of a different nature from the rest and that is a covenant real to convey or dispose of lands which seems to be partly of a personal and partly of a real nature for this the remedy is by special writ of covenant for a specific performance of the contract concerning certain lands particularly described in the writ it therefore directs the sheriff to command the defendant here called the defortunate to keep the covenant made between the plaintiff and him concerning the identical lands in question and upon this process it is that fines of land are usually levied at common law the plaintiff or person to whom the fine is levied bringing a writ of covenant in which he suggests some agreement to have been made between him and the defortune touching those particular lands for the completion of which he brings his action and for the end of this supposed difference the fine or finalis concordia is made whereby the defortune now called the cognizer acknowledges the tenements to be the right of the plaintiff now called the cognizzi and moreover as leases for years were formerly considered only as contracts or covenants for the enjoyment of the rents and profits and not as the conveyance of any real interest in the land the ancient remedy for the lessee if ejected was by writ of covenant against the lessor to recover the term if in being and damages in case the ouster was committed by the lessor himself or if the term was expired or the ouster was committed by a stranger then to recover damages only three a promise is in the nature of a verbal covenant and wants nothing but the solemnity of writing and sealing to make it absolutely the same if therefore it be to do any explicit act it is an express contract as much as any covenant and the breach of it is an equal injury the remedy indeed is not exactly the same since instead of an action of covenant there only lies an action upon the case for what is called the assumpsit or undertaking of the defendant the failure of performing which is the wrong or injury done to the plaintiff the damages whereof a jury are to estimate and settle as if a builder promises undertakes or assumes to caius that he will build and cover his house within a time limited and fails to do it caius has an action on the case against the builder for this breach of his express promise undertaking or assumes it and shall recover a pecuniary satisfaction for the injury sustained by such delay so also in the case before mentioned of a debt by simple contract if the debtor promises to pay it and does not this breach of promise entitles the creditor to his action on the case instead of being driven to an action of debt thus likewise a promissory note or note of hand not under seal to pay money at a day certain is an express assumption and the payee at common law or by custom and act of parliament the indorsee 
may recover the value of the note and damages if it remains unpaid. Some agreements indeed, though never so expressly made, are deemed of so important a nature that they ought not rest in verbal promise only, which cannot be proved but by the memory which sometimes will induce the perjury of witnesses. To prevent which, the Statute of Frauds and Perjuries, 29 Charles II, C3 enacts, that in the five following cases, no verbal promise shall be sufficient to ground an action upon, but at least some note or memorandum of it shall be made in writing and signed by the party to be charged therewith. 1. Where an executor or administrator promises to answer damages out of his own estate. 2. Where a man undertakes to answer for debt, default, or miscarriage of another. 3. Where any agreement is made upon consideration of marriage. 4. Where any contract or sale is made of lands, tenements, or hereditaments, or any interest therein. 5. And lastly, where there is any agreement that is not to be performed within a year from the making thereof. In all these cases, a mere verbal assumpsit is void. From these express contracts, the transition is easy to those that are only implied by the law, which are such as reason and justice dictate, and which, therefore, the law presumes that every man has contracted to perform, and, upon this presumption, makes him answerable to such persons as suffer by his non-performance. Of this nature are, first, such as are necessarily implied by the fundamental constitution of government to which every man is a contracting party. And thus it is that every person is bound and hath virtually agreed to pay such particular sums of money as are charged on him by the sentence or assessed by the interpretation of the law. For it is part of the original contract entered into by all mankind who partake the benefits of society to submit in all points to the municipal constitutions and local ordinances of that state of which each individual is a member. Whatever, therefore, the laws order anyone to pay, that becomes instantly a debt, which he hath beforehand contracted to discharge. And this implied agreement it is that gives the plaintiff a right to institute a second action founded merely on the general contract in order to recover such damages or sum of money as are assessed by the jury and adjudged by the court to be due to the defendant to the plaintiff in any former action so that if he have once obtained a judgment against another for a certain sum, and neglects to take out execution thereupon, he may afterwards bring an action of debt upon the judgment, and shall not be put upon the proof of the original cause of action. But upon showing the judgment once obtained still in full force, and yet unsatisfied, the law immediately implies that by the original contract of society, the defendant hath contracted a debt and is bound to pay it. This method seems to have been invented when real actions were more in use than at present, and damages were permitted to be recovered thereon, in order to have the benefit of a writ of copious to take the defendant's body in execution for those damages, which process was allowable in an action of debt in consequence of the statute 25 Edward III C17, but not in an action real. Wherefore, since the disuse of those real actions, actions of debt upon judgment in personal suits have been pretty much discountenanced by the courts as being generally vexatious and oppressive by harassing the defendant with the costs of two actions instead of one. On the same principle it is, of an implied original contract to submit to the rules of the community whereof we are members, that a forfeiture imposed by the bylaws and private ordinances of a corporation upon any that belong to the body, or an immersement set in a court leet or court baron upon any of the suitors to the court, for otherwise it will not be binding, immediately create a debt in the eye of the law 
and such forfeiture or immersement, if unpaid, work an injury to the party or parties entitled to receive it, for which the remedy is by action of debt. The same reason may with equal justice be applied to all penal statutes, that is, such acts of Parliament, whereby a forfeiture is inflicted for transgressing the provisions therein enacted. The party offending is here bound by the fundamental contract of society to obey the directions of the legislature and pay the forfeiture incurred to such persons as the law requires. The usual application of this forfeiture is either to the party grieved or else to any of the king's subjects in general. Of the former sort is the forfeiture inflicted by the statute of Winchester, explained and enforced by several subsequent statutes, upon the hundred wherein a man is robbed, which is meant to oblige the hundredors to make hue and cry after the felon, for if they take him, they stand excused. But otherwise, the party robbed is entitled to prosecute them by a special action on the case for damages equivalent to his loss. And of the same nature is the action given by Statute 9 George I C-22, commonly called the Black Act, against the inhabitants of any hundred, in order to make satisfaction in damages to all persons who have suffered by the offenses enumerated and made felony by that act. But more usually, these forfeitures created by statute are given at large to any common informer, or, in other words, to any such person or persons as will sue for the same, and hence such actions are called popular actions because they are given to the people in general. Sometimes one part is given to the king, to the poor, or to some public use, and the other part to the informer or prosecutor. And then the suit is called a quitam action, because it is brought by a person, quitam pro domino rege, etc., quam pro siepso in hac parte sequitur. If the king therefore commences this suit, he shall have the whole forfeiture. But if any one hath begun a quitam, or popular action, no other person can pursue it, and the verdict passed upon the defendant in the first suit is a bar to all others, and conclusive, even to the king himself. This has frequently occasioned offenders to procure their own friends to begin a suit in order to forestall and prevent other actions, which practice is in some measure prevented by a statute made in the reign of a very sharp-sighted prince in penal laws. For Henry the Seventh, C. 20, which enacts that no recovery otherwise than by verdict obtained by collusion in action popular shall be a bar to any other action prosecuted bona fide. A provision that seems borrowed from the rule of the Roman law that if a person was acquitted of any accusation merely by the prevarication of the accuser, a new prosecution might be commenced against him. End of chapter 9, part 2. Chapter 9, part 3 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes Of Injuries to Personal Property Part 3 A second class of implied contracts are such as do not arise from the express determination of any court or the positive direction of any statute, but from natural reason and the just construction of law. Which class extends to all presumptive undertakings or assumpsits, which, though never perhaps actually made, yet constantly arise from this general implication and intendment of the courts of judicature, that every man hath engaged to perform what his duty or justice requires. Thus, 1. If I employ a person to transact any business for me, or perform any work, 
the law implies that I undertook or assumed to pay him so much as his labor deserved. And if I neglect to make him amends, he has a remedy for this injury by bringing his action on the case upon this implied assumption, wherein he is at liberty to suggest that I promise to pay him so much as he reasonably deserved, and then to aver that his trouble was really worth such a particular sum which the defendant has omitted to pay. But this valuation of his trouble is submitted to the determination of a jury, who will assess such a sum in damages as they think he really merited. This is called an assumpsit on a quantum meruit. 2. There is also an implied assumpsit on a quantum valibit, which is very similar to the former, being only where one takes up goods or wares of a tradesman without expressly agreeing for the price. There the law concludes that both parties did intentionally agree that the real value of the goods should be paid, and an action on the case may be brought accordingly if the vendee refuses to pay that value. 3. A third species of implied assumptions is when one has had and received money of another's without any valuable consideration given on the receiver's part. For the law construes this to be money had and received for the use of the owner only, and implies that the person so receiving promised and undertook to account for it to the true proprietor. And if he unjustly detains it, an action on the case lies against him for the breach of such implied promise and undertaking, and he will be made to repair the owner in damages equivalent to what he has detained in such violation of his promise. This is a very extensive and beneficial remedy applicable to almost every case where the defendant has received money which ex aqueo et bono he ought to refund. It lies for money paid by mistake or on a consideration which happens to fail or through imposition, extortion, or oppression or where undue advantage is taken of the plaintiff's situation. 4. Where a person has laid out and extended his own money for the use of another, at his request, the law implies a promise of repayment, and an action will lie on this assumption. 5. Likewise, fifthly, upon a stated account between two merchants or other persons, the law implies that he against whom the balance appears has engaged to pay it to the other, though there be not any actual promise. And from this implication, it is frequent for actions on the case to be brought, declaring that the plaintiff and defendant had settled their accounts together in simut computasent, which gives name to this species of assumption, and that the defendant engaged to pay the plaintiff the balance, but has since neglected to do it. But if no account has been made up, then the legal remedy is by bringing a writ of account de computo, commanding the defendant to render a just account to the plaintiff or show the court good cause to the contrary. In this action, if the plaintiff succeeds, there are two judgments. The first is that the defendant do account quod computet before auditors appointed by the court and when such account is finished, then the second judgment is that he do pay the plaintiff so much as he is found in arrear. This action, by the old common law, lay only against the parties themselves, and not their executors, because matters of account rested solely in their own knowledge. But this defect, after many fruitless attempts in Parliament, was at last remedied by Statute 4 and C-16, which gives an action of account against the executors and administrators. But, however, it is found by experience that the most ready and effectual way to settle these matters of account is by bill in a court of equity, where a discovery may be had on the defendant's oath without relying merely on the evidence which the plaintiff may be able to produce. Wherefore, actions of account to compel a man to bring in and settle his accounts are now very seldom used, though, when an account is once stated, nothing is more common than an action upon the implied assumption 
to pay the balance. 6. The last class of contracts implied by reason and construction of law arises upon this supposition, that everyone who undertakes any office, employment, trust, or duty contracts with those who employ or entrust him to perform it with integrity, diligence, and skill. And, if by his want of either of those qualities any injury accrues to individuals, they have therefore their remedy in damages by a special action on the case. A few instances will fully illustrate this matter. If an officer of the public is guilty of neglect of duty, or a palpable breach of it, or of nonfeasance, or of misfeasance, as, if the sheriff does not execute a writ sent to him, or if he willfully makes a false return thereof, in both these cases the party aggrieved shall have an action on the case for damages to be assessed by a jury. If a sheriff or jailer suffers a prisoner who is taken upon mean process, that is, during the pendency of a suit, to escape, he is liable to an action on the case. But if after judgment a jailer or a sheriff permits a debtor to escape who is charged in execution for a certain sum, the debt immediately becomes his own, and he is compellable by action of debt, being for a sum liquidated and ascertained to satisfy the creditor his whole demand. Which doctrine is grounded on the equity of the statutes of Westminster 2, 13 Edward I, C. 11, and 1 Richard II, C. 12. An advocate or attorney that betrays the cause of their client, or, being retained, neglect to appear at the trial by which the cause miscarries, are liable to an action on the case for a reparation to their injured client. There is also in law always an implied contract with a common innkeeper to secure his guest's goods in his inn, with a common carrier or barge master to be answerable for the goods he carries, with a common farrier that he shoes a horse well without laming him, with a common tailor or other workman that he performs his business in a workmanlike manner, in which if they fail, an action on the case lies to recover damages for such breach of their general undertaking. But if I employ a person to transact any of these concerns, whose common profession and business it is not, the law implies no such general undertaking, but in order to charge him with damages, a special agreement is required. Also, if an innkeeper or other victualler hangs out a sign and opens his house for travelers, it is an implied engagement to entertain all persons who travel that way, and upon this universal assumption, an action on the case will lie against him for damages if he, without good reason, refuses to admit a traveler. If anyone cheats me with false cards or dice, or by false weights and measures, or by selling me one commodity for another. An action on the case also lies against him for damages, upon the contract which the law always implies that every transaction is fair and honest. In contracts likewise for sales, it is constantly understood that the seller undertakes that the commodity he sells is his own, and if it proves otherwise, an action on the case lies against him to exact damages for this deceit. In contracts for provisions, it is always implied that they are wholesome, and, if they be not, the same remedy may be had. Also, if he that selleth anything doth upon the sale warrant it to be good, the law annexes a tacit contract to this warranty, that if it be not so, he shall make compensation to the buyer, else it is an injury to good faith for which an action on the case will lie to recover damages. The warranty must be upon the sale, for if it be made after and not at the time of the sale, it is a void warranty, for it is then made without any consideration. Neither does the buyer then take the goods upon the credit of the vendor. Also, the warranty can only reach to things in being at the time of the warranty made, 
and not to things in futuro, as that a horse is sound at the buying of him, not that he will be sound two years hence. But if the vendor knew the goods to be unsound, and hath used any art to disguise them, or if they are in any shape different from what he represents them to be to the buyer, this artifice shall be equivalent to an express warranty, and the vendor is answerable for their goodness. A general warranty will not extend to guard against defects that are plainly and obviously the object of one's senses, as if a horse be warranted perfect and wants either a tail or an ear, unless the buyer, in this case, be blind. But if cloth is warranted to be of such a length, when it is not, there an action on the case lies for damages, for that cannot be discerned by sight, but only by a collateral proof, the measuring it. Also, if a horse is warranted sound, and he wants the sight of an eye, though this seems to be the object of one's senses, yet, as the discernment of such defects is frequently matter of skill, it hath been held that an action on the case lieth to recover damages for this imposition. Besides the special action on the case, there is also a peculiar remedy entitled an action of deceit to give damages in some particular cases of fraud, and principally where one man does anything in the name of another by which he is deceived or injured, as if one brings an action in another's name and then suffers a non-suit whereby the plaintiff becomes liable to costs, or where one suffers a fraudulent recovery of land or chattels to the prejudice of him that hath right. It also lies in the cases of warranty before mentioned, and the other injuries committed contrary to good faith and honesty. But the action on the case, in nature of deceit, is more usually brought upon these occasions. Thus much for the non-performance of contracts express or implied, which includes every possible injury to what is by far the most considerable species of personal property, viz., that which consists in action merely and not in possession, which finishes our inquiries into such wrongs as may be offered to personal property with their several remedies by suit or action. End of chapter 9, part 3. Chapter 10, part 1 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, book 3. By William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of injuries to real property, and first, of dispossession or ouster of the freehold. Part 1. I come now to consider such injuries as affect that species of property which the laws of England have denominated real, as being of a more substantial and permanent nature than those transitory rights of which personal chattels are the object. Real injuries, then, or injuries affecting real rights, are principally six. 1. Ouster. 2. Trespass. 3. Nuisance. 4. Waste. 5. Subtraction. 6. Disturbance. Ouster, or dispossession, is a wrong or injury that carries with it the emotion of possession, for thereby the wrongdoer gets into the actual occupation of the land or hereditament, and obliges him that hath a right to seek his legal remedy, in order to gain possession and damages for the injury sustained. And such ouster, or dispossession, may either be of the freehold or of chattels real. Ouster of the freehold is effected by one of the following methods. 1. Abatement. 2. Intrusion. 3. Deceason. 4. Discontinuance. 5. Deforcement. All of which, in their order, 
and afterwards their respective remedies will be considered in the present chapter. 1. And first, an abatement is where a person dies seized of an inheritance, and before the heir or devisee enters, a stranger who has no right makes entry and gets possession of the freehold. This entry of him is called an abatement, and he himself is denominated an abator. It is to be observed that this expression of abating, which is derived from the French and signifies to quash, beat down, or destroy, is used by our law in three senses. The first, which seems to be the primitive sense, is that of abating or beating down a nuisance of which we spoke in the beginning of this book, and in a like sense it is used in statute Westminster 1, 3 Edward I, C. 17, where mention is made of abating a castle or fortress, in which case it clearly signifies to pull it down and level it with the ground. The second signification of abatement is that of abating a writ or action, of which we shall say more hereafter. Here it is taken figuratively, and signifies the overthrow or defeating of such writ by some fatal exception to it. The last species of abatement is that we have now before us, which is also a figurative expression to denote that the rightful possession or freehold of the heir or devisee is overthrown by the rude intervention of a stranger. This abatement of a freehold is somewhat similar to an immediate occupancy in a state of nature, which is effected by taking possession of the land the same instant that the prior occupant by his death relinquishes it. But this, however agreeable to natural justice, considering man merely as an individual, is diametrically opposite to the law of society and particularly the law of England, which, for the preservation of public peace, hath prohibited as far as possible all acquisitions by mere occupancy, and hath directed that lands on the death of the present possessor should immediately vest either in some person expressly named and appointed by the deceased as his devisee, or, on default of such appointment, in such of his next relations as the law hath selected and pointed out as his natural representative or heir. Every entry, therefore, of a mere stranger, by way of intervention between the ancestor and heir or person next entitled, which keeps the heir or devisee out of possession, is one of the highest injuries to the rights of real property. 2. The second species of injury by ouster, or a motion of possession from the freehold, is by intrusion, which is the entry of a stranger after a particular estate of freehold is determined before him in remainder or reversion. And it happens where a tenant for term of life dieth seized of certain lands and tenements, and a stranger entereth thereon, after such death of the tenant, and before any entry of him in remainder or reversion. This entry and interposition of the stranger differ from an abatement in this that an abatement is always to the prejudice of the heir or immediate devisee, an intrusion is always to the prejudice of him in remainder or reversion. For example, if A dies seize of lands in fee simple, and, before the entry of B, his heir, C enters thereon, this is an abatement. But if A be tenant for life, with remainder to B in fee simple, and after the death of A, C enters, this is an intrusion. Also, if A be tenant for life on lease from B or his ancestors, or be tenant by the courtesy or in dower, the reversion being vested in B, and after the death of A, C enters and keeps B out of possession, this is likewise an intrusion so that an intrusion is always immediately consequent upon the determination of a particular estate. An abatement is always consequent upon the descent or devise of an estate in fee simple. 
and in either case the injury is equally great to him whose possession is defeated by this unlawful occupancy. 3. The third species of injury by ouster, or privation of the freehold, is by decision. Decision is a wrongful putting out of him that is seized upon the freehold. The two former species of injury were by a wrongful entry where the possession was vacant, but this is an attack upon him who is in actual possession and turning him out of it. Those were an ouster from a freehold in law. This is an ouster from a freehold in deed. This may be affected either in corporeal inheritances or incorporeal. The season of things corporeal, as of houses, land, etc., must be by entry and actual dispossession of the freehold, as if a man enters either by force or fraud into the house of another and turns or at least keeps him and his servants out of possession. The season of incorporeal hereditaments cannot be an actual dispossession, for the subject itself is neither capable of actual bodily possession nor dispossession, but it depends on their respective natures and various kinds, being in general nothing more than a disturbance of the owner in the means of coming at or enjoying them. With regard to freehold rent in particular, our ancient law books mentioned five methods of working a decision thereof. 1. By enclosure, whether tenant so encloseth the house or land that the Lord cannot come to distrain thereon, or demand it. 2. By forestaller, or lying in wait, when the tenant besetteth the way with force and arms, or by menaces of bodily hurt, affrights the lessor from coming. 3. By rescus, that is, either by violently retaking a distress taken, or by preventing the Lord with force and arms from taking any at all. 4. By replevin, when the tenant replevies the distress at such time when his rent is really due. 5. By denial, which is when the rent being lawfully demanded is not paid. All or any of these circumstances work a decision of rent, that is, they wrongfully put the owner out of the only possession of which the subject matter is capable, namely, the receipt of it. And all these decisions of hereditaments incorporeal are only so at the election and choice of the party injured, if, for the sake of more easily trying the right, he is pleased to suppose himself deceased. Otherwise, there can be no actual dispossession, he cannot be compulsively deceased of any incorporeal hereditament. And so, too, even in corporeal hereditaments, a man may frequently suppose himself to be deceased when he is not so in fact, for the sake of entitling himself to the more easy and commodious remedy of an assize of novel decision which will be explained in the sequel of this chapter, instead of being driven to the more tedious process of a writ of entry. The true injury of compulsive decision seems to be that of dispossessing the tenant and substituting oneself to be the tenant of the Lord in his stead, in order to which, in the times of pure feudal tenure, the consent or connivance of the Lord who upon every descent or alienation personally gave, and who therefore alone could change, the season or investiture seems to have been anciently necessary. But when in process of time the feudal form of alienations wore off, and the Lord was no longer the instrument of giving actual season, it is probable that the Lord's acceptance of rent or service from him who had dispossessed another might constitute a complete decision. Afterwards, no regard was had to the Lord's concurrence, but the dispossessor himself was considered as the sole decisor, and this wrong was then allowed to be remedied by entry only, without any form of law, as against the decisor himself, but required a legal process against his heir or alienee. 
and when the remedy by a seize was introduced under Henry II to redress such diseases as had been committed within a few years next preceding, the facility of that remedy induced others who were wrongfully kept out of the freehold to feign or allow themselves to be deceased merely for the sake of the remedy. These three species of injury, abatement, intrusion, and deceasing, are such wherein the entry of the tenant, ab initio, as well as the continuance of his possession afterwards, is unlawful. But the two remaining species are where the entry of the tenant was at first lawful, but the wrong consists in the detaining of the possession afterwards. 4. Such is, fourthly, the injury of discontinuance, which happens when he who hath an estate tail maketh a larger estate of the land than by law he is entitled to do, in which case the estate is good so far as his power extends who made it, but no farther, as if the tenant in tail makes a fiefment in fee simple for the life of the fee fee or in tail all which are beyond his power to make, for that by common law extends no farther than to make a lease for his own life. Here the entry of the fee-fee is lawful during the life of the fee-four, but if he retains possession after the death of the fee-four, it is an injury, which is termed a discontinuance, the ancient legal estate, which ought to have survived to the heir and tail being gone, or at least suspended, and, for a while, discontinued. For in this case, on the death of the alienors, neither the heir and tail, nor they in remainder or reversion expectant on the determination of the estate tail, can enter on and possess the land so alienated. Also, by the common law, the alienation of an husband, who was seized in the right of his wife, worked a discontinuance of the wife's estate. Till the statute 32 Henry VIII C28 provided that no act by the husband alone should work a discontinuance of or prejudice the inheritance or freehold of the wife, but that, after his death, she or her heirs may enter on the lands in question. Formerly also, if an alienation was made by a sole corporation, as a bishop or a dean, without consent of the chapter, this was a discontinuance. But this is now quite antiquated by the disabling statutes of 1 Elizabeth C-19 and 13 Elizabeth C-10, which declare all such alienations absolutely void ab initio, and therefore, at present, no discontinuance can be thereby occasioned. 5. The fifth and last species of injuries by ouster or privation of the freehold, where the entry of the present tenant or possessor was originally lawful, but his detainer is now unlawful, is that by deforcement. And this, in its most extensive sense, is no man generalissimum, being a much larger and more comprehensive expression than any of the former, and signifying the holding of any lands or tenements to which another person hath a right. So that this includes, as well, an abatement, an intrusion, a decision, or a discontinuance, as any other species of wrong whatsoever, whereby he who hath right to the freehold is kept out of possession. But, as contradistinguished from the former, it is only such a detainer of the freehold from him that hath the right of property, but never had any possession under that right, as falls within none of the injuries which we have before explained. As in case where a lord hath a seigneury, and the lands are shed to him propter defectum sanguinis, but the season of the lands is withheld from him, here the injury is not abatement, for the right vests not in the Lord as heir or devisy, nor is it intrusion, for it vests not in him in remainder or reversion, nor is it deceasing, for the Lord was never seized, nor does it at all bear the nature of any species of discontinuance, but, being neither of these four, 
it is therefore a deforcement. If a man marries a woman, and during the coverture is seized of lands and aliens and dies, is deceased and dies, or dies in possession, and the alienee, the Caesar, or heir, enters on the tenements and doth not assign the widow her dower, this is also a deforcement to the widow by withholding lands to which she hath a right. In like manner, if a man lease lands to another for a term of years, or for the life of a third person, and the term expires by surrender, the flux of time, or the death of Chestwe Kevie, and the lessee or any stranger who was at the expiration of the term in possession holds over and refuses to deliver the possession to him in remainder or reversion, this is likewise a deforcement. Deforcements may also arise upon the breach of a condition in law, as if a woman gives lands to a man by deed, to the intent that he marry her, and he will not, when thereunto required, but continues to hold the lands. This is such a fraud on the man's part, that the law will not allow it to divest the woman's right, though it does divest the possession, and thereby becomes a deforcement. Deforcements may also be grounded on the disability of the party deforced, as if an infant or his ancestors being within age do make an alienation of his lands, and the alienee enters and keeps possession. Now, as the alienation is voidable, this possession, as against the infant, is wrongful, and therefore a deforcement. The same happens when one of non-same memory aliens his lands or tenements, and the alienee enters and holds possession. This is also a deforcement. Another species of deforcement is where two persons have the same title to land, and one of them enters and keeps possession against the other as where the ancestor dies seized of an estate in fee simple, which descends to two sisters as co-parsoners, and one of them enters before the other, and will not suffer her sister to enter and enjoy her moiety. This is also a deforcement. Deforcement may also be grounded on the non-performance of a covenant real, as if a man seized of lands covenants to convey them to another, and neglects or refuses so to do, but continues possession against him. This possession, being wrongful, is a deforcement. And hence, in levying a fine of lands, the person against whom the fictitious action is brought upon a supposed breach of covenant is called the defortunant. Thus, lastly, keeping a man by any means out of a freehold office is a deforcement. And indeed, from all these instances it fully appears that whatever injury withholding the possession of a freehold is not included under one of the four former heads is comprised under this of deforcement. The several species and degrees of injury by ouster being thus ascertained and defined, the next consideration is the remedy, which is universally the restitution or delivery of possession to the right owner, and, in some cases, damages also for the unjust emotion. The methods whereby these remedies, or either of them, may be obtained, are various. 1. The first is that extrajudicial and summary one, which we lightly touched in the first chapter of the present book, of entry by the legal owner when another person who hath no right hath previously taken possession of lands or tenements. In this case, the party entitled may make a formal but peaceable entry thereon, declaring that thereby he takes possession, which notorious act of ownership is equivalent to a feudal investiture by the Lord, or he may enter on any part of it in the same county, declaring it to be in the name of the whole. But if it lies in different counties, he must make different entries. For the notoriety of such entry or claim to the pares or freeholders of Westmoreland is not any notoriety to the pares or freeholders of Sussex. 
Also, if there be two deceasers, the party deceased must make his entry on both. Or, if one deceaser has conveyed the lands with livery to two distinct fifees, entry must be made on both. For as their season is distinct, so also must be the act which divests that season. If the claimant be deterred from entering by menaces or bodily fear, he may make claim as near to the estate as he can with the like forms and solemnities, which claim is in force for a year and a day only. And therefore this claim, if it be repeated once in the space of every year and a day, which is called continual claim, has the same effect with, and in all respect, amounts to, a legal entry. Such an entry gives a man season, or puts him into immediate possession that hath right of entry on the estate, and thereby makes him complete owner, and capable of conveying it from himself, either by descent or purchase. This remedy by entry takes place in three only of the five species of ouster, viz. abatement, intrusion, and deceasing. For, as in these the original entry of the wrongdoer was unlawful, they may therefore be remedied by the mere entry of him who hath right. But upon a discontinuance or deforcement, the owner of the estate cannot enter, but is driven to his action. For herein, the original entry being lawful, and thereby an apparent right of possession being gained, the law will not suffer that right to be overthrown by the mere act or entry of the claimant. On the other hand, in case of abatement, intrusion, or deceasing, where entries are generally lawful, this right of entry may be told, that is, taken away by dissent. Descents which take away entries are when any one, seized by any means whatsoever of the inheritance of a corporeal hereditament, dies, whereby the same descends to his heir. In this case, however feeble the right of the ancestor might be, the entry of any other person who claims title to the freehold is taken away, and he cannot recover possession against the heir by this summary method, but is driven to his action to gain a legal season of the estate. And this first, because the heir comes to the estate by act of law, and not by his own act. The law, therefore, protects his title, and will not suffer his possession to be divested, till the claimant hath proved a better right. Secondly, because the heir may not suddenly know the true state of his title, and therefore the law, which is ever indulgent to heirs, takes away the entry of such claimant as neglected to enter on the ancestor, who was well able to defend his title and leaves the claimant only the remedy of a formal action against the heir. Thirdly, this was admirably adapted to the military spirit of the feudal tenures, and tended to make the feudatory bold in war, since his children could not, by any mere entry of another, be dispossessed of the lands whereof he died seized. And lastly, it is agreeable to the dictates of reason and the general principles of law. For in every complete title to lands, there are two things necessary, the possession or season, and the right of property therein. Or, as it is expressed in Fleda, the juris et cesine conjunctio. Now, if the possession be severed from the property, if A has the jus proprietatis, and B, by some unlawful means, has gained possession of the lands, this is an injury to A for which the law gives a remedy by putting him in possession, but does it by different means according to the circumstances of the case. Thus B, who was himself the wrongdoer, and hath obtained the possession either by fraud or force, hath only a bare or naked possession without any shadow of right. A, therefore, who hath both the right of property and the right of possession, may put an end to his title at once by the summary method of entry. But if B the wrongdoer dies seized of the lands, then B's heir advances one step farther towards a good title. 
he hath not only a bare possession, but also an apparent jus possessionis, or the right of possession. For the law presumes that the possession, which is transmitted from the ancestor to the heir, is a rightful possession until the contrary be shown. And therefore, the mere entry of A is not allowed to evict the heir of B, but A is driven to his action at law to remove the possession of the heir, though his entry alone would have dispossessed the ancestor. So that in general it appears that no man can recover possession by mere entry on lands which another hath by descent. Yet this rule hath some exceptions wherein those reasons cease upon which the general doctrine is grounded, especially if the claimant were under any legal disabilities during the life of the ancestor, either of infancy, culverture, imprisonment, insanity, or being out of the realm, in all which cases there is no neglect or latches in the claimant, and therefore no descent shall bar or take away his entry. And this title of taking away entries by descent is still farther narrowed by the statute 32 Henry VIII C. 33, which enacts that if any person deceases or turns another out of possession, no descent to the heir of the deceaser shall take away the entry of him that has right to the land unless the deceaser had peaceable possession five years next after the deceasing. But the statute extendeth not to any fee fee or donee of the deceaser, mediate or immediate, because such a one, by the genuine feudal constitutions, always came into the tenure solemnly or with the Lord's concurrence by actual delivery of season or open and public investiture. On the other hand, it is enacted by the statute of limitations, 21 James I, C. 16, that no entry shall be made by any man upon lands unless within twenty years after his right shall accrue. And by statute 4 and 5 and C. 16, no entry shall be of force to satisfy the said statute of limitations or to avoid a fine levied of lands unless an action be thereupon commenced within one year after and prosecuted with effect. Upon an ouster, by the discontinuance of tenant and tail, we have said that no remedy by mere entry is allowed, but that, when tenant and tail aliens the land entailed, this takes away the entry of the issue and tail, and drives him to his action at law to recover the possession. For, as in the former cases, the law will not suppose without proof that the ancestor of him in possession acquired the estate by wrong. And therefore, after five years peaceable possession, and the descent cast, will not suffer the possession of the heir to be disturbed by mere entry without action. So here, the law will not suppose the discontinuer to have aliened the estate without power to do so, and therefore leaves the heir in tail to his action at law, and permits not his entry to be lawful. Besides, the alienee who came into possession by a lawful conveyance, which was at least good for the life of the alienor, hath not only a bare possession, but also an apparent right of possession, which is not allowed to be divested by the mere entry of the claimant, but continues in force till a better right be shown and recognized by a legal determination. And something also, perhaps, in framing this rule of law, may be allowed to the inclination of the courts of justice to go as far as they could in making the state's tale alienable by declaring such alienations to be voidable only and not absolutely void. In case of deforcements also, where the defortunate had originally a lawful possession of the land, but now detains it wrongfully, he still continues to have the presumptive prima facie evidence of right that is, possession lawfully gained, which possession shall not be overturned by the mere entry of another, but only by the demandants showing a better right in a course of law. This remedy by entry must be pursued according to statute 
5 Richard II ST1 C8 in a peaceable and easy manner, and not with force or strong hand. For if one turns or keeps another out of possession forcibly, this is an injury both of a civil and a criminal nature. The civil is remedied by immediate restitution, which puts the ancient possessor in statu quo, the criminal injury or public wrong, by breach of the king's peace, is punished by a fine to the king. For by the statute 8, Henry the Sixth, C9, upon complaint made to any justice of the peace of a forcible entry with a strong hand on lands or tenements, or a forcible detainer after a peaceable entry, he shall try the truth of the complaint by jury, and, upon force found, shall restore the possession to the party so put out. And in such case, or if any alienation be made to defraud the possessor of his right, which is declared to be absolutely void, the offender shall forfeit, for the force found, treble damages to the party grieved, and make fine and ransom to the king. But this does not extend to such as endeavor to keep possession manu forti after three years peaceable enjoyment of either themselves, their ancestors, or those under whom they claim, by a subsequent clause of the same statute, enforced by statute 31 Elizabeth C. 11. End of chapter 10, part 1.